I now call the May, beating, May meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education to order. Welcome to those of you in attendance and those of you online. All board members are present and seated today. Good morning. The mission of the Kansas State Board of Education is to prepare Kansas students for lifelong success through rigorous quality academic instruction, career training, and character development according to each student's gifts and talents. Our vision is for Kansas to lead the world in the success of each student. At this time, we will pause for a moment of silence. Please join me as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. May 8 through 12th is Teacher Appreciation Week, and it's a great opportunity to recognize the excellent educators that we have in Kansas who go above and beyond for our students. President Biden has also proclaimed today, Tuesday, May 9th, as National Teacher Appreciation Day and calls upon Americans to recognize the hard work and dedication of our nation's teachers. National Teacher Day and National Teacher Appreciation Week stem from an idea First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt had after receiving a letter from Maddie White Woodridge. In the 1940s, Woodridge, an Arkansas teacher, decided that educators should be recognized for the contributions they make to society. Woodridge wrote letters to every governor in the United States. She corresponded to politicians and other leaders in education, stressing the need for a national day to honor teachers. Eventually, one of the many letters she wrote landed on the desk of Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt pleaded to Congress that there be a day, there needed to be a day when teachers were recognized. And although there was support for designating a National Teacher Day, the first National Teacher Day didn't happen officially until March 7, 1980. Four years later, the National PTA decided to honor teachers with an entire week instead of just one day. Since 1984, the week-long celebration of educators occurs during the first full week of May. While this week allows us to shine a spotlight on Kansas teachers, we want our educators to know that we support them year-round and recognize the hard work long hours and dedication that they put in every day. They are leaders, problem solvers, and innovators who play a critical role in driving the success of our children's education and lives. And we see you and we appreciate you. Thank you, teachers. With that, are there any changes to today's agenda? If not, oh, Jim. I just have a request uh, uh, relating to the consent agenda. Uh, first of all, I have a statement, and I'm going to make a request uh, for the consent agenda. Uh, I, I fully recognize the, the uh, authority and respect the authority of anybody to do anything. I, as a matter of fact, early on, I pull things off the consent agenda myself, so I, I'm not questioning that at all. Last month, there was a great deal of confusion, and I've had more comments and conversations about the consent agenda than I have in the other eight years I've been here. People did not understand. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm going to give four examples, then I'm going to make my request, and then I'm going to be quiet. Uh, we we approve about we approve several hundred waivers for special education every year, and and in the last meeting that those waiver requests uh, were approved by only one vote. And the special education administrators that I met with were wondering why and what what, what they needed to do. Uh, uh, we normally approve. Uh, uh, recommendations about uh, approval of programs for for uh, the, the colleges uh, and the uh, administrators of those colleges and Southwestern for instance are wondering what they need to do uh, to address those concerns 
we have people that are wait. Uh, we have administrators that are waiting uh, for people to be approved by the license review committee, uh, and they're wondering what they need to do. And I've even had a call from one call from the uh, 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 volunteer commission, wondering what they needed to do to better better inform the board. The people that are watching, and I think it's a great. It's very important for us to be transparent. So. The people that are watching uh, don't know whenever we vote separately on item, and I'm just gonna pick numbers C through K. They don't know what that is. So my request is that if things are pulled out of the consent agenda by me or anybody else at any time in the future, that we separate those items, have time for discussion so that the people that are impacted will understand what we're doing and that we vote separately. I believe we can do that. Thank you. Um, I actually do have two changes from the department to the consent agenda. Um, Mark, does this need to be a motion or if it's from the department, can we just remove them? I have item, um, the visiting scholar item, which is all of 24H, needs to be removed. Um, that application wasn't completed, and so there's nothing to present. And then on 24J, the LRC case uh, 3494. I believe it's 3494. Mm -hmm. um, just that one item, 3494, 24J. And I don't have an explanation on that one. I just know that it's... Are there any other Do you need a motion on that? I need a motion to approve the agenda. Do you need a motion to make those changes, though? So? Mm -hmm. so, just a, okay. other changes? Well, it's C and D um, uh, pull off to vote separately, but I don't know as far as a discussion this afternoon how much, how many notes I brought to, for, for discussion on that, but for future, for the mm -hmm. next month, because <clears throat> I did read an email where um, <clears throat> I won't, uh, as far as um, excuse me, as far as the understanding, the question that I had um, was when they said, "Why are they um, asking questions about things on the consent agenda item?" That was that was an email that I read from higher ed. Why are they asking questions? And I'm like, I'm an elected official. That's my job is to ask questions or to you know, to find more information about the item that's on the consent agenda item. Um, they're wondering why those aren't just voted on, you know, just not even look, not even having a second look at those. So my, my, my response to them would be, then, then send us more information, send us more information um, to make sure that we're, we're aware of, of the of benefits or, or, or what it's doing for Kansas communities or whatever it is, and get more information because um, we don't always see the contracts, we don't know, you know, we don't know the impact of that in those communities. A lot of times, you know, we could you could say do your research on that, but my question, my my thing to pull off in the consent agenda items, not just to go, oh, let's just not have a question or anything like that. And it was it was a, an email that I read and said, why are they even asking questions? Why are they even having discussions on those things at the state board? I'm thinking, we're elected officials. We that's our job to do that. <clears throat> that is true. Um, however, items on the consent agenda are there because they have previously met certain requirements. So, Mark, would you like to speak to why we have a consent agenda and how those items get there? Sure. There's been quite a bit of discussion in the last several months about consent agenda and the votes on that. Uh, I would say generally that the consent agenda is for more root, what are described as routine, non-controversial items that are probably... Um, Air on the side of uh, information that are that are, do need some uh, approval uh, from the board, but rather than dive into that, I think at this time the the best thing to do would be to continue with the normal practice of uh, request to remove items from the consent agenda. Um, if the board chair wants to take uh, take those up for discussion and consideration, as suggested by. Uh, uh, Board Member Porter, then you can discuss those and, and the rationale for that at that time. But right now, we're just, you're in the order of things, you're just 
um, accepting request to remove from the consent as a, as a whole and then have a motion on that. So okay. one, one okay. more comment. Um, being on here four and a half years and seeing um, items that come up and say no more than $3.5 million for this contract. Then they come back six, six months later, eight months later, <clears throat> and ask for another 100000 another 200000 And that happens frequently, and that has happened over the last four and a half years. So I, I then that's why I say, well, let's pause here. Why is this costing another? I want to know why it's costing another 100000 or 200000 when it says no more than, this will not cost any more than three. Three uh, three point five million dollars, or two million dollars, or one thousand dollars. But then, that same thing might show up again on a consent agenda item to ask for more money. So I just, I'm going to question. I'm going to pause, and I'm going to have. I am going to have more discussion on things, and and uh, and I'm fine with in the afternoon if we have discussions on things that we pull off. Um, boy, I I, can, I might have stacks of stuff. So because um, I do some research on some of these things, so I will, I will continue to to do that going forward. Okay. okay, thank you. Yes, Do we have chair. time for discussion this afternoon? <clears throat> Betty. Um, if I could comment, and, and, <clears throat> and Michelle, what you're saying makes perfectly good sense. If, it's a, if it is a concern about um, this is going over the stated price, I think just saying that, because I too met with um, um, Wichita State University, and uh, um, they have several programs. So their question wasn't, you know, do you have the authority to pull? It's, what are we, what could we do better? And if you offer some insight, I'd like to see more of this or that. It's just giving them an opportunity to provide that necessary information uh, that you need. And honestly, there are times you may have a question about an agenda item that never occurred to me. So for me to hear what your reasons are could actually be beneficial to other board members as well. So it isn't so much in t uh, you know, to deny or say you don't have that. I think the discussion, having an open discussion, this is my concern, this was brought to us, it showed this amount and now we're showing that amount. May, may, made me think, yeah, you know, now that she mentions that. So just having that kind of conversation for agenda items that are pulled helps board members. But I also think um, those programs that simply want to provide us with the information we need to make a decision, it would help them as well. So if we look at it in that vein, I see it as a positive move. Thank you. Any changes to the consent agenda? Okay, we have a motion to approve as amended. Betty and Dina, all in favor? I see everyone's hand. Thank you. No? Good. Oh, Danny? A, a no vote? Opposed. Opposed. Okay, apologies. Barbara, you got that? Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes from the meeting on April 11th and 12th? And if not, may I have a motion to approve? Betty and Jim, all in favor? Opposed? And that looks unanimous. All right. Next up, we have the commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see all of you. Uh, happy May. Happy May. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, I always show this here and wherever I'm at, usually talk about students and uh, I'll talk a little bit about travel. I was just thinking, I said to Danny on the way in, I, haven't, I don't think I've talked to you or seen you much this month and, uh, and I, because I was thinking that I got to see most of you or talk to most of you this month, but not, so I apologize. We just didn't, our paths didn't cross uh, for some reason this month. Thank you to Kathy for spending some time in Sublette. That's a major inconvenience for you. Dennis <coughs> spent time with me at ESDAC. Thank you for doing that. Really appreciate that. And uh, uh, several of you were at the Governor's Scholars, and what a great time we had on Sunday with 500 and some of the top 1% of the students in Kansas and getting to, of course, have a conversation with 
um, those students and their families. So appreciate all of your time. As we continue to, uh, to work, there'll be many things on the agenda today. Uh, just, a f just a few, you know, we're gonna be talking about English language arts standards and, and really trying to beef those up with the science of, of reading. And uh, we'll be talking some about um, uh, other topics around licensure and things. What can we do to make sure to tilt the odds that more and more students become successful? You're gonna hear, get to hear from a remarkable young man uh, from Kingman today. Uh, who's our youth delegate, one of our youth delegates, uh, and, uh, and, and just so much fun. Um, so it is this combination of skills that we're looking at. The class of 23 will be graduating large part this weekend. Uh, that, that's not universally true, right? But in the large part this weekend, and so we are wishing them the best as they go forward. But Mr. Porter, for some of us in May, we remember recess. Uh, this, is, this is early 1900s. Um, I'm not sure any of this meets code today, Dennis. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, there's some claim that maybe, uh, uh, some of you know, I, I took a little fall, that maybe I am the person up on the top there and then did fall off and injure myself. But uh, I look at that and think, you know, even in my day, with, with the teeter-totters and kids would jump off, or the merry-go-rounds and they'd fling you off, or the three-hump slide, you know, that you try to get going really fast and that would burn you. We've come a long way, right, as we look at parks and, and rec today. So probably not in this, on this playground. Okay, um, just because some of the new board members would not have received, I gave you all a copy of the annual report. That's something we produce every October. Uh, and uh, but I just wanted to, new people to have that in case they didn't. But how many of you have ever seen the game show Jeopardy? Are we good? You seen? Okay. So we're going to modify, play a little final Jeopardy. All right. You have some index cards, but you you can use any. So I'm going to give you the answer, and I, then I want to know what's the question, the topic. Jim, edu Kansas education. So you're choosing, I'm choosing that for you. Kansas education for 10, 100, 4,000, all right? So we think about that. So here's the first. Ready? Here's the answer. You're already shaking your head at me, Daniel. <laughs> all right, here's the answer. You ready? The topic, Kansas education. Here's the answer. And if I could sing or hum, you know, I'd, Mr. Porter, I'd, I'd play the Jeopardy. Da, 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 da. Those of you in the audience can play too. This is the answer. What is the question? Ah, you get to do this, by the way, six times. All right, are we good? Now, you know, in Jeopardy, then they show the answers, right? But... I, it is May, it's toward the end of the year, I'm, I'm being kind, I'm not going to ask you to disclose your answers unless you want to volunteer, all right, which would be fine. Does anyone want know the question? Dan, how many kids are going to graduate from high school? So, so, so this, is a, this is a teacher move, I'm not disclosing the answer yet for those of you that maybe agree or have other solutions to, or to, the, to what is the question. Madam Chair, how many teachers are in Kansas? That's different than graduates. Are, are, are we good with one of those two? Or we have no others. The answer is, or the question is, how many full-time teachers do we have in Kansas schools today? 36,307, full-time. So there's some part-time in addition to that, and that's pretty good, though, because that number is going to be pretty close to the graduating class of 23, so not bad. All right, ready? The answer to the second education question is 1,329. You guys in the audience get that first one right? Okay, good. Every one of them got that right. I don't know what's up with that, okay? <laughs> Thank it's, you. it's always true. It's always true, right? When you're self-reporting your grades, it's always good, right? I remember, remember those classes when the professor said, what do you think you deserve? 
like I always wondered when the when when the student said a C. Like, no, I deserve an A. I, 1,329. I should call on them, right? <laughs> okay, who wants to volunteer? We had two brave souls last time. Who wants? Oh, Jim? School districts. How many school districts are? How many high schools are there in Kansas? School, school buildings. How many school buildings are there in Kansas? How many TEAL licenses have we issued this year? All right. Dennis, did you have one? How many local school board members? What are that, – that's a good one. That's a good one. The, the question is, how many school buildings are there in the state of Kansas? 1,329. Jim Porter. And yeah, all that is in recognition, person. as Madam Chair talked about, Teacher Appreciation Week. That many teachers in that many buildings across our state doing the work at 1021 today. Um, as, as I take this week and this day to reflect, uh, I'd ask all of you to do the same. Some of you still have students in school or grandchildren in school, right? Um, or great grandchildren. And so, but you know, who was a teacher that maybe impacted you that you remember? Uh, impacted your kids that hey, they talk about still today uh, or maybe uh, in, in your case like mine I have a daughter who's teaching today so I'm thinking about her and the efforts that she gives every day teacher appreciation week and you know what got to happen this week we got to honor nationally one of those people one of our Kansas teachers of the year Natalie Johnson Berry was awarded the national award Horace Mann Award for Teaching Excellence. Sherry nominated her. And uh, here's the moment when it was announced. Now, Natalie doesn't like that photo at all and said, don't show that. Okay, we're going to go back to this one. Okay, but that was the moment uh, that she was uh, awarded. What an honor. Uh, Natalie had, was a teacher uh, at the time that she was Kansas on the Kansas Teacher of the Year team in Shawnee Mission. She has since moved to the to Dot High School in Kansas City, and that is where she's at presently. But we want to congratulate her and all the teachers in Kansas for their outstanding, outstanding work every day, uh, especially in May. Okay. All right. We're not done with Jeopardy. You guys are on a roll. I'm not telling you. All right? All right. By the way, how did you do in the audience on that one? Did you get all the – oh, now, now they're starting to be a little more honest. You know, now they know I'm not going to call all of them. Then they're all brave. Here, here is the answer. The category – Kansas education, the answer is 121,198. Kathy's saying, Why are the, what's all the deal with the numbers? Let's have a little bit of a broader spectrum. But the answer, Betty, 1,000, or 121,198. Topic, Kansas education. I'm making it, I'm making it harder because the audience was getting so good. Doug was rolling, he was rolling it, so I, I got to make it tougher. I gave you some note cards that I mentioned for you to write the right answers. Okay, I just wanted to mention that. Anyone want to volunteer the answer? Anne? Number of kids that did the Sunflower Summer last year. Number of kids that did the Sunflower Summer last year. The rest, are you agreeing with Anne or no, I'm not. I'm setting out this round, thank you. Uh, that is the answer. That is the answer. The number of students that participated in the Kansas Sunflower Summer Program in its second year of existence, and we're announcing today year three. Year three. One of the, one of the best things this board has done was allocate a fairly small amount of money, of ESSER money, for those of people listening, that was the federal pandemic money, to go to families and students that they could go to Kansas learning uh, attractions, learning events, and, um, and, and participate. So starting May 26th through August 13th, or I need to be really clear with this for everyone listening, until the money runs out. Because if the money runs out, then we can't, we can't support it. And we went over budget a little bit, so we took some out of this year's budget already. 
but, um, but that's true. Now, the legislature did pass some dollars to go to Commerce and other people to run this program after the federal money runs out, and that will start next year. So if we did have any money left, we would roll it into next year and just, just make use of it. We added attra attractions this year. So this is the website on the left, and participating locations is just a hyperlink uh, on the right. But attractions were added, including, Dina, Big Brutus and West Mineral. So those of you from Southeast Kansas are so excited that Big Brutus is now on the list. And uh, as, as Kathy, as is the Walter <laughs> Chrysler Museum in Ellis, Kansas. So, so we want to encourage uh, all schools to get the word out that Sunfire Summer is back. And look at this. Give a shout out to our good friend Melissa Rooker and the Dolly Parton uh, Foundation that gives books away. These are actual, uh, they produce three books, the University of Kansas, in, in, in conjunction with the, the Dolly Parton uh, Imagination Library. And when you go now to the state parks this summer, you can actually, on your phone, this is how a, an acorn, a young person grows, and a tree grows over, you know, 100 years. And you can actually uh, get guided through the state parks, and you can read stories uh, around uh, nature. So I want to give a shout out to uh, all the people. We continue to make it better. And I think some of our uh, literacy people and STEM people are going to add to that project uh, also. All right. Category is education. The answer, seven and four. We're not in a casino. Seven and four. If you think about it, almost everyone would know this one, seven and four. Oh, I'm not, I, I don't disclose it until we, till we get your final answer. But, Michelle, you want to, you, do you have an answer? Or you have the question? I got oh, a better yeah. one. Brandy. Look, I see a lot of heads nodding. Like, oh, that's really good. Yeah, Dennis. Snack times at school. Snack times at school, seven and four. Oh, that's, a, that's a good one. I like that. Anyone else? Michelle, that, I, both, you and Dennis, that was outstanding. That is, not the, that is not the correct question. But it was outstanding. It could have been that. This is the seven is the number of grade levels that a student takes a state assessment in Kansas, and four are the subjects that we are required by state and federal law to give. Social studies and science are every other year, and math and reading are, uh, excuse me, math and language arts are every year. This is the chart that you've seen before, which is just showing how students do on the assessment relative to graduation and post-secondary success. Uh, but, and then, of course, here are the performance level descriptors, uh, and then we'd fill in the blank for a student, right? Students demonstrate a, an excellent ability to use and understand the skills they scored at level four. Guess what happens later this week? Parents, school districts get the results of the Kansas State Assessment to be shared. Uh, across, and you know, there'll be preliminary results because schools may look at it and go, oh, this, this one person doesn't look right, and we'll correct that. You'll actually get those results fully in the fall, but they will, they will get those to be able to send home uh, with, with students uh, and to parents electronically uh, or on paper if they want to print the, uh, the state assessment results for this past year. And I would just say this overall, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's been a really good year as we think about 22, 23 school year. So we're looking forward to see one test, one day. Uh, but it, but it's, a, it's a good indicator to have a discussion with, right? How does that line up with, with what we teacher sees in the classroom? How does that line up with other assessment results that we maybe have on a student? And a, a great discussion. The answer is 506089. 
I see a lot of people thinking that they've got this one down. I heard rumor, I heard murmurs already going on in the back and in the front. Dennis? I'm just going to go right there. That's the total number of students in accredited schools in the state of Kansas, public and private. Because you know we often talk about a half a million. So that, and that, that's, that's, that this was last year, uh, audited count, 506089. And the last, 14,500. Correction me again. For the board, there are snacks, but we remove those if you don't get some of these right. So. <laughs> 14,500. Anyone have an idea? I've worn you out. Final Jeopardy has worn you out. Nope. This is the minimum number of minutes a student would be in school, kindergarten through high school. The minimum. Could be more. This is the minimum. You know, Malcolm Glidewell wrote a book <coughs> called The Outliers. Some of you may have read that book several years ago, which, which kind of spawned the whole 20,000 hour to become an expert. 14,500 would be the minimum amount of hours that a student is in a Kansas school. And what I like to say, if you look at today, we probably have, and we have a couple of superintendents. When's school out for you guys? The 19th, 18th, 19th? So we're within about two weeks of school being out, right? As I think about this, and I know these gentlemen think about it, and everyone involved in school is, I hope we still have a sense of urgency. Every minute counts. Every hour counts. The second graders, we won't get to see again in second grade. Seniors, we know, right? Because they're gone. We know that. But we don't often think, oh, I'll never be a kindergartner again. I'll never be a sixth grader again. And we have about 10 days. Again, every school district gets out at a different time. But I hope that we're going hard till the end because they deserve it, right? We want to maximize every day, every minute that we have with them. And we're so proud of the work that our educators are doing. Well, I hope you found that to be a little enjoyable in what's going to be a long two days <laughs> of meetings today. And I uh, want to thank you again for your work. And uh, uh, stand for any questions. I know I'm a little bit over, Madam Chair, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't see any hands. I'll check the app because I haven't had it up yet today. Uh, my feeling uh, is someone is going to ask me questions now the rest of the day, right? They're going to give me the answers, and I have to come up with the questions. Mm -hmm. so thank you. I had a question, but I answered it myself. And so you can go ahead and sit down. I will just mention that uh, Sunflower Summer, I had someone ask me, how come the app's not live yet? Because I know that there are summer camps on there, and I want to know what they are because those are going to fill up, and I need to plan ahead. But if you go to the website, there's a whole list there, so you can access that through the website. Right. Is the app up yet? Uh, the Do you know? the app, I don't think is live yet, okay. but they'll work on that. But they can certainly see what's going to take place this summer, and uh, I'll take credit as a good teacher for when students answer their own questions, you've done your job. So thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> thank you again, Commissioner. All right, well, we're almost on time. We will move on to the Citizens Open Forum. Uh, during Citizens Open Forum, the State Board of Education provides an opportunity for citizens to share views about topics of interest or issues currently being considered by the State Board. I now declare the Citizens Open Forum of the Kansas State Board of Education meeting open at 10.34 a.m. The State Board asks that speakers identify themselves by name and the name of the group they represent, if applicable. The State Board also asks that each speaker focus their remarks on issues or topics. Personal attacks will not be tolerated. Each speaker shall be limited to three minutes. If several of you are here from the same group, you may want to consolidate your comments and ensure that you're not duplicating something that was said before you. Any board questions will be for clarification only. Our first speaker, and I'll, I'll give you the first two. Um, Tammy Cawford from Wichita, representing the Phillips Fundamental Learning Center, and then Jill Hodge from Andover will be next. Welcome to the State Board. Hi, I am Tammy 
Gofford from Wichita, Kansas, and I work for, I'm the director of teacher training for Phillips Fundamental Learning Center. And um, I graduated from K-State back in 1989 and married, moved to Texas, started my career as a first grade teacher, and quickly learned that I didn't have the education I needed to teach um, for, <clears throat> I didn't have what I needed to teach children how to read. So I started searching for courses to better educate myself in reading instruction. I signed up for a two-year course at the Scottish Rite Learning Center, West Texas, and um, there I learned how to teach children to read. In that course, I learned about dyslexia and other reading difficulties. I learned about the science of reading, <clears throat> and this was back in 1994. And I learned everything that I needed to teach the science of reading um, to the children in my classroom. I went back and I became a Title I migrant teacher, worked with 40 students in small groups throughout the day in a program called Alphabetic Phonics. <clears throat> After seeing the difference that it was making in the children that I worked with, I decided that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my teaching career. So I went back, I became a qualified instructor of certified academic language therapists. And during that process, I moved to Wichita, Kansas, and quickly realized that um, in the state of Kansas, they didn't recognize um, dyslexia. And so it became my passion and mission to help those students who struggle with dyslexia. Um, now we are recognizing dyslexia. We have a dyslexia task force, which has made my heart extremely happy. Um, and for the past 23 years, I've been instructing teachers in the science of reading and educating them about dyslexia so that they can go back and help their um, students in their classroom learn how to um, read. Um, the teachers that I have in my classes, I have a lot of reading specialists. I have a lot of special education majors that enter my class every year, and they have a mission to help all of their students learn how to um, read, write, and spell. Every year, I hear the same things over and over again. Why didn't I learn this in college? I'm a reading specialist. I should know this information. And these teachers um, then become empowered with the knowledge that um, I've instructed them in in the two-week course in the science of reading, and they leave knowing that now they can teach um, children to read, write, and spell. Um, I've been having teachers contact me on a daily basis, wanting to take classes to improve the way that they're teaching reading, but many of them can't afford to take those classes on their own, and they need their district support um, to help them with this continue education in the evidence-based reading methods. Um, a lot of the districts, they go back and they say, we don't have the money to send you to educate. And so it'd be awesome if there was a fund for teachers to apply for um, so they could get this training on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jill Hodge, and then we'll have Sarah Collins. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. My name is Jill Hodge, and I'm a retired public school teacher with 34 years of experience. I currently work at the Phillips Fundamental Learning Center and Rolf Literacy Academy, a private intervention school for students with dyslexia in Wichita. I was a reading specialist in Title I school in USD 385 Andover for 19 years. After several years of seeing the same students qualify for reading services, I realized that the way I was teaching reading was not working. After lots of reading, study, and research, I discovered that most of the students who'd been struggling year after year were probably dyslexic. For those students to learn to read, they needed instruction that was explicit, systematic, and diagnostic, focusing on phonological awareness, phonics, and decoding. Uh, during the summer, I spent two weeks in the alphabetic phonics course at the Phillips Fundamental Learning Center that taught me to teach students to read who had dyslexia. And I vividly remember being one of those people Tammy talked about, leaving class every day wondering, why did I not learn this in college? And how have I gone so many years without this training? I was blessed to be in a public school that allowed me to immediately apply the new knowledge that I'd gained by giving me permission to teach alphabetic phonics, which is a structured literacy curriculum. The students in the school who had struggled to read and showed signs of dyslexia were given one to two years of alphabetic phonics instruction 
and most became successful readers. Instructing dyslexic students the way their brains need to be taught it makes all the difference. There is hope for struggling readers, but their teachers must be trained in a structured literacy curriculum in order for the students to succeed. Kansas has made great strides in addressing the unique learning styles and needs of dyslexic students. The Dyslexia Task Force made recommendations that were approved by this board. A dyslexia handbook was written, and an early literacy dyslexia program was put in place. An early literacy advisory council has been established. Teachers are required to have yearly dyslexia professional development. Dyslexia is now included in the list of disabilities covered in the Special Education Act. My desire today is to urge this board to continue to advocate for dyslexic children in Kansas, ensuring that they receive the kind of instruction they deserve to become successful readers. The science of reading is available. Structured literacy curriculum is available. Professional development is available. All the tools are available. Only when we provide appropriate instruction for each and every student will Kansas lead the world in the success of all students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah Collins, and she'll be followed by Austin Collins. Welcome. Definitely related. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Collins, and I am with the Fundamental Learning Center, but I am mostly here on behalf of parents who have watched their children struggle in classrooms, um, struggle to learn to read, struggle to learn to write, struggle with those things that came so easily to me. I watched my own child bop off to school in kindergarten, like so excited, he was so brilliant, and he'll tell you his story, but I also watched his heart break because he was not given the chance to learn the way that he needed. It might take more than a minute, sorry. Um, And we lost that sparkle that he had and that brilliance that he had. And I didn't know what to do. And I see so many parents in the work that I do now that have this same story. And they say, I lost my kid. He stopped smiling. He, he hated himself. He hated school. I didn't know what to do. We went to probably eight to 10 different specialists trying to find out why he wasn't engaged in school. They told us they thought he was on the autism spectrum because he didn't make eye contact and he would hide under tables. and. We just couldn't believe what was going on. None of these teachers who had the best intentions, the most wonderful hearts, knew how to help him. And the specialist didn't, the psychologist didn't, and we finally went to Fundamental Learning Center where we learned about dyslexia. And it was the best day of my life because I learned what he is good at and what his strengths are and what he needs. And as soon as we were able to provide those things in a classroom for him, he flourished, and that's what I want you guys to know today is what parents like me are going through when we don't have those tools in classrooms. Had his kindergarten teacher been educated about it, been able to take her wonderful, amazing heart and look at him and say, I know exactly what this kid's need, what he needs, we wouldn't have gone through all the things that we did. So the answers, like they said, are out here. Other states have been doing this for decades, and there is zero reason why Kansas cannot do it, do it and do it even better. I am so proud to be in a room with all of you who I know work so hard for education. And I just wanted to share that parent perspective with you because it is something that, you know, if you're not in touch with it on a daily basis, that, you know, we can kind of lose touch with what that struggle is like for parents emotionally and physically and financially. I cannot tell you the number of dollars that we have spent trying to help this child when the tools are available. And it would have been so beautiful had he had that in his public school. And so just like everyone else, I'm urging you to take a look at that, listen to the science, listen to the parents, listen to these students that are coming here to talk today and help make this better for Kansas kids. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Austin Collins. <laughs> and he'll be followed by Janine Phillips. Welcome. Hi, I'm Austin Collins and I live in Wichita, Kansas. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story and why, your, and why your policies are so important to people like me. Before I started kindergarten, I was very excited to go to school. People had always told me how smart I was, but I was mostly excited about my new backpack. <laughs> but when I got there, within a few weeks, it didn't turn out the way I thought it would. I couldn't focus or keep up with my peers in class, and sometimes it would get so bad that I would hide under the lunch table and I would cry. 
Little things like that seemed so impossible for me. I could barely even write my own name, let alone read and write. I thought I was stupid, and I hated going to school. And my parents and teachers did not help me either. And I remember that my mom cried a lot. Finally, an after-school art teacher suggested we go to Fundamental Learning Center. And my mom scheduled me an assessment. I remember being scared and nervous because I was so used to being told that I was the problem. And I was sure that this would be the same. It wasn't. In fact, we learned that I'm dyslexic. My mom thought it meant that I could read backwards. It doesn't. But it does mean that learning to read, write, and spell was challenging for me and that I needed specialized instruction to be successful. This was not something that my public school could offer me. In fact, until last month, dyslexia wasn't even considered a learning difference in Kansas. Soon after, my parents enrolled me in Rolf Literacy Academy, a school that specializes in teaching kids with dyslexia. This changed everything. My teachers at Rolf Literacy Academy told me that no matter where I started, that I could be successful. When I started first grade, the only word I could write was my own name. I then went through a program known as Alphabetic Phonics, and by the time I finished, I could read the entire Percy Jackson series. This type of instruction was everything that I needed. My teachers understood my strengths and what I needed in order to be successful in a classroom. I wish that every kid could have the opportunities that I had and every teacher could know how to help every single kid succeed. In a few weeks, I will finish eighth grade with high honor roll. I'm also reading at a 12th grade reading level, according to the star reading test. I never thought that I would be successful like this, but because of this type of instruction I received, I am. Dyslexic kids are worth investing in. We are smart, creative, and observant, and have an incredible work ethic. With the right tools, we can do amazing things. You want kids with dyslexia in every classroom, and you need people with dyslexia in every workplace. We bring ideas to the table that nobody else thinks of. We never give up, and we are brilliant at solving problems. You have an opportunity to make sure that teachers have the tools required to provide education that kids with dyslexia need. Please do the right thing. We won't let you down. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. And next up is Janine Phillips, followed by Emmy John, is it Johnston? Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Sorry, my voice is so hoarse today. I apologize for this. I want to thank each and every one of you for your service to kids in Kansas, as well as high-quality education. Um, I'm basically here to celebrate HB 2322. We are thrilled in Wichita about that bill being signed. Um, we had a big celebration, as a matter of fact, on Friday night with 400 people who support us, have kept us alive for the past 22 years. Um, I, at the center, we focus on the science of reading. I came before this board. Um, it would have been first year we opened 22 years ago with this. We call it the green Kool-Aid. Um, and I presented this at the time. Um, so to look back and realize that we finally have pushed through a bill that's going to require um, specialized instruction for children with dyslexia. I'm thrilled. So people ask me why. Why did I do this? I'll give you a really quick timeline. I graduated from Heights High School in Wichita, Kansas in 1973. And I'll tell you, I had the lowest ACT score of anyone in the school. I couldn't read fast enough to complete the questions asked. 1978, I was identified as dyslexic by a WSU reading professor. 
um, it was a year I was graduating with my elementary degree. I shut the door on that. 1990, my youngest son was identified with profound dyslexia. This took me to Dallas, Texas, where I learned how to teach him and other children, as well as teachers. I started Phillips Fundamental Learning Center, and we organized it in 2000, um, opened our doors in 2001. We have served thousands of children and thousands of teachers. We're professionals. We've done this for a very long time. Seconds are ticking by here. Um, so I'll kind of jump down here. So if children in this day are going to learn to read, especially those with dyslexia, we have to take this law and step it up with policy. That's what I'm asking this board to do. Children with dyslexia need specialized people to teach them an hour every day in groups one on one or four on one if they're going to be like Austin is ready to succeed by high school and get a degree in college. So that's why I am here asking all of you to please pay attention to the policies that now need to be put in place for these kids. Again, thank you for your time, and I appreciate um, getting this opportunity to see you. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. And if you would like to submit, if, if there's anything that you left out, you're welcome to submit a letter to the board, and we'll make sure it gets out. Okay. Mr. Porter? I just wanted to to acknowledge that Janine was a member of the T Dyslexia Task Force and her service there was extremely valuable and I want to again thank you Janine for your uh, participation and, uh, and valuable input. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Amy Johnson and I'm a sophomore at Augusta High School. Unfortunately, my experience in school has been almost unbearable. I grew up having learning disabilities and I didn't know it. I was in my fifth grade of school when I first got screened for learning disabilities and found out I had dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and ADHD. Growing up was so hard because I didn't have the resources I needed until I got screened at Fundamental Learning Center. But I felt like I was unworthy and I did not have the right to have an education because people would think I was stupid. But now I know I'm not stupid. I hid through middle school and my freshman year of high school I finally decided that I can do this. And I was a candidate for Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen when I decided that I can start my own social impact initiative called Stop the Sigma, Create a Shield. Shield stands for Sending Help, Information, and Education for Learning Disabilities. My goal is to stop the stigma associated with learning disabilities so no one has to feel how I felt growing up. It was terrible. I'm sorry. After speaking with 500 students and teachers, and sharing that one in five people have learning disabilities, I have, I have many new goals. I have no idea what I wanted to do when, I was old, when I'm older. I now know that I want to get my elementary education degree, and I will eventually be able to work at Fundamental Learning Center and help them in any way possible. Unfortunately, I had to make the decision to stop going to my public school because I will have to miss out a lot but I, it's terrible. They don't teach me how I need to be taught, and they don't give me my resources. I have to go to a new academy because I can't learn, and I want to be successful, and I want to go to college, and I want to have a life, and I want to have a good family. But it's, it's so hard. And until these policies are passed and kids get the help that they need growing up, there are so many people who will continue to struggle. And my one goal is for that to stop, and I want no one to have to feel how I felt because now I know that I am unstoppable and there are so many people who can be just as unstoppable as I am. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy. Next is Angie Johnston, followed by Nancy Bowles. Hi, good morning. I haven't heard her speak quite that way before. Um, so um, I'm Angie Johnston, I'm Emmy's mom. 
Um, and I'm also a very involved community member. Much like you, I give of my time and my talent, my resources. Um, I'm president of our economic development group in Augusta, Kansas. I'm a school board member. Um, I run a successful business. I started out in elementary education. Um, so education's always been important to me and community has always been important to me. Um, when Emmy shared her story with you, you know, it's been heartbreaking as a mom because I didn't, I didn't know about Fundamental Learning Center early enough, I feel like, to, to get her the help that she needed. And her teachers always said how smart she was and how engaging she was. And um, I mean, she, she's a very, very smart kid. She just couldn't read and she couldn't do her math problems and her test scores were low. And so they would say, well, maybe she's just not trying hard enough. Um, but that wasn't the case. Um, so through her SHIELD project, I actually have learned more about learning disabilities than I learned in college. Um, one in five kids have learning disabilities. Several of our best leaders have learning disabilities. Uh, five of our 45 presidents had learning disabilities, including George Washington and Dwight D. Eisenhower, the first, or, you know, the only president um, from Kansas. So um, I'm so grateful to you all that you have recognized dyslexia and created the task force and are trying, but the implementations just aren't carrying over to school. When she goes and shares her project, um, teacher's like, wow, I didn't know that, or oh, we're not doing that. And her high school teachers, they don't really even know what dyslexia is. They, like Sarah and, and like me, think it means they read backwards. They, they just aren't educated. And until we change that, we're, you know, we're not going to make any progress. And as a board member, when I see so many kids, um, you know, COVID obviously had huge impacts, and you all know that, and kid behavior issues, how many kids are getting expelled, how many kids are um, dropping out, it's heartbreaking. And I feel like if we would have caught, a lot of those kids just probably feel the same way Emmy does and just didn't know. Um, so if we can catch them early, if we can have interventions and screenings early and often and, and get those changes made at every single school in Kansas and every single classroom in Kansas, we will make a difference. But we have to catch them early and then we have to recognize it in high school and, and tell them it, it's okay, we'll, you know, we'll get there together. So I'm grateful that you travel all over the state, from all over the state to be here and you work so hard and I have a whole bunch more on here, but thank you very much and please put policies in place so that um, our boards and our um, schools can act on those immediately. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and again, feel free to share your written comments. Okay, thank you. And Nancy Bolds is our last speaker. at me and go, oh yeah, I know that lady. She's been around forever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's those of you that don't have your hands up, that's why I'm here today. Uh, I realized I haven't been here for a minute. Um, I got plucked out and taken at the, to the regional level and I kept saying, can I go back to Kansas, please? I love working directly with the schools. So I got my wish and I'm back. Uh, I've worked for Cognia for 23 years, been there a minute, um, and we work with a number of schools here in Kansas who then get accredited uh, with KESA at the same time. So we are their vehicle and then we add some uh, additional uh, documentation to make sure that they're meeting all of the KESA requirements, particularly uh, the board goals. So that said, uh, I think you should have a handout. Yes? Okay. Oh, yep. And. Uh, the first one is just to introduce myself. Uh, I was in charge of the uh, school improvement uh, for Newton Public Schools in their uh, 11 school district. And I was a high school principal. I taught physical education, health, and, ed and uh, sex education for a number of years. And I have been an adjunct professor at Wichita State for 19 years. So I've, I've done a number of things. Uh, I've worked in Cognia, and uh, as I said, and we are a, an organization that is in 90 different countries. We have over 36,000 schools, and we have uh, an accreditation specialized for a number of different protocols and different types of schools. 
So that said, we have a lot of data about schools because we're in a, in a lot of them. Um, one of the things I always found as a practitioner to be the best part of Cognia uh, is the tools. And we have all of our tools aligned to our standards. And the tools help us do the work of continuous improvement. And uh, while accreditation is the end game for uh, a lot of schools, the school improvement process is by far more important because the accreditation is the stamp at the end. Um, it does help schools er, and students uh, become eligible for more things coming from a regionally accredited uh, institution, but ultimately we want our schools to be focused on learning. So this protocol we have, uh, which just rolled out this year, we have new standards and in that protocol we have a required uh, training component this time and we have the self-assessment workbook which is the how to do continuous improvement and it aligns to much of what you are doing and if you look at the final piece there the Cognia and Kisa materials we have uh, a number of diagnostics that include narratives and the ARC uh, you're gonna you have access to it through the QR code there the schools have a, a number of pieces of evidence that you would see in there and you're set up to see everything that is provided. I wanted full transparency, so when you guys see a, a, a Cognia school come through, you, you know that, yeah, they've done all of this stuff and it works with Kisa and we've been working together for a bazillion years. Questions, we good? Thank all you. Right. Thank you. The State Board Citizens Open Forum is closed at 11.01 a.m. Thank you to our speakers for sharing your views with the board. Uh, the board will determine if any of the issues should be addressed as an agenda item at a future meeting. And in fact, Madam Chair, uh, you'll hear this afternoon around the science of reading and English language arts standards, so. Good timing. I'm gonna check the agenda here real quick. Give me just a moment. Next item, we will act on ESSER items. Welcome, Doug Bolling. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're getting ready for uh, ESSER 2, or we'll start with our ESSER 2 changes. Uh, we've got eight different districts that submitted ESSER 2 changes. Uh, net change value is about $71,000 out of these eight different districts. Um, so as we look at them, uh, Rollins County is using up the remainder of their ESSER II allocation for salaries and software. Uh, Northeast is moving some money around for premium pay. Pittsburgh uses up the rest of their ESSER II allocation for summer school. Then uh, Emporia just moving money around for retention pay and after school programs. Barber County North for salaries and software. Holton uses up the rest of theirs for premium pay and curriculum. And then Caney Valley, uh, just moving money for software and salaries. And then Halstead uses up the remainder of theirs for some teacher technology. As I said, the net change is about $71,000. And where we are cumulatively, last month we were at about $500,000 left in the ESSER two funds that hadn't been earmarked for anything. Uh, this 70,000 gets us down to about 400,000, and we're still looking at Topeka with 300 and some thousand dollars uh, being the bulk of what's left. And we are constantly communicating with them, and they will have theirs in pretty quick. Uh, we've set kind of a soft deadline of June 1st to have all S or 2s changes done because this money has to be encumbered by September 30th of 2023. So we wanna make sure everybody has a plan for how they're gonna use it. They get it encumbered so that they can get it liquidated by the end of the year. Uh, the teaching and learning pieces sit at 75% for ESSER two. Jim Porter, I see your name in the hand raise app. Is that for this? All right, I don't see any other questions. I'm ready for a motion. Ann? 
I move that the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Commissioner's Task Force on ESSER distribution of money and approve the public school district for ESSER two change requests as presented for use of federal COVID-19 relief funds. Anybody seconds? Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand and keep it up. I've got nine and opposed, abstain, one. Thank you. All right, moving on to ESSER 3, we've got 18 new plans for you to review this month and then 26 districts uh, with ESSER 3 changes. Those changes will result in a $4 million net change. The 18 new plans are 13.3 million. Looking at where we're at now, you all have approved 259 plans. Uh, we've got 26 changes this month, 18 new plans to be approved. That left us with nine that we had not submitted by the last task force. On Monday, we knocked three of those out, so we're down to six that are uh, looking for that final approval. We hope to have all nine of those to the task force and to the board next month. So as we look at uh, kind of a breakdown of the funds, the districts had 14.6 million at their disposal. 13.3 uh, million is in encompassed in these plans. The per district averages there, the low end is Otis Bison, the high end is Leavenworth at 2.3 million, and then the per pupil spending, Gossel is the low end, 417, and Northern Valley is the high end at 1892. Uh, for the teaching and learning aspects this month, uh, they're setting at 77% for, for those pieces. Uh, our cumulative then, with the 13.3 million going in there, we're setting at about 81%, and that'll leave us with about $50 million um, in ESSER three funds that have not been uh, earmarked for any specific purpose at this time. Any questions for Doug? Kathy? It's really just a definition question. Would you remind me, please, of the definition of premium pay? So Premium pay is um, a district agrees to and the employees agree to receiving pay for certain activities, whatever that might be, and that's done ahead of time. You can't do it after the fact, you have to do it before. So if we want to give retention bonuses, uh, if you sign your contract and you come back to school on August 15th or whatever, we will give you retention pay or if you're still under contract in December, we'll offer you premium pay or retention pay. So as it's any kind of pay that is agreed to ahead of time by both the employer and the employee. And that's why we don't like the bonus piece because the work's already been done. Nobody agreed to, we've got extra money so we're gonna give it to you. Can't do it that way. You have to have an agreement of some type ahead of time and then we're good to go. And that was splitting hairs by the Department of Ed in the very beginning. Yeah. Any other questions? Ready for a motion to approve us? Oh, apologies. Okay, that's the three changes. Thank you. Um, so Shy Lynn's using up some more of their money for uh, touchless faucets, Bonner Springs, uh, curriculum and a psychologist, Remington water filling stations, Elkhart water filling stations, Gardner Edgerton, uh, they're actually going in the wrong direction, but uh, they had moved some money around and so the expenses came up lower than they have expected, so they went down, um, but those changes are in premium pay and mental health supports. Then we've got Cherokee moving money around for after school programs, premium pay, Gerard, um, 32,000 for curriculum, Emporia, 180,000 for curriculum and salaries. Then uh, Iola uh, got a big HVAC project that they got their paperwork turned in for, and so that's been approved now, and that's all in the changes. Oberlin uses the rest of theirs up for premium pay and curriculum. Uh, Lincoln, curriculum and summer school. Uh, Nickerson, another HVAC project got approved, or they got all the paperwork in, so that's a 
pretty big chunk there. Um, Marysville, another HVAC project and some salaries, Ellis curriculum. Uh, Rose Hill is on here. They had submitted some changes, but we deemed both of those ineligible, and I'll talk to, about them in just a second. And then Peabody Burns, um, 13000 for technology. Augusta Professional Development Curriculum, Marion Curriculum, Osage City Curriculum, Kiowa County uh, uses up the rest of theirs for premium pay and salaries. Then uh, Santa Fe Trail and HVAC Project, Titan HVAC, El Dorado, um, they're actually going the other direction and they had with drawn uh, multiple items for technology and different things that they decided that they didn't need. So ac they actually went in the other direction. They put money back in the, in the bank and come up with other ways to use it later. Uh, Galena, uh, 373,000 for technology and premium pay. And then the last two, Parsons, uh, salaries, and Attica uses the rest of theirs up for a small HVAC project. So net change is $4 million. Then as we look at the two, I mentioned Rose Hill. Um, they had put in a couple of uh, items, two different buildings, um, basically security cameras. They do talk about air quality sensors, but you can't check for a virus with those air quality. And so the link to COVID isn't there. Uh, we've had some further um, clarification from the Department of Ed that security cameras just aren't a great way to spend the money. So we deem both of those ineligible as we went through. So two of them for $7,000 a piece. So as we look at this, I said a net change of 4.1 million, that gets us down to 46 million left, and we're still setting at 81% um, for teaching and learning objectives. Can you bring me up to date on and define or clarify curriculum? Got a lot of money going for curriculum. What's curriculum? So uh, it's textbooks for some as they look <clears throat> at, um, I think a lot of them have really taken a hard look at what they were using prior to COVID. And when COVID hit, they started realizing that it wasn't up to date, it didn't meet their needs, it wasn't addressing needs of uh, their most struggling students, and so they're looking for how do they ramp that up. Also included in that curriculum are a lot of supplemental materials because we're talking about 20% set aside for those most impacted, so special education students, foster students, migrant students, EL students, uh, foster incarcerated, um, so a lot of it is going towards, all right, what are supplemental, supplemental materials that we can use with this, these populations to help them help combat that learning loss. And how is that related to COVID? It's how the Department of Ed spelled it out, how we okay. could use the funds. Okay. <laughs> Question from Dennis. Uh, the on, the on the textbook, does that include online? Is that what that's part of the? There, there are some some of the materials that uh, districts have proposed to us is online items because they didn't have any way to do things remote. The materials they did have didn't adapt very well, so part of the funds can be used it for preparing for the next time if there is a next time. I mean, yeah, I'm just wondering how that's working out time wise. You know, since COVID's been officially uh, dismissed. But, uh, well, anyway, uh, the other question, I had two questions actually. And uh, on premium pay, is that broke down on like support staff and teaching? I mean, how does that break down for who gets what? Because Except some people are on contract anyway, right? Yeah, this is above and beyond their contract. We do not. Okay recommend putting this in your salary schedule. This is above and beyond because how are you gonna pay for it afterwards? Yeah. It's a district decision how much each person gets. Most districts that we've seen, uh, classified, certified, all staff get basically the same amount. 
Some break it down that your classified staff might not get the same amount as your certified staff, um, but it's cooks, bus drivers, custodians, secretaries, teachers, okay. principals. I just wondered if you had percentages like, you know, and we're talking about teacher retention a lot and whether that figures into the way they break this down generally. As to how much they give them? Well, you know, if, yeah, if they're given premium pay, is there a significant amount of that that goes to retain teachers? Do, do you have just... I, I would, I don't have a figure for you. I would say a lot of it is earmarked or tied to that signing a new contract showing up on the first day that making sure that I'm retaining the staff that I have. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a concern at the local level. So, yeah. I mean, that's important. So. My question from Ann. Thank you. It's not really a question, but I think the discussion about curriculum is good, but I think one of the things that really jumped out right away when schools shut down was we found out our curriculum in many school districts was not adaptable to remote learning. And we also found out that there was a big difference in what was going on in communities of poverty versus communities um, that had a lot of money. And so I think using some of this money to adapt curriculum, what they also found out, as we all did in all areas of our lives, is that there were some things we learned about in COVID that we really liked that we never would have tried if COVID hadn't happened. And I think there are a lot of districts out there that are now using remote learning for other things. Like if I have a kid who's ill, broken leg, whatever, has to be home for several weeks, we're gonna Zoom them in. And having a curriculum that adapts in and out to different ways uh, for remote learning can be a really, really good thing. So I can see why the Department of Ed approved you know, curriculum, because we learned a lot about um, how curriculum does and doesn't work um, when COVID hit, for better or worse. But thank you. And so some of the explanations we've seen also to go along with that is that districts found out that they didn't have an aligned curriculum during that time. Um, and then one of the other pieces that I'll just throw out that we kind of hang our hat on is how do we come out of the pandemic stronger than we went into it? And so that's allowable. And so when we look at a lot of these, we're thinking, okay, how does it make us better? I believe we're ready for a motion this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, I move that the Kent State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Commissioner's Task Force on ESSER distribution of money and approve the public school district for ESSER 3 expenditure plans and ESSER 3 change requests as presented for use of federal COVID-19 relief funds. I have a second, Jim McNeese. Any further discussion? All in favor? Raise your hand, keep it up please. I see eight opposed, one abstain, one. Motion passes. Thank you. We are going to skip our break because I can hear. Give you a few. Can you wait until after the first graders that are outside in the hallway? You, you heard them. We need to get the first graders in. We'll take a short break after that. Give us five minutes. We'll take a five minute break. Just five.
early in the year to get invited by some outstanding teachers uh, that you see here today. And uh, we'll get it. We'll get it all corrected. The Heather Heatherstone Elementary School in Olathe, and uh, I got to see a great project-based learning around uh, agriculture and uh, learning about agriculture and all the great things that it can do in teaching social studies standards and language arts standards. So I just want to thank all the staff at uh, Heatherstone for inviting me. This, you're in for outstanding treat today. Uh, and uh, I will turn it over to them. So it's all yours. Sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. Can we get the microphone passed over to Ms. Smith? You may need to turn it on. There you go. It should be on. There you go. You're good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Nancy Smith, and I am one of the teachers. Um, and we would like to start out with, so if you are a board member, would you raise your hand so our children can see who the board members are? And if you have a cookie and the papers from my kids, would you stand up? If the cookie, if you have a cookie, and now those people that have their hands raised, would you carefully walk to one of them and hand them the cookie and the papers? So come on around and hand it to somebody who has their hands raised. They have their hand raised. Did you go down there to the end? <laughs> Natasha? Right there, Tibby. Now, my kids, if you have a folder and a bag stand up and do the same thing. Go to somebody with their hand raised. So a little background for you. We have been um, learning a lot about agriculture this year. And it's kind of a passion of mine. Um, I'm kind of a sciencey kind of person. And I naturally started getting into agriculture and combining these two things together. And my team is wonderful. My principal is wonderful. And we just kind of started morphing into this bigger and bigger thing. But as we started doing our long range planning and we started looking at our standards, we don't have a lot of standards that specifically say agriculture in them. And we want to change that. And so that's why we are here today. We are here to appeal to you to start talking to anybody that you can that has anything to do with making standard changes in Kansas. Not that we want to change any standards, what we want to do is we want to change the wording. We want to use agriculture as the vehicle to teach, uh, or we, to teach agriculture in social studies. So an example is, we teach erosion. So we would like to have teachers see in writing in our standards, oh, well, we could use fields and crops as a way to teach about erosion. Just little wording, things like that, we think could make a huge difference in the lives of Kansas students. All Kansas students, grades kindergarten through fifth grade. So what we started was this year, oh my goodness, immersing these kids. They have done so many things crazy. 
in the community, having the community come in to us to do things. We have reached out to so many people and involved so many people in the learning of these students. So what they would like to do today is share their learning with you and appeal to you because they want to keep going. They want to keep learning more about Kansas agriculture. So I'm just going to turn it over to them and let them teach you. We like to thank everyone for coming, especially members of the board. As you know, today we are going to present the MVP award to an outstanding player of our team. This player has gone above and beyond to provide for everyone. Let's have him stand up. Um, Patrick, you have been a very good player and member of our team, but we have another MVP who provided everything we needed to win the Super Bowl. Let's hear it for our MVP, the Kansas Farmer. That's right, folks. The Kansas Farmer provided everything we needed to win the Super Bowl. Thanks, Coach Reed, fans, and the board. It was a tough season, but farmers all over Kansas pulled together to make a great Super Bowl experience for everyone. Well, I have to get ready for the parade. I'll hand you over to the, our press secretary. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mu Donna Kawasaki, and I'm here today to tell you about our goal for next season. To help me out, I would like my PR team to stand up. Our goal for next season is to help teachers plan some great agriculture lessons for all Kansas kids. To do that, my team will tell you how agriculture and social studies fit together. Here is the first pillar of agricultural learning. This pillar is for the relationship between agriculture and the environment. Here's your social studies geography idea that teaches kids about care for our world. Yeah, first day. Here is the second pillar of agricultural learning. This pillar is for the relationship between food, fiber, and fuel. Here is a social studies history idea that teaches kids about Kansas crops and where our food comes from. Yeah, second down. Here is the third pillar of agricultural learning. This pillar is for the relationship between agriculture and animals. Here is the social studies history idea that teaches kids about the importance of animals on Kansas farms. Yeah, third down. Here is the fourth pillar, no, yeah, here is the fourth pillar of agricultural learning. This pillar is for the relationship between agriculture and lifestyle. Here is a social studies economics idea that we have choices to make. Yeah, fourth down. Here is the fifth pillar of agricultural learning. This pillar is for the relationship between agriculture and the STEM field. Here is the social studies economics idea that we have lots of agricultural careers. Yeah, touchdown. Here is the sixth pillar of agriculture learning. This pillar is for the relationship between agriculture and society. Here is the social studies. Here's the social studies idea that includes all of the social studies standards that kids learn about. Yeah, the extra point is good. Now we're going to tell you why all Kansas kids need to learn about agriculture every year. Food people, stand up. To be good consumers, we have to know plants and animals our food comes from. We need to know about healthy eating and what kinds of foods are in each food group. That way, we can learn how to eat more fresh foods than frozen foods. We need to know how food gets from the farm to our plate. 
The Kansas farmers provided all the yummy snacks we ate during the Super Bowl. Fiber people, stand up. We need to know what our clothes are made from so we can make good choices when buying them. The Kansas farmers help produce cleats and jerseys for the Chiefs. Fuel people, stand up. We need to know how important it is to find different ways to make fuel and energy. Cow manure and corn are some of those ways. The Kansas Farmers provided the fuel for players and people to get to the Super Bowl. Floor people, stand up. We need to know the importance of flowers, trees, and grass for our lives. The Kansas farmers provide us flowers for the cheerleaders and grass for, for the practice fields. Fun people, stand up. All kids should know that many toys, sports equipment, art supplies, and health products all come from our farm. The Kansas farmers provided 120 footballs for the Super Bowl. Future people, stand up. We need to know how important it is for our farmers to be learning new ways how to provide us with food, fiber, fuel, flora, fun, and future. State School Board, because Heather's some first graders, think that agriculture is so important. Here are some of the plays that we made so we could learn more. We learned about how important wind turbines are for the Kansas economy. We learned about Kansas Ag Month with the whole school and had Farmer Bill come and talk to us about corn. We going to Hall of Fame for the field trip. We did a presentation for the Olathe Food Production and they thought our idea to only have Kansas foods on Ken the Kansas Day lunch menu was a great idea. We were going to have a family fun night, but it was a snow day. We had 12 baby ticks and gave them to a local farmer. My family raised chickens and we came and talked to first grade. Sadly, most, uh, most Kansas first graders don't have very many opportunities to learn about agriculture in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. So, team, what would we like all Kansas kids to learn? A is for agriculture. Can we please have agri culture ideas written down for Kansas teachers. G is for ground cover. Ground cover? What is ground cover? I have no idea, but I bet it's important I should learn it in fourth grade. R is for runoff. What is runoff? I wonder if Kansas teachers know they could teach about it in the Earth Day unit. I is for irrigation. Wow, that's a big word. Do Kansas teachers know where to find learning ideas about water? 
C is for careers. Since your happiness gateway to be grown-ups, we would love to learn about agriculture jobs right here in Kansas. U is for universal. We want all Kansas kids to learn about Kansas agriculture every year they're in school. L is for land. Every year during Kansas week, we learn about land. Could we add how hum humans and animals can change the land? T is for technology. Wow, farmers use technology too. We would like to learn more about it every year. Maybe when we grow up, we can create a new technology for farmers to use. You, you is for utter. All Kansas kids need to learn about farm animals and why we need them. R is for rural Kansas. Some of us have never been to rural Kansas or to a farm. How can Kansas kids learn more about each other? E is for everything. Can't you see? Kansas kids deserve to learn more about the world around them. Please help us by asking those in charge to add more agricultural learning to our Kansas teaching standards. So you can see we've learned a lot, but there is still so much we want to learn. Can you help us bring more ag education in the classroom? When we work as a team, we all win big. Thanks, Moo, for letting us come and the board. And we like to sing our Kansas Farmer fight song, Lunch on the Range. So we'd like to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to come and share and wanted to know if you had any questions for us. I will remind the board that these young people are from Olathe. Dennis, they're not from Yoder, okay, where, where kids are working on, on a working farm. So this is really important to them. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And I, I got some questions during that break that we had to fit in. And as you all were coming in and sitting down, and several students asked me if, if we make the laws. They really wanted to know, are we the ones responsible for the laws? And so I just wanted to assure you that you have, in fact, come to the right place, even though we don't make the laws. But we do set policy, and this board is responsible for state standards. And that sounds to me like probably some of what you're asking for. So thank you all for being here. We may have a few questions. Can I start with Dennis? Yeah, I just want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is really close to my heart. And Nancy, standing behind you against the wall there, is uh, heads up the Ag in the Classroom Committee that, I, that I'm on. And uh, I'm from Yoder, Kansas, and that's a little farm community with all kinds of things happening in a little grade school there. They raise chickens, and uh, we just had a barbecue Saturday from the chickens they raised. They, <laughs> They uh, barbecued, I mean, they uh, butchered those chickens. Can you imagine doing that? Raising little baby chicks and then eating them about seven or eight weeks later. I'm sorry about that. <coughs> but that, I don't want to traumatize you, but that's what, that's what farming's all about. So we had, we, had, we had our 12 chickens, and they went to my friend Amy's farm. Okay, and so well. she sends us pictures every once in a while of, of what they will look like. But um, anyway. yes, and I do a lot with the Kansas Ag That's um, in the classroom to get ideas and lesson plans and work with them closely. <laughs> well, this is really exciting for me because I raised four children on a, on a Kansas farm and they had 4-H projects and they love the farm and we've got sweet corn and beets and tomatoes and all those things growing on our farm today. So I'm thank, thank you for coming. This is wonderful. Um, I have a question. Yes. 
Kansas is, uh, we can do that. It's a little zone. Have you talked about uh, growing zones? Uh, apples grow better a little bit further north from Kansas, but we do have one hybrid tree that we've made applesauce from the apples, and that's that's a great uh, thing to do. Is to and you, I, I appreciate you kids learning how to eat fresh food. That's that's going to make good, healthy brains and strong bodies. So whenever you can eat fresh food, do that. That's the best you can do. Yes, ma'am. Board members, do we have any other questions or comments for the students or their teachers? All right, I don't see any more questions. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And the production quality was very high. You deserve a Thank lot you. Of Thanks. Senate Youth Kansas delegates and alternates presentation, although I understand that there are some tests today. So welcome, Denise Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, well, I, you know, I heard uh, Commissioner Watson asking how we might top that, and normally I might question the same thing, but the individual that we have with us today I think is gonna be pretty top-notch. So uh, for those who uh, maybe are not quite as aware of what the, unit, the U.S. Senate Youth Program is, it's for high school juniors and seniors, and it was established in 1962 by William Randhurst, Randolph Hearst Foundation. And so qualified students need to demonstrate a desire to serve others in a leadership role and have high academic achievements, high aspirations for college and career, and be self-motivated. They also must demonstrate an interest in government, history, and politics. So every year, two delegates and two alternates are, are um, selected from each state. E the, and uh, each delegate then is provided with a $10,000 undergraduate college scholarship as well as a week-long trip to Washington, D.C. So as, um, as Chairwoman uh, Haas had mentioned there, um, we today, so today we have Sukesh Kamesh from Kingman High School who's, who's with us. He is one of the delegates. Also, the other delegate is Madison Coyne. She's from Blue Valley West High School, uh, USD 229. And then we also have two um, alternates who could not be here again because of testing today. Quinton Hoppy from Pleasant Ridge High School, Easton, USD 449, 
and Jeremiah Rather from Andover High School, Andover USD 385. So we've asked uh, Sukesh to be here today, and I will say he just made the trip up for those that were there Sunday at the uh, Governor's Scholars event. He was one of our, our uh, scholars who was here. So please welcome Sukesh. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, and Commissioner Watson. I am Sukesh Kamesh, and um, thank you for the very wonderful introduction. And yeah, I was one of the uh, um, 2023 United States Senate Youth Program delegates. And obviously, you guys want to hear about my story, but you know, first I just want to talk about how I was able to get there. And first of all, I want to, con I mean, thank you guys for the wonderful relationships you have with our CTSOs and the strong commitment you've put out to our CTSOs because I was a state FBLA officer for two years. 4-H um, isn't a CTSO, but I was also a state officer in 4-H as well. And all the um, things I've learned from public speaking to leadership, to citizenship, to serving my community, to managing my time while still getting good grades and all that is thankful. I um, mean, you know, I'm thankful to my teachers and the effort you guys have done, so I really appreciate that. And in fact, I would have met Commissioner Watson you know, several times throughout the past couple of years without that position I had and you know he helped me throughout the process as well as uh, Mrs. Miller back there who is our coordinator so um, thank you to everyone that helped me to get this scholarship as well as the experience. Now um, you know when I first was in DC I mean I've been before I was uh, I went there for the National Spelling Bee twice however this was just you got to see what's going on behind the scenes and that's something you don't get a lot of the times and actually seeing you know because the media just covers one side of the argument or the other side of the argument. And, you know, frankly, with us teenagers, we're just like, hey, we want to change stuff, but we also want to agree and make sure that it's a mutual agreement, not just do it because we're in power or something. And that's how, you know, our student council operates. We make sure if we want to do something specific for prom, everyone's going to agree on it, not the majority gets what they want. And, you know, going into D.C. and actually seeing behind the scenes, that's when I'm like, okay, so what's actually going on, you know? And I realized that, you know, they're normal people, too, and that everyone's normal people, and we just need to make sure that we're communicating as um, people to our elected officials what exactly we want. And that really, I mean, that's something that was eye-opening for me. And something that I didn't know and learned a lot about throughout the trip was how our judicial system works as well as our defense system. And for the highlight was supposed to be the president, However, um, he had to cancel on us because on Thursday when we were supposed to go, he had a meeting with Kevin McCarthy, I believe, for the budget meeting. So, But the, the highlights for me, besides the presidential meeting, would have, uh, was um, when we met Justice so Sonia Sotomayor at the Supreme Court. And it was historic for me because I got to see the place where important cases like Brown versus Board of Education, um, Roe versus Wade took place. And that was just really, just being in those seats and being in history was really momentous for me. And then going to the Pentagon was something I didn't think I was going to enjoy, but that was definitely my most favorite part because um, we got to meet Commander of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, and he is a very interesting individual, very funny guy. <laughs> um, one of the things he told us is, you don't have to serve in the military as long as you serve in some fashion, whether that's being a teacher and serving your students, being a doctor and serving your patients, or putting your time and giving up your time. So, you know, that's like, struck out because as a high-ranking military official uh, who's been in his expertise for several years, he's saying things like that. And just just motivated people like me. I mean, I don't plan to go into the military, but I want to become a doctor and go into pre-med and eventually be a senator or something like that or work for the um, as a U.S. Surgeon General or some in that fashion where I can um, connect both my interest in medicine as well as um, public policy and things like that. And he also, you know, there's a funny comment he made. He's like, I can have you all on your knees begging for mercy in 72 hours when we ask. <laughs> and I just thought that was really funny because, you know, you wouldn't expect someone in that level to say that to 104 kids and all of our military mentors. And our, basically our chaperones for the trip were military people. <laughs> so my um, commander, uh, once, Commander Sansbury. Cap Captain Patrick Sansbury, he's from California. He's a Marine. He was my military mentor and... Um, along with my group. So yeah, it was an amazing opportunity to see behind the scenes what's going on in the government. And definitely motivated me when I got back home to, you know, I volunteer at several organizations. I had several leadership positions and could give me that little spark I needed to, you know, reinvigorated me to go back into college and continue all the uh, positions I had. And I brought this for you guys. 
Um, we got this to receive our scholarship certificate, and on the inside, um, it's signed by the senators. I didn't get a signature from Roger Marshall. He wasn't able to make it that day, but Senator Moran signed it. I got one from the Surgeon General, and then, so you know, this is the famous people side. This is the to be famous people side, so all the delegates and all the military mentors signed this side of the, um, um, whatever this is, certificate, pimp, whatever you want to call it, but yeah, so I just wanted to bring that to you guys to show, and yeah, um, that's basically my experience, and you know, it was very amazing, and I'm once again thank, grateful to you know, Commissioner Watson, the work that Mrs. Miller put in behind the scenes, as well as whoever the committee was that selected us, as well as my principal, you know, not only for this, but he wrote like over 25 letters of recommendation for me, so um, I'm really thankful for that. And also, I mean, hi, Mrs. Hopkins again. I met you in January, so yeah. Are there any questions for me? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Commissioner. So tell everyone, how does a kid in Kingman, Kansas, get to stand up here, go to D.C.? Tell a little bit about your journey. Yeah, so um, my parents are actually teachers. They were teachers. They, are, they were special ed teachers. They're now IEP specialists. And I was born in India um, up until the age of three, and my parents are immigrants, and I myself are immigrants. And when um, George... President Bush, he put out the, when he wanted more teachers from foreign areas to come into the United States in 2008. That's how my dad initially got his job in Florida. And then the state of Florida had layoffs. So the only place my dad got a job was in Pratt, Kansas. And yeah, so, and we had 60 days to find a new job or else we'd have to go back to India and pre with the chance of never being able to come back to this country. And on day 58 is when he got the job in uh, Pratt, Kansas. And he was placed in Kingman, Kansas. And that's where we've been ever since. And we've just, been grateful for that journey. And being in a rural area, you just learn to, you know, serve others. And although we were foreigners, for lack of a better word, we were accepted as we were one among the community. And, you know, that's been really influential. And for me, because I never had grandparents growing up. I never had that role of a grandparent in my life. But you when know, I'm going home to Kingman, I say all these Kingman older people are my grandparents, you know, I have, I have more than 150 grandparents in that kind of way, you know, and the neighbors, you know, they take good care, I mean, that's really important to me, because although I didn't have that sense of actual family, my Kingman family really gave me everything I needed to help me succeed in life, and that sense of comfort was really important in any child's life, as you guys would probably know, as Board of Education members, and going into high school, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I mean, I was thinking, you know, I like science, I like helping people, but then, you know, actually volunteering shadow, volunteering at the, I volunteer at the Mayflower Clinic in Wichita, which is for the uninsured, underserved patients, and we give them free health care. And I also work at the Kingman Hospital as a certified nurse's aide, as well as I've been able to shadow a lot of physicians over the past four years, and I knew that um, medicine was the path for me. And throughout 4-H and throughout FBLA, I've learned public speaking, especially 4-H for me. I started at age five, and up until even now, you know, I've been doing public speaking for a while, and that really gave me all the skills I needed. And I realized that I was able to talk efficiently and things like that. And I joined the forensics team when I was a freshman in high school. And I specifically did extemporaneous speaking, which is your pol politics current event speech. And I didn't think I'd be interested in that, but I ended up, you know, I ended up loving it, you know. And then when I had to take the test for the Senate program, it was basically, you know, an extemp, <laughs> extemp knowledge multiple choice tests, and then I had um, all the, I had to write an essay, I believe, in 35 minutes, or 350 word essay, and my topic was on bipartisanship, is what I ended up choosing, so I, it was nice that I was able to, you know, use all the knowledge, and everything going to the United States Senate Youth Program was basically a culmination for me of my, not only my background, but everything that had happened in my life for the th past 13, 14 years, because while I was taking the test or writing the essays, or, you know, preparing myself, I never thought, this was just, if I'm being completely honest, I Googled big money scholarships, <laughs> and I found this scholarship, and then it pointed on the Senate program website, it pointed to uh, Commissioner Watson's page, I'm like, hey, I know this guy, I'll maybe, let me just email him and go from there, and yeah, <laughs> and that's exactly what I put in. <laughs> but then, but you know, I didn't think it would be this big of a deal for me in my life, and it was basically a culmination of everything that had happened for me, and just grateful, you know, I mean, there's other opportunities like um, the Governor's Scholar Opportunity, I was able to take advantage of that. Um, 
I made it to the Presidential Scholar semifinalist, and finalist comes out here in a week or so, I think, pretty soon, so hopefully I made it. And there's a lot of networking. I think the biggest thing that I've realized through all these organizations is it's about the people. I mean, the $10,000 is very nice, but the network I've made with all the 104 delegates is what's going to be very valuable in the upcoming 20, 30 years of my future career. And and anything I do, especially my FBLA family, my Kansas FBLA has been great for me. Kansas 4-H has been amazing. And just anything I've done, it's just, the Senate program was just that end point. You know, it's like you've made it. You know, high school's kind of coming to the end. That's like, you know, the ultimate goal. Although it was never my ultimate goal, it was just I felt like it. And then, yeah, I was able to go from there. That's, that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to dodge the question. <laughs> that would be good Think if you were going to be a politician. Yeah. <laughs> And we have a few more questions, so I'll, yeah. I'll hand it down to Jim Porter. Thank you. You, are, I just want to congratulate you and tell you how impressive you are and how we would look forward to seeing you in the future. You've already answered the question that I was going to ask, so I'll just pass from this okay. point on. Thank you. And Dennis. Well, hey, um, thank you for coming up here, and uh, I'm proud to be part, uh, have you in my district. Yeah. And, and uh, hope you can... Uh, you know, you can make some money on the side being a, a motivational speaker before you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that but, one. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, medicine's a great pathway, and uh, many patients would like to have a doctor like you that would stand there and talk to them. Thank you. I they really need, appreciate they need that. that. They need someone that re with a heart like you've got. Thank you. So I really appreciate encourage that. Encourage you in that. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I, I love that you pointed out that Mark Milley called, essentially called um, teaching a form of service. And you're already clearly on a service path, and I just want to congratulate you. It was so nice to meet you on Sunday at the Governor's yeah. Awards. Now you're back, and it sounds like you're up for another award, so you're off to a good start. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. We get and lunch. we get to have lunch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, board members, lunch will be on the fifth floor. I'll see you there. And we will reconvene at 1.30.
Welcome back. At this time, I'll open the public hearing to receive public comments on emergency safety intervention regulations, KAR 91-42-1 and 91-42-2. In accordance with board policy, anyone who wishes to speak at the hearing is asked to complete an information card at the reception desk located at the entrance. I've already got 10 of those. Each speaker will have five minutes to make his or her presentation and one minute will be allowed for board members to ask questions. Written comments may be submitted as part of the hearing. I wanna make a comment to the board members. We're going to have more time to discuss this later, so questions today will be just for clarifying purposes only. We'll try to keep them brief so we can stay on schedule and then we'll have more time for conversation later. Um, written comments were received from the Joint Committee on Administration, Administrative Rules and Regulations and from the Kansas Association of School Boards. Copies are included in your board packets. Each person should state his or her name and indicate whether you are representing the opinion of a group. I will announce the name of the, the first, I'll announce two speakers at a time so that you know what order to come up in. The first speaker today is going to be Rocky Nichols. Welcome, Mr. Nichols. And then, sorry, Rocky. Um, the next two are Leanne Rogers and Sarah Loquist. Welcome. Rights Center of Kansas, um, representing our statewide organization, and also we have 26 different organizations who are who have signed on to collectively support this. Collectively, those 26 organizations serve or advocate for uh, over 500,000 Kansans with disabilities. Uh, it's hard to go over uh, a history that goes back to 2018 in five minutes, but I'll do my best, Madam Chair. Um, there's a lot of background on this. Parents have been waiting since 2018, 2019 to fix this. Today's hearing is a culmination of that. Um, we believe that KASB's letter that you all got previously incorrect, leaves the incorrect impression that the current regulations are somehow clear. Uh, that's not the case. As State S Senator Molly Baumgartner, who's chair of Senate Education Committee, uh, detailed in her 2019 memo, which I have attached to my testimony as well, um, that the regulations are unclear because they were incorrectly misinterpreted by an administrative hearing officer and that created loopholes that we're closing here today. Uh, Senator Baumgartner sends her regrets. She would have been here in person if not for an illness. However, I have attached her testimony supporting these changes to the regulations. Uh, the hearing officer's misinterpretation goes against the intent of both the ESI task force and the Kansas legislature. Uh, legislature passed in 2015 and 2016 with bipartisan support. Democrats, Republicans worked together. Senator Anthony Hinson was incredibly uh, crucial to the passage. Senator Bumgarner, Senator Abrams, several other listed, uh, Aaron Davis, Representative Kegel, numerous Democrats and Republicans. Um, the misinterpretation created significant loopholes in the reporting of seclusion incidents, meaning those loopholes leave parents in the dark because too many instances of seclusion do not have to be reported to parents in KSDE. In her memo, uh, Senator Baumgartner calls for these loopholes to be closed and to follow the legislative intent. That's what these regulations do. I was the vice chair of the legislatively created ESA task, ESI task force that wrote the current version of the law. Uh, Jim Porter was the chair of that uh, task force. Uh, we both agree with Senator Baumgartner and others that the rationale of the hearing officer and the misinterpretation creates loopholes that were never intended by the ESI task force or the Kansas legislature. This proposal closes those loopholes and finally fixes the problem. Again, we've been working on this since 2018. Um, Jim put together a work group uh, based on Senator Baumgartner's memo from 2018 and included very, various folks. I do want to point out that both uh, KASB and KNEA uh, were at the table of that Porter work group. John Heim, the former executive director of KASB, was always in the loop about the work group. Uh, and in fact, a KSAB uh, employee, um, KASB employee, Leah Flyder, was sent to participate in the Porter work group. Uh, in, in addition, uh, Adelia Schumann from KNEA was in the loop. Uh, attached, you will find the 2019 email from KSD attorney at the time. Laura Jurgensen to the work group members. As you can see, it was included to all the work group members, which included KASB, KNEA, and many other educational organizations like United School Administrators. So the Porter Work Group reached consensus 
um, came up with recommendations to close the loopholes to get back to that original legislative intent. That is also attached in my testimony. Finalized their recommendations. Uh, and no members of the work group, not KASB, not KNEA, not USA, none of the members expressed opposition about these recommend recommendations back in 2019. Uh, in January, when they were put together, when they were made public at the March 2019 board meeting, or at the SEAC meeting, the Special Education Advisory Council, in September of 2022. Um, that's the background. Uh, want to explain how we disagree with KASB's legal analysis about the regulations. Um, uh, in my packet, I include a memo from one of our uh, attorneys, Liz Huben. Um, KSASB is saying the changes do not allow for less restrictive alternatives. That's not the case. They do. Um, the hypothetical example uh, specifically deals with a student who has a behavior intervention st uh, strategy. And the contention is that that, uh, does not, that that would constitute seclusion. It does not. It constitutes timeout. The regulations specifically define timeout and physical escort as being separate from seclusion. And timeout means, quote, a behavioral intervention in which a student is temporarily removed from a learning activity. It's right there in the example. The example that KASB gives is a student with a behavioral intervention and they go to talk to a social worker. That is timeout, not seclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be willing to stand for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Liam Rogers, followed by Sarah Loquist. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Leanne Rogers, and I am speaking uh, as an individual today. I'm from the Olathe School District, represented by Ms. Dombrowski, and I have 35 years in the classroom, mostly first grade. Um, and I'm not here to disparage the work of Mr. Porter's work group at all, but to share a perspective from an educator as I read the recommended amendments. Um, I'm asking that, um, as written, they not be approved, but ask that they go back for further work. Um, within my charge as an educator, I'm charged within the scope to provide a safe and secure learning environment for all students placed within my care. An essential, an essential component of maximum learning experiences is a positive classroom environment. I have participated in numerous professional learning opportunities from both the state and my district to ensure a safe and secure learning environment, including the implementation of positive behavior supports. These tiered supports ensure that all students have a clear understanding of expectations and procedures to allow for optimal learning. In my experience, I have worked with students that needed additional tiered support to be successful in the classroom. As I read the proposed amendments, particularly those that outline how to purposefully isolate a student which would include um, one or any one of the following, removal of the student from the learning environment by school personnel, separation of the student from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment by school personnel, or placement of the student with an area, within an area of purposeful isolation by school personnel. I can think of several opportunities for both de-escalation and reinforcement of progress that would potentially be lost under the new definition of seclusion. Specifically, I can think of a student whose support person was our school counselor, and they may have needed to, ed to enter that educator's space away from their peers to practice calming strategies independently and with minimal interaction from the counselor and the student successfully was able to de-escalate independently, quickly checked in with the counselor. This now seems to meet the amended definition of seclusion. Many buildings in our district have also designated sensory rooms for students to access as proactive strategies so that students can regulate their emotions and return to the classroom. I believe the amended definition may prevent students from accessing these spaces and the strategy that is currently helping so many students and staff. If a student cannot access a private space to become regulated, their privacy is not protected. When that happens, the relationship between the student, what happens then between the relationship of the student and their peers? 
I also do not find specifics detailing how educators and school districts will be trained on the new regulations. Districts are busy crafting their pre-service and professional development right now for next year. Any change to something as involved as seclusions will require further trainings, and that seems to be falling on individual staff or individual school districts to develop this, and will not ensure that everyone has a common understanding of the changes that are recommended. Before these proposed amendments are revised and put in place, I believe something must be crystal clear in all of our minds, and with these proposed amendments, they may fall into con confusion. My definition of meaningfully engaging with students to provide instruction may be very different from that of my coworkers or of my administrator. In closing, we agree that loopholes must be closed, but we disagree that this language is the best way to do it. It may create additional problems. We agree on the policy goal wholeheartedly, but we disagree that this language is clear enough and we ask for clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Loquist will be followed by Philip Magruder. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Loquist. And I've been a school law attorney for 24 years. Currently, I am general counsel for the Central Kansas Cooperative in Education. However, some of you may remember me from my time um, serving as an attorney with the Kansas Association of School Boards. Unfortunately, I had left my employment with them at the time of this 2019 work group that is being discussed, so I can't speak to that. However, it was during my employment with KASB that I served on the original ESI task force with several of you here today. And I come before you today to provide testimony to give historical context for the current ESI regulations and to explain concerns with the proposed revisions. The original ESI task force members were selected to create a balance between parents and parent advocate perspectives as well as school district perspectives, with the state board member Jim Porter acting as the chair of the task force. The wording of the original regulations was no accident. It was the result of very intensive negotiations, wordsmithing, and involved a great deal of compromise on both sides. As the only school district attorney on that task force, I was heavily involved in the negotiations of the wording of the original regulations, and it would be fair to say that neither side was entirely happy with the end result. No, I certainly wasn't. In mediations, that's typically the mark of a good outcome. However, I cannot say that the changes proposed in these new revisions would be considered a good outcome. To the contrary, the proposed revisions upset that carefully crafted balance of the original regulations in several ways. And unfortunately, I'm afraid the, the greatest concern I have is that this is going to create a great deal of confusion in the field. And it's not going to fix the policy concern or um, any loopholes that you are concerned about. So first of all, the addition of the terms purposefully isolate and area of purposeful isolation in the definitions are unnecessary, will cause confusion, and will lead to any area within the classroom, including areas used for students to voluntarily calm themselves and areas used for timeout, which had previously been agreed were not subject to these regulations, being considered an area of purposeful isolation. This will cause staff either to spend much more time doing ESI reports for situations that were never intended to be covered under the ESI regulations, or staff will no longer write such accommodations and student behavior plans in order to avoid that additional time and staff that would be required to track and report the additional ESIs this change would cause. And let me be clear, 
those accommodations are very beneficial to students. It teaches them to self-regulate. The definition of seclusion in the current regulations was very carefully crafted by all the parties involved to take numerous real life school situations into consideration. The current definition of seclusion requires that the student be one, placed in an enclosed area by school personnel. Two, purposefully isolated from adults and peers. And three, they are prevented from leaving or they reasonably believe they are prevented from leaving the enclosed area. To the contrary, area of purposeful isolation would be defined as any separate space, regardless of the use of that space, other than an open hallway or similarly open environment. This could be the back of a classroom while other students are still in the room. Likewise, one of the criteria for purposefully isolating a student would be removing the student from all or most adults or peers. What does most mean? How should staff be trained? So to the extent you've received complaints, I believe it's more appropriate to focus on appropriate training. I have additional points that I've provided to you in written testimony. And again, I have grave concerns here. I hope that you will do me the favor of um, reading through those additional points in my written testimony. Thank you very much. I see my time is up. Thank you. Any questions before I leave? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Magruder will be followed by Lisa Farkas. Um, sure, you have five minutes. Sure, yeah. all right, all right. Welcome. Welcome. Committee members, educators, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I appreciate you all for making the time for me and Lisa to speak today. And I'll show you for my first time speaking on the panel like this. We'll be very brief. Um, Lisa? My, my name is Lisa Vargas. I am a self advocate of Lawrence. And my name is Philip Magruder, and uh, I'm a self advocate who is from Kansas City, Kansas. And we both are currently living in Lawrence, Kansas. And um, we are the personal living examples of living through the seclusion and the physical restraints against children's, children with disabilities, or IDD. And um, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when I was age two. And just like my fellow members in the IDD community, like Lisa here, or from the disability rights community, I felt that seclusion and that physical restraint growing up as well. How did it make you feel, Lisa? I feel discouraged. Not only did she felt discouraged, but she felt it was abusive because these loopholes will allow the schools to violate any child's rights and keep the parents unaware of these terrible tactics used like the seclusion and the restraint. I can talk about my own personal experiences that I've seen young people with disabilities be unable to receive the necessary services through, throughout transition as a result of this. If Lisa here felt discouraged, imagine feeling isolated because of this loophole. Isolation then creates loneliness, and then that loneliness creates bullying. Um, 
I believe also that teachers do learn more about these loopholes and become more educated. And what Lisa means by that, become more educated about the students with disabilities instead of sending them to another classroom, a special ed classroom out of, their, out of fear of what they might do. She believes trust and communication between the parents and the schools are important. Again, I was fortunate enough to graduate from the University of Kansas from being bullied to graduating, coming from the worst school district in the state of Kansas, the USD 500 in Kansas City, Kansas, for example, can use these KSDE created loopholes as a way to ignore and violate the human rights of these children. This needs to stop. No child should be in any school with these type of practices continuing as it creates problems. If students watch the way teachers handle these handles the student, then the students with no disabilities will look at that as a form of harassing or we can harass the student, which fortunately will result in too many harmful results, which we don't want to get into. We, me and Lisa, if we could sum up a few recommendations for the community to, committee to consider, and we know we don't have much time, we would encourage teachers and parents of students with disabilities in a program being educated about the history of the ADA that will create clarity, which will help both sides help the students with disabilities, arguably the most underrepresented minority in education. And lastly, improving disability student services with increased staff, better integration into other areas of education, such as sensory rooms for students with high sensory problems, which they just created at Arrowhead Stadium, go Chiefs, tutoring services for children still having difficulty concentrating, and programs of social uplift. Thank you for your time and for allowing us to share our thoughts and for seeing that we're the example of that seclusion and restraint that we went through. We're still here. Thank you. Thank you both. A question Thank you. Thank you. So that we have some proposed changes on the table. It's not clear to me, are you in favor of those changes or not? We are against the loopholes. So you, okay, that helps. Thank you. Any other questions? Next up, we will have Gabriel Padilla, followed by Jacqueline Anderson. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Gabriel Padilla. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me speak today. And shout out to Betty Arnold. Go Wichita. Uh, my name is Gabriel Padilla. I'm in my seventh year of teaching mathematics and AVID at Wichita West High School. You know. I come to speak about the emergency safety intervention that will affect my classroom and the entire state of Kansas, and I'm speaking as an individual. Teaching in the largest school district in Kansas, these changes can be detrimental in many ways, including the language in this document. Purposeful isolation is the first word. Despite the board's idea of making this clear, the words making it clear as mud. Keeping this language vague and broad for districts to interpret differently will create confusion. In my district, teachers and administrators are not always on the same page regarding the different tiered behaviors within classrooms. The proposed emergency safety intervention regulation changes are too broad and will not help issues educators who have addressed disruptive and often dangerous behaviors will create more uncertainty. The statement refers, referencing purposeful isolation will inhibit educators addressing behavior disruptions within their classrooms. If a student is separated from their peers within the classroom, I am a professional who has obtained a license and my professional judgment may be in question for my failure to interpret these new proposed regulation amendments. This language also provides no support for teachers to have the professional judgment of what they think is needed to calm down a student with whom they have built a relationship. Also, the proposed regulations will allow a timeout, still allow timeout, 
but it isn't clear how long a timeout or what difference it is from seclusion or discipline. Another amendment that concerns me is the idea of meaningful instruction. As a teacher who has to take psychology to get his degree in licensure, we all heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The reason is, meaningful, is that meaningful instruction may not always be in the classroom setting. For instance, I had five positive behavior support students in my last hour of the school year, Algebra 1. Two of them would go to their IEP manager to do their calming down as they needed. Just because they weren't learning polynomials with me doesn't mean they did not learn something that day. Their learning looked different that day, but as their teacher, I wanted them to learn that. Despite talking about positive behavior supports for students, these behaviors we teachers see are not solely students with IEPs and 504s. Behavior together has been from, altogether has been from regular education students too. This brings up my last point. I'm concerned that this committee may have had special education ed teachers solely. While some special education teachers need to have a seat at the table regarding this, so do more teachers. After all, we are the ones in the classrooms. All special education, regular education, middle, high school, pre-kindergarten, urban, city, rural, all must be included on this committee. We all have different needs, but our ultimate goal is for the students. Thank you for the opportunity opportunity to express my concerns from an educator's perspective. Thank you very much. Board members, any questions? Thank you. And I understand that Jacqueline Anderson is not going to speak, but Jacqueline, if you're, you may be behind the pillar. I was going to ask if it's okay if I read the comment on your card. It says seclusion and restraint is not, all caps, not okay. Next up, we'll have Stacy Kramer, followed by, I think that says Delia Nelson Metzger. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stacy Kramer with Topeka Public Schools, and I'm here with the support of Donna Whiteman, our counsel, and our director of special education, Dr. Jennifer Harrington. I'm the grant coordinator currently. However, much of my education career has been as a special ed teacher or as a special ed consulting teacher. I also currently coordinate our district's de-escalation training, MANT training, and I maintain our emergency safety intervention reporting records. Topeka Public Schools has many students with significant social, emotional, and mental health needs. Our district does a phenomenal job of supporting these students through several mental health initiatives, such as our district mental health team, building mental health teams, trauma-informed positive behavior tiered intervention services, participation in the mental health intervention team grant, social emotional screening for pre-K through 12th grade students. In addition, we offer MANT training several times a year. Our staff truly do try very hard to intervene often and early to prevent escalation. Even with all of these proactive initiatives, our students sometimes display dangerous behaviors which require emergency safety intervention. A common preventative strategy that we employ is to offer students time and space away to de-escalate. These timeouts can be provided in peace corners, classrooms, wellness rooms, or specialized classrooms staffed by personnel who can assist students in the de-escalation process. Sometimes students choose to go to these spaces by themselves, but often staff members direct or escort these students to these spaces. This occurs when students are beginning to show signs of being in physical danger, aggression, or are very disruptive. We are concerned that the new regulations may make it more difficult to distinguish between timeouts and purposeful isolation. For example, when a student is asked to go to a special education room or an area such as the counselor's office or social worker's area to de-escalate, it's not best to engage in teaching until they've finished the de-escalation process and can safely engage in expressing their emotions and are capable of processing. At these times, students are in a separate space and removed from the learning environment by staff via staff direction or escort, and staff are not meaningfully engaging with the student to provide instruction. While the student calms down, quite often they are also separated from all or most of peers and adults in the learning environment, as they are no longer in the general education setting, and special education classrooms do not contain all or most of their peers. The new regulations seem to state that this common procedure could be a seclusion. Furthermore, this procedure would possibly be out of compliance with the regulations if the timeout was not a result of imminent danger. 
Another concern is that the placement of a student for any reason other than for in-school suspension or, or detention or any other appropriate disciplinary measure is very vague. It's also very easy to meet both of these conditions. School personnel purposefully isolate the student and the student has reason to believe that the student will be prevented from leaving the area of purposeful isolation. This has raised questions from our staff. If a student is sent to the office and once there is prevented from leaving the office, is this a seclusion? If a student is asked to go to a special education resource room for a timeout and then is prevented from leaving the classroom, is that a seclusion? We urge you to reconsider the wording to better distinguish between timeout and purposeful isolation and to clearly define what any other appropriate disciplination, disciplinary measure might be. We also encourage you to consider including wording such as evidence-based de-escalation strategies to the line referencing meaningfully engaging the student in, to provide instruction. Allowing time to space, time and space, excuse me, away from peers will often facilitate re-engagement and instruction more effectively. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Darla, and I'm sorry that my writing <laughs> looked like Daria or whatever you thought it was. Dar but anyway, my name is Darla Nelson Mesker, and I am a program director at Families Together. Families Together is the federally designated parent training and information center for the state of Kansas. Funded by the Office of Special Education Programs, our mission is to encourage, educate, and empower families that include a youth or a child with a disability or exceptionality in Kansas. Families Together is also the Health Information Center for the state of Kansas, assisting families that include children with special health care needs. Additionally, we coordinate the Education Advocate Program within partnership with the Kansas State Department of Education, serving over 800 children who need special education representation, who are in the custody of the state, who do not have a parent to act on their behalf, and um, those children who are unaccompanied and experience homelessness. Assistance to families is the bread and butter of what we do, and we talk to families every day. We are all parents, legal guardians, family members of children with disabilities, youth, and young adults. We offer parents a safe place to call, to come into the office, or to video conference with us when they are needing help with uh, navigating special education systems that, or, or educational processes. As parents, we can lend an empathetic ear and provide parents and other decision makers with options and strategies. Um, we are not attorneys, so we don't interpret the law. We offer, we try to look at the child's current situation, look at different options and strategies for pulling a strong team around kids. Our focus is always on building teams. And to do that, we believe that parents and schools have to communicate and work together. And in that way, I'm kind of skipping some of my written that I'll let you read. But I will say that behavior um, is a huge issue. It's a, a call that we have very frequently, probably on a daily basis, from parents who are concerned about their students' behavior. In the last four years, we've taken over 2,000 phone calls regarding behavior. 121 of those were very specific to the, to the use of emergency safety interventions. And when we're working with parents, again, we're looking for good outcomes for kids. And we believe that good outcomes for kids means parents and schools are working together. And therefore, I think our biggest point is with the new propose, proposed regulations, we kind of clear up when parents need to be notified. And we also do support the um, clarifying that seclusion definition. So when Congress passed the IDEA, or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, they recognized that kids benefit from their parents being involved in their education. And we also know from a research from all children that when parents are involved, Good things happen for kids. And so when schools are communicating with parents about ESI use, it allows that parent to really understand what's my kids doing in a different environment that I'm not in, that I don't see. 
and it allows them to partner with their schools to address behaviors, whether that be through a general education intervention plan, multi-tiered systems of support, a Section 504 plan, or a current or impending needing um, it, the specialized design instruction that comes with an individualized education program. Every day, we work with parents on behavior intervention plans and recognize that strategies can be put in place, that this ever-changing document can change. And we want parents and schools communicating effectively to do that. We, uh, Families Together was part of the task force that recommended changes after the 2015 law was passed. And we did adopt and alter that statute in 2016. And certainly, communication with parents um, was a big part of that. We do believe in that, uh, clarifying that definition, talking about class techniques such as classroom clear, that that just be reported to the parent. Hey, your child had, we had to do a classroom clear today, um, and your child's, because of your child's behavior, allowing parents to access other supports, community supports, that sort of thing. I'll close, because I see I have 30 minutes, 30 seconds, minutes, 30 <laughs> seconds remaining. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. And Lori Kopp is our last speaker. Oh, and Lori is, I have written. I, we have I a, we've the got an attachment previously. as well. It was in your packet. Excellent, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lori Cope. I am the Assistant Executive Director of Legal Services at the Kansas Association of School Boards and have been a school attorney for 12 years. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you. I'm happy to answer any questions. One thing I would like uh, to emphasize is from the perspective of KASB is we advise uh, educators every single day uh, on best practices, uh, not only the law. And I would absolutely agree that communication between parents and educators and the school is vitally important. The question comes down to whether or not these changes to these regulations are the best way to achieve that. So it's not so much about the conclusion, it's not so much about we want increased communication between parents and the school. The question is whether or not these regulations are clear enough to ensure that they are being applied consistently, that educators who are in the classroom are knowingly um, able to interpret what is occurring when they're dealing with these types of situations. And that's where um, our concern comes up. You've heard from a number of individuals, you've heard from attorneys, you've heard from educators, and everybody has the same message, which is these are not clear. And I would go so far to say they're contradictory. When you have a regulation that says that emergency safety intervention should not be used unless a student is immediate danger to themselves or others, but we have a very broad definition of seclusion, it really puts educators in a difficult position of do I violate the regulation by using seclusion in a situation that by regulation I'm not allowed to, or do I allow a student to escalate or not use the de-escalation techniques that we know work, that we know work for those students. So again, this is not about not wanting communication between schools and parents. We are in favor of that. We want to be a partner in making sure that the language matches that desire. And we don't think that these regulations are the best way to do that. So we would ask, we're happy to come to the table, we're happy to propose language, but uh, we're just concerned that this is gonna create confusion. And when I'm having to provide guidance to educators, it's really difficult when I'm like, I don't know, if you read this part, it says this, and if you read this part, it says something else. That's very difficult to ensure that things are being consistently done. So those are our concerns. We're happy to answer any questions that the board might have at the appropriate time. And again, would refer you to uh, our written comment. Thank you. Thank you.
At this point, I will conclude the public hearing. Thank you all for your comments. Hearing is closed at 2, 11 p.m. Commissioner has asked me to remind the board that tomorrow we'll have time to discuss this, at which point we will then take action tomorrow. So this will be up for a vote tomorrow. Next up, working on the success of each student, individual plans of study. Welcome Natalie Clark. Chair Haas, members of the State Board of Education, Commissioner Watson, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss individual plan of study. I have been a member of the team that helped with the individual plan of study coming to the agency in 2016. I was an IPS coordinator for 18 months of that time from May 2020 until November 2021. At this time, coming back in this role, I am very pleased to say that I have been asked to lead the career and technical education team as well as the individual plan of study. So I would like to take this time to ask our deputy commissioner, Mr. Ben Proctor, to say a few words and then I would like to look at the definition that has been in place since the beginning of the board outcome individual plan of study and talk about the history of where we've been in this journey. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, thank you to the to the state board. Uh, I was thinking earlier, just listening to, to different presentations upstairs uh, about our vision and leading the world and success of each student and actually ran down the hall because I was visiting with our accreditation team about that very thing when they said, you need to get going here. Um, but when I think about that, that vision, I think about student opportunity and, and maximizing options and, and really um, accelerating the trajectory for kids. And we do so much of that work in our classrooms and schools have such a responsibility, I think, to our students and positioning them for success. And so we evaluate structures. What are the structures that we have in place that do that? And the individual plan of study has a lot of potential for that. And Natalie's gonna go through an overview of that particular structure. And you know, we've looked at a lot of data on individual plans of study because it's been six or seven years since that was introduced across the state. And we believe that now is a great time to take a fresh look at the IPS and implementation of that. But we feel like it's a, a potentially great mechanism where we see pockets of really good things. We have examples in school systems where they're doing things that are connected to an individual plan of study, but oftentimes it's not identified as such. So when you ask students, I'll just use my own daughter as an example, who's a sophomore at Heston High School, where we have done a lot of work around individual plans of study. And so I'm driving with her in a car to a basketball tournament, and I ask her, how's your IPS? And she looks at me and says, "I." I don't know, she looks at me confused all the time based on just our normal interactions, but said your individual plan of study. She still didn't know, and we've done scope and sequencing and, and uh, all this work over time. Our, our staff have, have done great things, and then we started talking about all the components, all the things that she's done that are a part of that plan, but it's not something that's necessarily identifiable. And we see that with a lot of the data that we collect around perceptions that students have now. And so we, again, feel like there's, there's great things happening in terms of, of exploration. There's great things that happen even at the elementary level where we start to, to help students identify who they are, what skills they have, what that can lead to, and how they're best positioned for success. But we do feel like now is a great time to have this conversation about how we make that mechanism stronger. So Natalie's going to just go through an overview of that. And then we want to spend as much time as you like answering questions or talking about the work moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. So this is the definition that has been on, a, on the fact sheet that is posted on the KSDE website. 
and I just wanted to go through the history. Our State Board of Education in Kansas stated by the year 2017-2018, every middle and high school student in Kansas will have an IPS in place. And so what does that mean exactly? An IPS is both the product the student develops, their individual plan, and the process that the school implements to guide students in developing that plan. I like to think of it as it's our responsibility as school districts in Kansas to provide these experiences, high quality, accurate information to students and families so that they can drive, that student will drive their individual plan. There are four minimum components of that and they are listed here. But I'd like to talk a little bit, I'm gonna go through each individual component that includes a series of strength finders. So the student must have experiences as early as pre-K to learn more about themselves and to learn about the world of work or what they might be interested in prior to taking these inventories and choosing what courses that they wish to take based upon their interest so that they can begin to develop their plan and house their journey within an electronic portfolio. All students beginning in middle school will develop an IPS. However, research shows how important it is at that pre-K elementary level to learn of work. So the school district's process of providing those career awareness experiences in elementary focus on building on those basic career awareness experiences so they're aware of the seven career fields. This is the model that was developed to show students in Kansas. It is the Kansas career field model, and it shows the different career fields represented. Schools that we have worked with have contacts at that elementary level to make sure that students are able to be aware by the time they leave elementary school of the different fields so that they are aware and they can determine what these different careers are all about. This is the Kansas Work-Based Learning Continuum. In 2019-2020, this was developed out of a collaborative work across agency. The top bullet, increasing individualization as students connect their interests, skills, and goals with career possibilities represents the individual plan of study. These experiences that we're talking about today across the continuum include career awareness at the earliest level. These are those elementary experiences that are recommended within the classroom, within small groups or field trips to make students aware. We talked about career awareness at the elementary school. Going on into middle school, how important it is that we provide experiences so that students can learn about work, so that they can explore what interests them. What are they learning in school that might interest them in regards to math, reading, science? So the school district's process of providing middle school career exploration experiences allows them to be aware of all the different career options in Kansas, in the United States, provide connections with local businesses, and explore the 16 career clusters. The 16 career clusters, Kansas has this model. If we look at the national model, you will see um, very representative. There are some differences. But if we look at the buildings, for example, if we look in business that is represented by the purple color, we see that in the career field of business, we have marketing, we have finance, we have business management and administration. So making sure that during that, those middle school experiences that they become aware of the career clusters that represent the occupations in Kansas. Career exploration is the second point on the work-based learning continuum. These experiences that are recommended at the elementary level include job shadows, mock interviews, field trips, and career mentoring. So as students begin to explore and develop their future plans, the school continues to develop that career 
development process. So it's a continuous process that doesn't stop, that we, it is our responsibility to provide that to students. I'm going to shift gears just a moment. President Esther George, the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City, just retired. This is due to a mandated retirement. The Federal Reserve has made it a mission to provide career talks with students about where they were when they first started in the case of, in case of President Esther George, and she finished as the president of the Federal Reserve. And she was asked, if you could share one piece of advice for our young people today, what would that be in regards to career development? And she said, lifelong learning. She said with STEM and with technology, it is so important to be aware of your interest, your skills, and those entry and exit points throughout life. So she did not start as the president, she worked her way up. So I think that's important. I shared that with our FCCLA members because when I think of President Esther George and I was fortunate to get, be on the Education Advisory Committee, she always wore a red jacket so that we would know who she was if we had questions and it reminded me of our young leaders in FCCLA and how important it is that our responsibility is to provide those experiences and the accurate information so that our students will have the career development management skills to be lifelong learners, now more than ever. A student's individual plan of study is developed cooperatively between the student, school staff members, and family members. And it is recommended that this is a cooperative session at least two times a year. So as a district, it's our responsibility to provide accurate information experiences and collaborate in this planning process that the student is leading. So going back to this definition, in bold, once students have had robust career awareness in elementary school, career exploration in middle school, and understand themselves, and their interests, at that point, they can begin to understand where their strengths are and how their career interests, if they take an inventory, help them decide what they're interested in in regards to career clusters. So that middle school career clusters um, representing occupations in Kansas, United States, or we'd like to say globally, then they're able to decide what courses they want to take based upon those interests. Then, with the support of the school, giving them these experiences, the student will begin to create their post-secondary plan. No matter what they choose to do, whether it's workforce, military, a certification program, or two or four year college, knowing that once they get deeper into this plan, they may certainly change their mind. And, and we hear stories all the time. Sometimes that's the best discovery of them all. My son went to the CAMS Academy. He was in the first class to go to Fort Hayes State University as a junior in high school. He completed the STEM program. He was a pastor for five years, and he currently is working for the state of Kansas um, for corrections. Um, he found that um, he enjoyed working with people, especially youth, and that um, he had experiences and he learned. I think the earlier we can start that, but sometimes as a junior in high school, if we don't get experiences to get to determine what we want to do, um, the sooner we can start pre-K, the better. High school, if we think about high school, we think of learning for work. So we've talked about career awareness in elementary, career exploration in middle school, and in high school, career preparation. So as a school district, it's, it's very important we provide these career preparation experiences so that they can deepen their knowledge for skills that are needed for employment and post-secondary opportunities. 
it is important that students have high quality work-based learning opportunities. We have opportunities for students to earn college credits in high school and opportunities for students to earn industry recognized credentials. As part of that process, it's very important that we provide information and resources for students and families to examine labor market information. We think of labor market information, we think of what are jobs that are de deemed high demand, high wage. The Department of Labor in Kansas each year provides us that information and they have sorted it by career cluster and career pathway. It's also important to provide information and resources for students and families to explore post-secondary education. We're looking at the wages that graduates receive when completing programs, the cost or the return on investment in taking that education required for the occupations they're interested in, how important it is to complete the FAFSA and be aware of financial aid. This is our Kansas career cluster pathway model. So in addition to the buildings that represent the career clusters, we add 36 pathways in the state to represent the different occupations. So the labor market information that the Department of Labor prepares for us each year to share with educators, families, and students is based upon this cluster pathway model. Kansas work-based continuum, the career preparation piece is recommended for the high school level. So the students have had the awareness and exploration early. They're ready for high quality work-based learning experiences that include internships, youth registered apprenticeships, simulated work-based experiences that could include a local bank within a high school, a school store, we have construction classes, building structures, tiny houses, entrepreneurship. Um, a couple summers ago, we had the Youth Entrepreneurship Competition State winners present their business plans. So mat no matter what their interests are, they have a high quality work-based learning experience to explore and prepare for their occupations that they're most interested in pursuing. And service learning. If it's student-led and if the student has a great passion, being able to prepare in that way. Along the bottom, we have career and technical student organizations. This is also a place for students in middle school and high school to participate in team competitions, individual competitions, present. FBLA has an electronic portfolio presentation competition. We have our agriculture pathways have SAEs, so those are experiences that require a portfolio. So there's many opportunities for students, whether it's an in-school or out-of-school opportunity to prepare. This is a sample of a poster that the Kansas Department of Labor recently published. They have these for all but one cluster, and it's to help show entry and exit points for occupations in Kansas that are considered high demand. So all of them on this poster are high demand. If they're deemed high wage, they're indicated by the gold star. So this just helps students to understand annual wages of the different occupations. And if they're interested in this particular area, know the different entry and exit points that they might want to include in their individual plan. Going back to the definition that we have had throughout this time, the, the fourth minimum component is a portable electronic portfolio. Why an electronic portfolio? The research shows us, we worked with the American Institute for Research, that a portfolio is a purposeful collection of student work across time. The work students are most proud of it demonstrates a student's learning progress, and it provides a, promotion, a platform for self-promotion and future employment. 
It promotes collaboration, reflection, and shifts the demonstration of learning to the student. I want to share with you the individual plan of study student summary. And I can, I'm about to the end of the PowerPoint and I wanted to show you some examples of work that has been done. This particular work was done at the request of the State Board of Education and the Board of Regents. I was asked to work with Tara Labar for a year and what we did was the Board of Regents, we came together with a work group that included three high school counselors, four post-secondary academic advisors, three post-secondary admissions reps, a service center CTE coordinator, Kansas Board of Regents staff, and KSDE Regent staff. They ask, what can you tell us about the individual plan of study? So we had a student present their electronic portfolio to them. And then we had a school district come in and present their process. So the district that presented to them shared at every grade level, what are the lessons? What are the things that we do each year to make sure that this student is provided with the experiences and the accurate information to build their unique um, post-secondary plan or their individual plan of study? At the end of our year together, one of the outcomes was the student summary form. And they said it would be very helpful to have an ex exportable document as part of the IPS portfolio that could be shared by the student to assist in post-secondary advisement opportunities, post-secondary admission information, scholarship applications, and freshman seminar courses. So they felt if a student could articulate or tell about their time throughout school where they built their individual plan of study, that would be very valuable. And they felt that this could be a tool that could be used in student-led parent-teacher conferences each year for a student to talk about what was important to them. So it includes, and I can show you the complete detail, tell us about your goals. What are your personal interests and the experiences that you've had? What are your successes and strengths? And what are your favorite courses, accomplishments, awards? Something else that they ask is, if you've had supports in high school, please tell us about that. Because if you had supports that helped you be successful, it's important that you have the self-efficacy to be able to continue those into post-secondary. So that was something that was really helpful to know. And this form can be accessed from the Individual Plan of Study Digital Reference Guide. So we were asked to put together all of the different, um, the different information that we had that would help districts with their process. This Individual Plan of Study Guide was published July 23rd 2021, and it includes a link to the IPS student summary tool that we just looked at. I want to talk about this particular resource also. We have an online um, partner, Higher Paths, that provides information to parents, students, and educators. This is an example of a poster. What's your skill? I'm talking about small engine repair. And we're encouraged, I asked for a student that I'd had in school to talk about, he, he took an entrepreneurship class from me. He had a business plan that was providing decals and for motorcycles. So he, he wanted to come back to the family farm and he wanted to have a side business of refurbishing motorcycles in the Stafford County area. He attended Hutchinson Community College, and he called me and he said, Mrs. Clark, do you still have my business plan? I said, yes, I do. So he utilized that in his farm and ranch management courses, and I'm proud to say he's come back to Stafford County. He farms on his um, family farm. He's featured in Higher Paths because he certainly is a success story. He runs a small business, and even prouder to say, 
during the annual Oktoberfest celebration in Stafford, he organized the car show on Main Street. So not only is he working on the family farm, running his business, he's giving back to the community in that way, and he's also a volunteer firefighter. So his success story, I encourage you all in your areas, because I think it's important for our students to look up to people and, and that have had success that would like to tell about their journey that might not be one that we, we think of. Uh, where we're at now in this process of individual plan of study, um, we have been working since I have started back at the agency in January, and prior to that, working with REL. And we ask if they would help us improve post-secondary readiness and the success of Kansas students by increasing implementation of and participation in evidence-based individual plan of study practices. So they have been supporting and helping us think of ways to implement evidence-based IPS practices. What we have planned, they have done some research in several districts and they have implementation recommendations related to academic and career goal setting and the electronic IPS portfolios. We also plan to look at an individual plan of study scope and sequence example. So research shows to have a very strong support for our students. It's important to have a strong scope and sequence at each grade level. And we also future talked about case stu studies of those schools who have exemplary scope and sequence and success and individual plan of study in place. So we're currently working with them. Um, we um, are currently looking at a draft scope and sequence. We had the February conference. We had a sold out conference in February for career and technical education and they flew in to listen to educators talk about IPS and what support did they need so that they could provide those experiences and accurate information to help students um, drive or lead their post-secondary plans. So if you have questions, I'm going to pop out of this and show you those two resources that I referenced on the desktop. So if you go to our ksde.org website, we have the Individual Plan of Study IPS student page. We have the Individual Plan of Study Digital Reference Guide that was posted. We're currently updating this. We made it a digital guide because we asked for others to contribute up-to-date resources. And you'll also see that down here at the bottom, we talked about the KSDE KBOR collaborative projects, and those are all down here where we met with those different entities. This is the Individual Plan of Study Digital Reference Guide. It's categorized by sections. So if we were going to look for, if we go to IPS framework, the IPS student summary form that was recommended from our collaboration is here. So we looked at the first page, but this is a digital fillable form that students can use and hopefully practice articulating their journey throughout the year so that they're ready to go into a job interview, a scholarship interview, or to help with post-secondary. So we talked about going through success strategies, their interests, making sure they can tell about what courses did I take, um, how did they align to my interests, and what college credits did I receive in high school, or perhaps AP scores for advanced placement. Work-based learning experience. They could summarize and tell about that. What experiences did they engage in? Employability skills. How have they demonstrated those in different experiences? And then something that we ask for them to do or information we provide based upon their interest is the Department of Labor forecasts what are the trends for this particular occupation. So the information that the Department of Labor gives us includes a short-term outlook, a long-term outlook, and real-time job postings. And each year they determine what is deemed high wage. So it allows the students to say, is there a positive trend in this forecasted industry that I'm interested in so that they have that 
accurate information to make those decisions. And then item number six, we ask students to reflect on so that they're able to tell about what assessments and certifications have I earned during high school. So again, this was the coordinating work group and it was recommended as a summary as part of the individual plan of study electronic portfolio to make sure that a student could tell about or articulate um, as a tool for helping them go forward. So if you have any questions at this time, I wanted to go through where we, where IPS started, where we're at today, and engaging REL in the process. We have done a survey. We, we have a survey open right now. We talked about in 2017, 2018 was when the state board said every student will have an individual plan of study. An IPS annual spring survey has been sent out starting in 2018, 2019 every year up to and including this year. That window is currently open and closes May 12th. So that allows us to get districts to report by building, middle school and high school buildings, their implementation level and areas of support needed. And what was shown on last year's survey that we shared with our IPS professional learning networks at those districts who needed support, it showed requested support in a scope and sequence and um, to have staff that was more availability of staff thinking about a district-wide IPS. I'm going to close by saying we have had individual plan of study professional learning networks in place. Part of those networks trying to build this, we had Dr. Scott Solberg come in and do a book study. He was also our keynote at a February conference. And in working with Dr. Solberg, he is a national expert in in, we call in Kansas the individual plan of study, but he was the researcher in the most recent condition of career readiness in the United States report. So he's been very helpful. One thing that he recommended to us when we talk about each student has an individual plan of study, he said perhaps you should think about each educator. So rather than perhaps a small group, making sure that it's a district-wide initiative, and that's something that really resonated with our participants in the IPS professional learning networks. We do have a few questions. Let's start with Betty. Um, thank you. And ideally and conceptually, it's good to be reminded of the, the purpose. However, when I had requested that this be an agenda item, my concern wasn't that there is not a lot of value in this. Certainly, um, with all of the preparation that's gone in it, and, and I've actually seen districts that have um, presented and have done so with fidelity, uh, and you can see the great success. My concern when I asked for this was as we all know, not all districts are utilizing this with fidelity. Uh, one of the things that I've heard from a number of students, um, we are given this test, there's no real explanation, not implementing this with fidelity. What kinds of things could we do to shore up IPS, to, uh, um, make sure that those students all over the state are getting the value added. Questions such as, um, and, and I have to admit, it, it did come up in a discussion. Questions uh, such as uh, giving students the option to participate or um, something where we don't have half of the state that's doing a great job, and the other half uh, feeling like, uh, and, and, and I shared this, because when this was implemented, I served on a local board. The feeling in the district that I served is, number one, 
we have another unfunded mandate. Number two, teachers and counselors are already overworked. You are adding to that level of work and you're not taking anything away. Now, is this valid or not? That's not where I was going with it. It is trying to understand how we can take a valuable tool, an asset, and have it implemented with fidelity across the state. Um, the districts that I'm concerned with probably could benefit more if this were strongly utilized, but the districts that I'm talking about are overworked. Uh, uh, maybe teachers, maybe counselors don't really have that buy-in. And so I had hoped that this would be more of a discussion opportunity. It's great to be reminded, and I do appreciate all of that, uh, but I am concerned about um, the implementation of the IPS. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think some of my questions were answered that I, um, today, <clears throat> but I do have a couple questions as far as, um, I like the form, I guess, at the end that you posted out there on KDS um, website, as far as if you were able to print that as a parent and work through that with your child, um, I think there's less pressure on that child, just from my own personal experience with navigating through some of these systems like Naviance and different things that can be very confusing, very intimidating. Um, having a child just say, well, I guess I'll just put engineering down or whatever, um, because they're just, they want to put something down um, because they're, they're, stressed, they're stressed about it or anxious about it. Um, so I guess a, a couple of my questions were as, um, how is, if, if they were to do it on a portfolio electronically rather than just put a, fill out a form that would not be held against them or anything, um, how is the information on each, child I, I, each child's IPS obtained? As far as like, where's that information going? Who's using that? Who's using that data or those data points? Are, are analytics being used against those, uh, that information that they're putting down? Um, since it's twice a year, is that something that, I, I guess I'm just, in our district, we have the ability to opt out, and 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 I did opt that out for my son because we're already doing our own our own things as parents. We did that with our other son, so um, I like the idea of a form and being able to work with my child on that. And then uh, any any other questions, go through the through the school because they do. I feel like they do a good job. Teachers in our district do a good job, and the counselors um, are, are pretty good at following through on things and questions that the students have. Starting it. In middle school makes me a little apprehensive. I'm a little nervous about that. Mm -hmm. um, just, just saying. Um, and and, I, and I, there's other, there's a lot of other reasons for that. But being on a portfolio and being, you know, with analytics and what's where's that data going and what information because it feels like it, it can get out there and, and get maybe into the wrong hands or um, stress just put more stress on a child. If if I may, I want to follow up with a question that's related there because. I, I take the digital portfolio as it's a resume, right? Yes, that would certainly be one of the components. And I'm going to use an example, and it could be anything. So FBLA has an electronic career portfolio. So they include their resume. They, you know, it's a it's a tool for them to gather what they've done throughout their journey, and then when they become ready to graduate, that they fine tune it with what will help them go forward, whether that is a scholarship, whether that is an interview, or whether that is post-secondary, which they said. So if they have those artifacts in there that they've reflected on, they're able to talk about them or tie them back. In rural Kansas, Stafford County, 4-H is supported. I grew up, my children did, and the way they have done their projects has changed since I was in school. My daughter um, was in the electric project. Um, she started as a clover bud, which is before kindergarten. And she tried a lot of different projects, but um, she made her way through a junior leader because they encouraged participation. So she learned what she did and didn't like. 
Every year she had to record what she did, which was very valuable. Students can choose in 4-H whether or not to record that information. But she was fortunate in high school to be the state award winner in electric and electricity. So her portfolio included a record book from pre-K to high school. It included the, all the different projects that she'd taken, pictures of what she'd done throughout the years, and then the new piece was a video. So she had to be able to tell about her journey, why this was an important project for her, and then she had to answer specific questions regarding that, that. So it was really helpful for her to be able to reflect on her journey, what she had done, and present it in such a way. So she had the pre-K through high school notebook, she had the pictures with descriptions, and she had the jump drive with her resume video and answering the questions. She got to go along to the national level, but she chose not to because her passion was music and she wanted to go to the state music festival. So I think that that lifelong learning skill of career management has served her well as far as goal setting. But I don't know if that helps answer your question about how a portfolio and those artifacts could help students reflect. Well, one of the things our district, we have, they have them write, they, write, they do more in writing. And they, it's a time capsule. They write things in a time capsule and they turn that in and then they don't get to see it till the end of the semester. And they have goals in there and it's all written and it comes back to them with all these, it, it's, it's kind of like the child saying, here, these were my goals, did I obtain them? But they, it was, it was uh, I guess they had personal things that they put in there. I mean, it was like an envelope and it was sealed shut. And, and then it came back to that child, back to the family. The family looks, I mean, I got to look over all that, all those things. And with my child, I feel like it, it wasn't captured out on any kind of a, you know, a website or a, in a, in a, in, a, in, in here, it was, it was, it was written, they had to write. They had to actually write and um, reflect and set goals. And that's what you would do on there. But I feel like they're, they're constantly doing that anyway in their classrooms and, and writing those things down. They're constantly asking, you know, kids to write their goals down. They do it at the beginning of the year. And then we go in there like a month later when we meet all the teachers and go around. They give those to us and we get to go over that. So there's different districts are doing things differently. So they are kind of doing IPSs already in, in their own local way um, rather than it being, you know, mandated in a certain way across the state. So I guess if they are, I guess if I say I'm opting out, I'm not really, but I'm opting out of something that's being done and pre-programmed or whatever for, for my child. And it's not, it's, it's more statewide driven rather than locally driven. And, I, and I'm, I'm assuming that that would be okay for that district to do that, right? So I think that the IPS looks different no matter where you are. Um, whether it is paper and it's scanned and uploaded to a digital portfolio, whether you have something at home that has that collection, whether it is a protected site that has that electronic. But I hope, I, I know students go back and utilize that. One way that I thought really helped me, sometimes it's important for whoever that student is talking to, to have that ability to articulate where they have excelled and what they're really passionate about. It sounds like you have a really strong structure in place um, but the hope is for all students to have that support so that we can highlight them and the strong experiences and successes so each student has the opportunity to do that. I don't know if that helps answer that. It, it's so individualized, it just, it, it's different for each student and what that might look like. Natalie, I just want to highlight something that you said, which was your daughter's is on a thumb drive, yes. which means that she owns it. It's not on the internet, it's just there and she can plug it into her computer when she needs it. I don't know if that helps Michelle, but that was the, the piece that I took away al alongside the analog book. Um, Jim McNeese. Uh, <laughs> some of the conversations we have. Um, first of all, uh, this is great. 
thanks for catching up. We started this in the 80s. In fact, we started it in the 70s, okay? Um, schools, many schools were not doing it. Uh, you're talking about guidance centers that, that have changed considerably since uh, many of us went to school. You know, uh, we're asking people to do more uh, with less. You know, and, uh, but that's, that's been a theme since before I got here. <laughs> this might be one of the most important things we do. And I'll just tell you right now, I never saw it for the quote, high achievers. They get plenty of attention. They get plenty of uh, opportunity. I, I, I'm not saying they don't squander it, but they get plenty of it. I always saw this as a, as a principal and a teacher as reaching out to those kids that are not getting the services and then maybe not getting the services because we're bad. No, they're just avoiding them, <laughs> you know. Um, this, is, this isn't for your kids. They got mom and dad at home, they've got supports. You know, this is for the kids that don't have those supports. You know, and we can't, don't overlook that. Try not to put it in your frame of reference of how you live, but in the frame of reference and the life experiences that those that are having the most difficulty in our schools, you know, need our support here. This might be the first time anybody has ever talked to a student in the family, outside the family, or about careers, or jobs, or, you know, your grades mean something, you know. It just, um, that's so, it's so neat. And to have portfolios maintained over years. <coughs> you know, when, when you before we had electronics, you collected the, their, their, their portfolio files. They'd be like this high when they left for some of them. Some of them be this big, <laughs> you know. But <coughs> something we've left out is how appropriate that, that is to be applied later on. Some of these kids actually went on to college and used those portfolios. In fact, today, a lot of them go out and they get course credit and grades for them, you know. Plus, students could go to job applications and say, well, what, what are you most proud of in your interview? What do you like? You know, I, well, I did this project in school. Here's my portfolio. This is used so many different ways. And um, I just applaud the guidance counselors, the teachers, especially in those, those ones that are, are really giving support and direction to kids, because they're, they're doing even more work with this. This is, a, this is great. This might be the most important thing we do. It's better than an A in English 4. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really good. Um, yeah, I still have kids that come back and tell me that they've gotten jobs, they've gotten scholarships, they've gotten credit in school and college, you know, for the portfolio that they developed while they were in high school. And they never imagined that, you know. And when they come back and talk to kids in school and tell them that, all of a sudden it takes on a new dimension and really becomes great but it is the hardest thing you will do in a school is to develop a portfolio system that is really authentic and really of value. You know, a lot of them have them, well, we collect them, but they don't, eh, you know. Do it right. It's a service we provide for the students that, that celebrates and recognizes and uh, validates the learning that they have. So the more we can do to get people to do this, the better the students will be served in our community and for their futures. Thank you. Danny. Let's see if I can get the, am I getting this right? So what about the kid that has a broken home? So we're doing an individual plan of study with that kid and we're pushing that kid to be an electrician. And that kid goes along with it because he doesn't have any guidance from either parent, not getting much help. And so, so that particular person goes along with the individual plan of study, graduates from high school, and really doesn't want to be an electrician. And so they just go to work being a laborer and a really good worker. They do a great job and they don't, have, they don't want to be an electrician but then maybe they decide to apply for something else. And because they were a good worker at that labor job, they got a job. And now maybe they're making more money 
than both their parents that are not together. To, he's making more money than they are. And then all of a sudden, that particular kid that didn't want to be an electrician but was pushed into having an individual plan of study is now the number one performer in a business and makes six-figure income. I think that that is a lot to think about. If we think about those transferable skills and the employability skills that are demonstrated through experiences, electricity is something I think a lot of. I mean, we hope that students have experiences early and that they're able to determine what they like and what they don't like. Um, if they have a broken home, we hope that the school provides experiences and information to help them make decisions or a mentor. Um, my husband was an electrical leader for more than 10 years, so we had lots of students come to learn about electricity. And we had many speak up and say it was a great, a great transferable skill, but perhaps it wasn't their passion, but it, it was a skill that they could transfer. So I think it's very insightful what you're, you're saying as far as you know, we're all different. We hope that each student the ideal is for them to develop their own plan, and it's our responsibility to provide them the experiences so that they can self-explore. I don't know if that helps answer, but thank you for your comment. Pam. Thank you. I don't know if that kid exists. I'd like to meet him because that's not what schools do. They don't push kids. The idea behind the assessment in middle school is to help you identify what you like. So, and what we heard all the CTSO officers in here say was the individual plan of study that I developed, I changed, you know, and that's not unusual. It's, it's not to lock you into something, but to open doors to explore. I don't know if you go back to the slide where you had the 36 pathways. I just wanted to bring that up because I serve, a, my one of my committee assignments is the Kansas Advisory Committee on Career and Tech Ed. And that's where this board interfaces with the business community to help develop the career paths, the 36 career paths that we have. And it's really important work because um, those business partners know what the high wage, high demand jobs are and how they're changing. For example, this month, we had a really, really great meeting down in Wichita. And we had a meeting with an architecture firm that really, I like, okay, what I thought an architect did is just, I had no idea what they do now. They don't carry around clipboards, they all have an iPad and it's all, you know, it was just amazing what they do. And we were trying to respond to some of the new industries that are coming to town with the automated uh, manufacturing, like, um, oh, who's the one? Integra, Integra Panasonic, and, um, Panasonic, Garmin yeah. Has so Wichita has started up at their Future Ready uh, facility automated manufacturing, HVAC, hydraulics, you know, to try to help these kids, just give them an idea, you know, what the possibilities might be where they could get a great paying job. But all these little words that you can't read because it's too small, those are all career paths, and those have were help identified by business people in Kansas as really be high demand. And the idea was that from these business partners is if we can get kids in Kansas into a high demand, high wage job, they will stay here. So their goal too was to grow the state, to grow the economy and to help our kids be successful. So, I mean, it's really great uh, work that this team does and it's really um, helpful every couple months to go in and hear from the business community how things are changing out there and different ways that they would like to help our kids be successful. But the individual plan of study is key to all that. If the kid has no idea what they like, then, um, then they you know, don't know what they want to explore. And it, and it is locally driven. I mean, you'll find everything from at Emporia where they have the kids all broken up into small groups of 12 to 14 assigned to one teacher the entire four years they're in school and they spend a couple mornings a week with that teacher, and uh, they take charge of, of where they're going and, and work on their career plans, and uh, 
So anyway, it's very exciting work that they're doing, and other districts, the counselors do it. So, you know, and they but they can totally choose whatever program they want or um, application to help the kids uh, identify their their uh, what they like. So anyway, thank you for the update, Natalie. It's really helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, so we've come back around to round two. I've got a couple of board members who have already spoken, and I want to get a word in before they do because we're going to run up against time at about 3.15. But I had really hoped that this would be a conversation that tied back to previous conversations with the graduation task force. Um, it was during that time as we were looking at what what would it look like to revamp graduation requirements that IPS really came up and the conversation around not every district is doing it with high fidelity. And when I think about the districts that I know of that are not doing it as well as some of those that we've seen come and present, those are some very large districts. And that means that there are a lot more students that are being impacted by the lack of implementation. You, you went through a bunch of slides that have a bunch of requirements and I can point and say, I know that some districts are using this particular tool. Michelle mentioned Naviance, as we've heard Zello. There are a handful of quick surveys that you'll go and fill out and you'll get a, a skills, a, a recommendation of jobs that match your, your skills and your interests. And the next step then is where that fidelity really needs to come in. And so as a parent, and I mean, I've got a high schooler right now, this is something, you know, as we talked through graduation requirements, we talked about how do we up the fidelity. So I'm curious where this conversation goes next and how we put some teeth in what we saw in your slides. So the research and discussion, um, the use of online career information systems must be balanced with lessons, small group discussion, and career development experiences. Um, when we go to the process at the high school level, um, career and technical student organizations are an A-plus model of this. They get to compete in job interview, resume. Um, they've had the opportunity. But if we, if we look at, and I'm going to go, career readiness indicators. If we look at the high school career preparation and we think about the high-quality work-based learning continuum, if students have awareness and exploration and they get to high school, then they have deep knowledge and skills for what careers are available. So thinking about the graduation requirements that are recommended and those post-secondary assets include high-quality work-based learning, include college credits while in high school and industry-recognized credentials. So our guidance in regards to Perkins for high quality pathways include those three high quality items which are high quality work based learning experiences, college credits, and industry recognized credentials for at least one for each student. I know those are some of the post-secondary assets that are recommended and that is a great goal of students accomplish those career readiness indicators in high school. Research shows their post-secondary success is certainly increased. The likelihood will be certainly increased if they meet just one of those three. So if you don't mind, Madam Chair, I, uh, the question about what do we do next, I, I think it's a good question about how we want to move any priorities forward. So in June, you're going to hear uh, from me and a team that we've been uh, working on, we, we call it School Improvement Work Group, and it's the identification of, of certain priorities that we feel like are most high leverage and most important. I would put this into that category as a support structure for positioning students for opportunity and options. Uh, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to position students where they have every opportunity available to them to be successful. And certainly if somebody is, is pushing a student into a particular direction, the, the IPS isn't being implemented the way we would envision it. Um, but I think it's a good question about how we do our work. So what we're committed to doing on Natalie's team is to um, kind of, again, I, I used the phrase early on, just take a fresh look at this particular structure. We know it's existed for a long time. I think we have to decide that it is a priority. Mr. McNeese's point, I think, was uh, really important and, and a, a point that we need to uh, associate with the work, and that is 
are we equipping those students who maybe have some disadvantages with everything they need to be most informed about the decisions that they make in the post-secondary, what they need to do along the way? That is so critical. And so this is a mechanism for that. We feel like if the state board is telling us that we need to renew our dedication to providing this really important structure for kids, we're prepared to do that internally. And I think we've got a lot of external partners that can be a part of that as well. So I think we're ready to do consistent engagements with our staff here at KSD to say, how do we do this? How do we do it right? Because every kid deserves to, to have that mechanism to, to put them in the best position to be successful. So I think we're ready for that. It sounds like that's what we're hearing. Uh, sometimes things exist for a while and you just have to go back and say, you know, let's, let's reevaluate how we do it and we can provide the board with updates along the way as well, so. Thank you. Um, we'll do a couple of quick follow-ups and, and if we're really quick, we might get a break. Betty? Okay, okay. I will make this quick because what I want to point out, and it's not for you to, to feel like you have to defend because that's not, that's not my purpose uh, to negate or have any of this explained. You either have a panoramic view, and sometimes with that panoramic view, everything looks like it's functioning. Or you can have a view where you're actually in the trenches. That's where you identify the real problems. And to, to go to what um, uh, Danny was saying, a kid who doesn't have the structure, what I will tell you, I've talked to some parents, they said, well, it said my kid should be a bartender. It said my kid should be a receptionist. Now, the point is, whether it said that or not is irrelevant. If that perception is there, then we have a problem. So in the trenches, we have a problem, okay? There is a certain perception, students, parents, uh, uh, Teachers, counselors, there's a problem. So what, to kind of tie in with what everybody is saying, is how do we remedy that? How do we present it in such a way that if we really stand behind all students, each student, every student, then we gotta stand behind and understand there's some that are not getting it. And so it's those that, that I'm trying to speak up for. I hope that was quick enough, I'm done. <laughs> and Danny. So you're, you're, you're saying that school districts aren't pressuring kids to do an I, IPS. I'm saying that they are pressuring the kids and a lot of kids don't, they just go along because they don't want to feel the pressure from the administration or the teacher, nothing against anybody, but kids feel that pressure to go a certain way. That's all I have to say. probably have lived this as long as anyone in terms of professionally because um, I tried to put a process in place as superintendent to, to do this work and the key to this is a conversation between a student a parent and maybe the school or maybe not but it's a conversation um, and I got to have one with some, someone's daughter um, and get to have some with some kids here in Topeka that fortunate enough to get to still work with. Um, and Danny, you're right. It's never to tell a kid what they should do. It's try to find out what are you interested in? What are you passionate about? And if you don't know, we had a student cross the stage on Sunday. I had no idea, and that's fine. It's fine. It really is. But what you're telling us, and Betty is too, is we've got places that are not doing this well. I mean, we got all these at-risk kids like Leavenworth, 70 plus percent of at-risk kids. So probably, probably that's from a dysfunctional family. It may not even have family. And so I think we got to look at it differently for those kids because uh -huh. a lot of them are just going along. Uh, I, I'm also working with some kids right now that, that I don't want to say they are dysfunctional families, but their families 
that don't have the resources to know what to do. And so just trying to help those, those kids, what's a FAFSA? Oh, you mean you stay in a dorm if you go to college? Uh, these are just questions that they have because they don't know. Um, but if you have a conversation with a young person about what they're interested in, they tell you they don't like science and math, I can tell you they're probably not going to be an engineer or a doctor because it takes a lot. We have a lot of work to do. You know, I, I hear from all of you that say uh, we could do better in this area. You know, um, we had a young man here earlier that you had lunch with that said I had a gifted IEP and I got to do X. There's no reason that a non-gifted student should get the same opportunity. No, no reason, right? But sometimes we, we, we package it in such a way. So it's, it's you know, we have some, some students, again, students today, 60 college credit hours. I hear from some parents, the school won't let my, t my kid do dual credit. How can that be? Someone has 60 college credit. And so, so we just ha we have work to do in this area around messaging, around what is what is available and what can be done. So, uh, Madam Chair, I would say this. There's a possibility of terrific storms that are very close to us in Manhattan and, and hail. Now, we're about maybe an hour away from that. Uh, I'm trying to give you the best weather forecast as if I'm meteorologist, so take this uh, we are we are releasing our staff to go at 3:30 because some of them travel a long distance. We have worked it out. If you want to move your car to the parking garage right here, you're parked right here. We will validate your parking. It won't cost you anything, and your car would be out of the way should it should it. <laughs> should, <laughs> so a hailstorm. So I just put that out. If, if the chair does decide to give you a break, you're welcome to do that, and we would validate We would validate any staff that have to stay, too, if they go to the parking garage. So that's, I've been monitoring it for the, for the chair. To help. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. So we do have, at, at 3.15 on our agenda, we're already behind. We have McLeod High School is here with an FFA presentation. So how about we break until 3.30? Is anybody going to move your car? Okay, I see some hands. So let's break until 3.30. Oh, McLeod, I apologize. Wherever you guys are, we'll, we'll try to hurry back, and then we'll get started at 3.30 with them. Thank you.
to 13, then 14, then 16, <laughs> pending weather. Bingo. Bingo, indeed. Um, next, I would like to welcome Ann Ma to introduce McLeod. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm really thrilled today to have uh, folks here from McLeod High School and from Ham Foundation to make a presentation on programs they're doing there. Uh, Nicole Henriksen is a teacher at uh, McLeod, and she, uh, just to give you a little background on her, um, she has a bachelor's in animal science and a master's in agricultural education uh, from K-State. But I saw Nicole and some of her students and met Jeff at the Ham Foundation dinner um, this spring and I was very impressed with what they were doing there. And I thought, this is the kind of thing the board needs to see, these public-private partnerships in action and how we're giving kids a chance to um, learn some job skills before they get out of high school but also get exposed to some really great careers should they choose to do it. And hey, they may choose never to weld another thing after high school, we don't know. But for right now, they're really doing some really cool things there. Um, I will also say that um, last year, the Ag Ed program at McLeod was named the Outstanding Secondary Program of the Year by the Kansas Association of Ag Educators. And this year, Nicole was named the Young Teacher of the Year by KAAE. So I'm going to let Nicole uh, get us started and introduce her group. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, honestly, if you would have told me even 11 years ago before I took the job at McLeod uh, in 2023, you're going to be talking about shop classes in front of the State Board of Education, I would have said never. But here I've learned to never say never because with an undergrad in animal science, that was my passion. I was only going to teach animal science classes. And when I took the job at McLeod, I was told, oh no, you need to teach shop classes as well. And I'm so glad I took that opportunity because honestly, um, shop classes are my favorite class to teach. So thank you for having us here. And also I have learned in my 10 years, I think my position is a teacher. And I have been to some of my um, district board meetings and I know sitting in your positions is not for me. I know that's a tough job and so I just wanna thank you for being in that position so that I can do my job. Um, I have brought with me two, um, two students, Kennedy Coffin and McKay Daniels. And so they're gonna have an opportunity to speak um, at the end here, but... First, I just want to tell you a little bit about the background of my school. So I was hired in 2013, and there's a picture of young me. Um, I was told I look like a baby by a student uh, when I showed them the PowerPoint that I prepared. But in 2013, our board looked at our shop after our woods teacher retired, and they realized that the demand was not in woods in terms of industry anymore. It was metals. And so they hired me with a task to start an ag program, an FFA program, um, but also focus on building a metal shop. So that is what I have been working on for the past 10 years. I teach two pathways, um, the animal science pathway as well as the ag power pathway. And so you can see those classes that I have that all fall into the ag power pathway. Exploratory ag is for eighth graders. We do both woodworking and welding. Agri-science is for freshmen. I spend a quarter welding with them. And then I have three year-long classes that focus on the trades, welding one, welding two, and ag mechanics. And in this picture, just kind of shows the demand for skilled trades, at least in my school. And from talking to other teachers though, I know that these numbers are not different from other programs as well. Kids are yearning for these hands-on classes. So if you look at the welding class, the number in parentheses is the number of spots that I can have each year. So you see that I can teach 20 kids welding. Um, this year I had 32 students request to be in that class. Looking forward to next year, we have 36. So that means that 16 of those kids are going to have to wait or potentially not um, have an opportunity to be in that class. Ag mechanics, I can only take 10, and I teach this every other year. So in 20 in 21, I had 16 requests, and then this year I had 23 requests. And we actually bent it. I taught 11 students instead of the 10, um, just to try to get one more person that experience. And in my agri-science class, um, 
26 and 18, but I can only take 22. So uh, my classes are full to the max and I have a waiting list always, which I think is awesome and it just speaks about what kids are wanting to learn about in school. And so with that information then, let me kind of tell you quickly my teaching philosophy. And I think you need to know my teaching philosophy um, in order to be able to understand kind of what we're going to share with you next and how I model my classroom. So the first thing, in my teaching philosophy is I want my students to know that they're respected. My big thing is that these high schoolers potentially in three months are going to go into the workforce. And so treating them like a student, yes, to some degree, but also recognizing that they're soon going to be adults and treating them like that, um, they appreciate, but then also I think it helps them respect me more because we're on a different level. Instead of a student to teacher, it's more of a boss to employee type relationship. And that works well for us. Obviously being a shop class, safety is important, not only physical safety, but also I want students to know um, that mistakes are gonna happen. Welding tips get stuck, grinders get broken. Um, just literally right before I left, we had a ground clamp come off um, the cord, things happen. And so um, safety is important, but they have that respect to come to me and know that they can just share that information with me. Thirdly, I want my students to know the why, and I want them to know the why so much. A couple years ago, I had a student that said, I don't even know why we're doing this, and he said it in a way that the class kind of was like, she's gonna get us in trouble, because it, was, it came across as disrespectful, but I stopped, and I thought to myself, and I said, you know what, Eli? That is a great point. If you don't know the why, I'm not doing something right. And I hope that you will always ask the why, maybe in a different tone, but let me tell you the why. Okay, so I want my students to know the why. The fourth, my teaching philosophy is to model the real world. And that's what we're gonna focus on most, how I have created a shop environment that helps students be successful right after graduation if they choose not to go to a post-secondary education. And then lastly, I think it's important that I realize that I bring my best every day. That is a goal of mine. It doesn't matter if it's the first week of school or six days left of school. Every day I wanna bring my best for my students. Um, and so in these pictures, on the left, you can see that there is a, um, adults on one side and students on the right side. Going back to modeling the real world, some of my students never get the opportunity to go through an interview before they graduate high school. And I changed that because I think it is important that if they find a dream job, in order to nail that dream job, you have to have practice through an interview process. So all of my welding students go through an interview. They have to go through an interview to get into their job as a welder out in the shop. And then also we have all of our juniors and seniors um, go through interviews as well that I set up. Um, and then the real world, you can see in that bottom picture, my kids um, were responsible for putting up some signage for our school. So we did the, you know, call 811, the dig before you um, dig, and um, then they had to go through the process of the concrete um, and setting up that sign. So real world. What's important to me? I have four pictures that go along, I think, with four things that are important to me. So the first one is I want my students to take pride in their work. And how many times do I hear in their common core classes, it's, it's not relevant to them, and so therefore their effort is probably less than they should be giving. But if they know that they're taking something home or if it's going out into the community, they're gonna care a whole lot more. Um, and you can see, I think, the pride on that student's face with the um, Chevy bench. Um, she made that last year for her personal project. So they get to make personal projects. But then the second thing is, I think it's important to give back. We don't have enough students. When you talk about their senior year of high school and you're going through their IPS and you're saying, okay, what community service can we put on here? Some of them are like, I didn't do anything. Not if you're in my class. Um, you're gonna be able to give back and say that you gave back in some capacity. So all of those creations that we made, the cactus, the sunflower, the butterfly, all of those things were given to my shop for free. Um, I have connections with farriers. And so if they don't have something to do, then we create projects. We donate them to PTO Bingo. We donate them to our alumni silent auction, the FFA silent auction, et cetera. So they have an opportunity to take pride in their work and give back. Third, it's so important that they get out of the classroom. Relationship to, relationships are formed then, um, but also just opportunities. So in that bottom picture, you can see my students had the opportunity to um, go to HAM Foundation, or HAM actually organized a career industry tour for several um, districts, and my students were selected to attend as well. So in that picture, they're operating a drone, um, and they're seeing how that 
is incorporated into industry. I try to get my students out of the classroom as often as I can. A couple years ago I went and I asked to take them and my superintendent said, yes, you could go, but I don't have a way for you to get there because you know we are short bus drivers and I don't take no well for an answer. Um, and so I was very professional, but I thought about it and I said, how can I get my students out? And so I went back to him and I said, if I get my CDL, can I take my students? And he said, if you get your CDL, I will pay for you to take your students out of the classroom. So now I have my CDL and we try to travel um, as often as possible. However, there's expectations with that as well. They have to have passing grades. If you're on the DNF list, then you're not traveling with me. Um, so I try to take my students out as much as possible, but then I also bring people in as well. In every class, I bring industry leaders in. And I I think that is important for them to see not just a teacher talking about concepts, but industry people as well. And so in that bottom picture, Free State Electric came to talk about my ag mechanics um, class about uh, electricity safety after we finished our electricity unit. So now that you kind of understand um, my philosophy, I want to show you a quick tour of my shop. And you're going to see then um, my welding shop has had a lot of improvements. Jeff Hamm is going to talk about some of the ways that he has impacted specifically my school. Um, so you'll be able to see that in the video. But this is um, my students presenting to you about how we model the workplace in the shop. So it's a three minute video. And we'll just take the time to do that. Um, and feel free to take notes so you can ask me Hello, questions about it later. Jackson, and I am the shop teacher at McCall High School. When I was hired 10 years ago, the shop was being converted from a wood shop to a metal shop. So there were some components of the shop that I had to create quickly to make it suitable for a welding shop, as well as some items in the shop that were left for me to use from when the shop was first built in the 1960s. So our shop was in dire need of some changes. Last spring, we were a recipient of the Ham Foundation Grant, and that made a huge difference in our shop in terms of both functionality and appearance. We have prepared a video to walk you through an hour of welding so you can see what our shop students do, but also you can see hopefully that when a student signs up to be in a welding class, they're not just learning about welding, but they're also learning soft skills that are going to make them more employable in any career fields that they enter into. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a junior in welding one. This is our welding time machine. We have to clock in and out just like we would for a job to show how many minutes each day we are working in the shop. We get a grade for the time in the shop just like we would get a paycheck in the real world, based off how many minutes and hours we log in each week. Hello, my name is John Hollick. I'm a sophomore at McLeod High School. This is my first year, to, first year in welding. In semester one, we work off of a skill chart, which is right here. It is an independent progression, and before we can move on to the next, the next skill, we must pass with a 90%. This allows us to be very independent in the shop because we know what is expected of us daily, and we can set on our own completion goals. When we have a weld that we think is passable, we show Miss H, and she either grades it, mostly gives us 97s, and gives us good feedback. Our skills include stick and MIG and 1F, 2F, and 3F. Second semester is personal projects. I'm looking forward to building a spear, a bell spear. Hi, my name is Ella Gant, and I'd like to share with you the concept of personal days in my welding class. When I graduate in May and get a full-time job, I will be given personal days to use at my own discretion to help students understand how to make wise decisions about this concept. We are given personal days in the shop. Each semester, we get five days to use whenever we are absent so we don't have to come in after school to make time up in the shop. But we can use them if we are here. Possible scenarios for this would be if we are injured, need study for an upcoming test, or if we don't want to change into PPE for the day. I like this freedom. It gives the students more of a voice and choice to help welding students work for them as well as teach us lessons for the future. Good evening, my name is Henry. I'm a senior and I have taken the Anna shop class from Ms. Sage since I was in eighth grade. Shop cleanup is important here to develop leadership skills. We have a four-minute schedule. Each week a new person is assigned foreman. It is their responsibility to assign tasks such as sweeping, tool and dustpan jobs to each student. They watch the clock and announce cleanup at the correct time and then have to sign off on all students' cleanup work before they can leave the shop. Thank you. 
So you can see um, that those are just some of the ways that I try to really, in, oh, excuse me, how do I get my PowerPoint back? Uh -oh. There we go. Um, those are some ways that I really try to work the workforce in for our students, so that way when they graduate, they know exactly what can be expected of them um, to hopefully either boost employment for opportunities for them or keep them employed in their current position. At this point in time then, um, I'm going to let Kennedy Coffin talk about a new thing that we did for community welding class. And the reason I loved this so much is because I had students come in and instead of being students, they were teachers. And they weren't teaching their peers, but they were teaching adults. Um, so that communication that they gained from that um, and the community service that that can get counted, I think is invaluable. So Kennedy, if you will come and share. Hi, I'm Kennedy Coffin. I'm a senior, so I'm graduating in just a few days, but I've got to be in Miss H's class all four years of high school and really enjoyed it. But my senior year was actually the first year that I got to be in a welding class because it took, I was on the waiting list every single year and senior year was the only year I got to be in it. So I was also taking another ag class called Agriculture Communications. And in this, we do a lot of things for the school, for the chapter, for the FFA chapter, and then our community. So we all pick a community service project, and I decided to do Community Welding Day since I was also in welding. So around the fall or winter of this last year, we started planning this thing just like an idea because we'd had a few community members ask us like, hey, this would be really cool. We're like, yeah. So then around January, we sent out a form that people could fill out in our community saying like, hey, here's the thing we're doing completely free of charge. You can just come in and we'll have a class. Within the first week, it was completely filled up and it was really great. So then in February is when we did it. We had a night and we spent the first hour or so with Miss H teaching, like just getting the basics, getting the ideas, the safety things, so then we could get into the shop. And then we split, split into five groups with all students leading with two to three adults each. They had the opportunity to learn arc welding, MIG welding, and TIG welding. And so we split into these groups and just kind of taught the main skills, just like, here's how you hold your hands, here's how you do this, just all the little things. And so by the end of it, they all got the opportunity to make a final project to kind of end with being like, look what I completed. So we got them a horseshoe hook and they had a horseshoe and then they just welded it, kind of like that. And so I thought it was a really great process and it really helped out. And we did a survey at the end, just to kind of be like, how did you guys think of this? Should we do it more? And we got five stars out of five stars on everything. They, they were like, awesome teaching by Miss H, and we loved the hands-on, and I think it was really loved by our community. And then lastly, before um, I turn it over to Mr. Ham, and then we open it up for questions and comments, I'm going to um, ask McKay to come to the podium because he's going to be speaking about two classes that he has the opportunity to be in. Hello, everyone. My name is McKay Daniels. Uh, I'm part of two ag classes, like Ms. H said. Uh, I'm in Ag Welding 1 and Ag Mechanics. These two classes are very hands-on, which make it very easy for me to pay attention and just, I don't know, keep focused. In my core classes, <laughs> not so much. It's a lot harder for me to sit still. Uh, some, some of the ADD gets to me a little bit. But uh, I don't know. When we get going in our Ag Welding class and our Ag Mechanics classes, it's just so simple to just sit there and learn because we sit there we learn everything by just doing it and I think that's the easiest way to learn for me personally and I feel like it's the same way for a lot of people as well especially at our school um, when we get going in our classes like welding we go we put our PPE on and which we get ready get all our safety gear and everything and when we get to welding and stuff we just I don't know, we learn and do our, all of our own things and we go at our own pace, which I think is really helpful for everyone. And instead of Miss H being like, so on top of us and like teaching, like obviously she teaches us, but instead of her being like right there, it's, she's more of like an employer type person. So you get that relationship where it's not so like, bo like not bossy from like a teacher standpoint, but from like as someone who's there to just, I don't know, help you and like show you how to work in the real world and in our ag mechanics class we've learned a lot of good things to help you in the real world as well as just 
doing stuff like around the house when you get out of high school. Like we learned how to do a lot of wiring stuff, which is really helpful. Like for say you have an outlet go out or something like that, you know how to wire it and fix it. So you don't have to pay someone to do it and it saves you a lot of time and money. And when we get going into like our engine unit, we took disassembled a small engine and re-put it back together, which was really cool. And we all started with a running engine, and I'm pretty sure all of us finished with a running engine. <laughs> and uh, I was going to take welding two next year, but I got offered the opportunity to go to Washburn Tech. And I'm going there for HVAC, and I feel like doing these ag classes with Miss H has really set me up for the real world, as well as getting me started in our Washburn Tech classes. And I feel like I'm going to go in there with a pretty good understanding and good standpoint of just knowing what they're expecting. And I feel like it's going to really help me there and later on in life. So that's the end of our formal presentation. And before we offer up questions from the floor, though, I'm going to let Jeff Hamm talk about the impact that he had at my school. Thanks, Nicole. So once again, to second what she said, I appreciate everybody allowing us to come in here and take some of your time. So the Ham Foundation, to give you a little bit of a background, was started in 1996 by my Uncle Rod. And what had happened was we realized that there was a huge need in the construction industry, especially for skilled trades and laborers and everything else. And what we had realized was that the kids that are coming out of school had hit kind of three main barriers. And the problem was is they didn't, they either didn't have a good, correct knowledge of earning potential, or they didn't even have the awareness that jobs like ours existed because they are hearing from counselors and from teachers that took career pathways that are different than what we took. And so we, we started the foundation and what we realized at first, it was grants, much like what we gave to Nicole with welding tables and grinders and everything else. And then we realized that the issue was that lack of awareness. So we started with outreach programs and Nicole touched on it a little bit. What we did was we brought industry leaders together from various different companies, everything from technology to construction to CDL driving courses and things like that, got them all in the same place and then invited local schools. And when we, we reached out to the schools, we said, identify kids that you believe would benefit from this, right? Not somebody that just wants to get out of school, somebody that may be looking at a career pathway other than college. So these schools come in from all over Northeast Kansas and we spent a day touring quarries. They got to see a ready mix plant run, drone demonstrations, CDL driving simulators and everything else. And what I realized is it wasn't just for the kids, the teachers, just as much as those kids went, wow, I didn't even realize that existed. I didn't realize that that pathway was there. And I, a lot of them said, I didn't realize their earning potential either, right? So. What our focus is now is to really try to take that from where we started in 96, which was really Jefferson County, and now we've spread out throughout Manhattan, down south into Wichita. We are very blessed to have a lot of industry leaders and other companies that are focused on this as well, so we can leverage them and reach out to these schools and understand those needs. And it's worked out really, really well, and the proof is right here. So when I visited her class and I was able to see what she was doing for these kids and setting them up for careers after high school that may not be college-based, it, it really solidified the fact that we're doing the right thing. And what we are doing is making an impact. So being able to support Nicole in any other schools like that, that, that works out great for us. So thank you. What questions or comments can we answer now? Looks like we have a couple. I'll start with Betty. Okay. You know what? This isn't a question. It's more a comment. I love your presentation. Thank you. And it's, it's just interesting how a comment that was made just kind of set the wheels off. And when you were talking about, oh, not being able to sit still in some class, yet I saw you listen to you and you were so focused, which underscores how critical it is that we are teaching some students something that they want to learn. It's amazing how their level of engagement increases when, it, when we've captured something that they are interested in. So, you know, without saying it, that was a point that you brought to mind. The other is um, how our, our young girls can feel so empowered to know how to do very basic things that once was, well, I need to call um, an electrician. I need to call a plumber. I would love to 
create art, but I don't know how to, you've opened the door to empower so many students. And you know what? I got all of that in just listening to you. Thank so you. thank you for what you do. My it's first amazing. year, I only had males in my shop classes. And this year, it's about 50 50. I was looking at that. That is so impressive. I mean, you're talking to somebody that loves things like HGTV when they're remodeling. And, and I'm looking at the women that are going in, these project managers and all of these great things that they can do. And, and when it comes time to fix a, uh, a wiring that, you know, you can do it, you have that confidence. That's something that our students need to feel that they are empowered to do those things that they need to do. And I just loved your presentation. And if we can repeat it, that's fine. <laughs> thank you. Pam. I just want to thank you guys again for being here. But thank you, Jeff and Nicole, for the work that you do with these kids. It matters so much. Um, there's so much going on, like the board to know, in career and tech ed right now in a lot of different venues. Like a couple weeks ago, we had Build My Future. Um, I don't know what you call it, huge thing at the Expo Center. We had 27 districts there, but there must have been a couple of dozen businesses there giving kids hand-on experiences and, you know, helping girls nail down, you know, roofing. And it, it was just a blast. And, we, and so I'm hoping next year we can double that, 500 kids there learning about really good-paying jobs. And um, I know um, Mike Gibson, who's on KACCTE, said over about the next five years, we're going to need almost 60,000 more workers in the trades. So getting kids exposed, what you guys are doing it is just huge. And I was going to tell you, I got my CDL the same way. My principal said, we don't have bus drivers for you to take your science class out and go see what a farm looks like. So there you go. You but I wondered about you two. Uh, uh, McCade and Kennedy, uh, what's next for you? Well, since I graduated, I'm going to K-State in the fall and hoping to major in feed science because I'm also in 4-H and FFA. But I know that the welding and things, the classes I've taken are going to stay with me forever. And I do live on a farm, so now I know like that I can take those things and help back out in that way. For me, uh, after going to Washburn Tech and learning how to do HVAC and stuff, I'd like to go further into that career nice. and take HVAC to possibly the next level. Did you go to signing day? What'd you say? The Washburn Tech signing day, I mean, there, it, which is another big thing. Washburn Tech is really helping um, get kids interested. So. Oh, absolutely. We have, we've had uh, Washburn Tech representatives come to our school oh, and do presentations in our auditorium, and that's what caught my attention as long as, well, recommendations from our older kids that have gone. Uh -huh. And uh, I was told HVAC would be really good for what mm -hmm. I have an understanding of and just would be a good option for me. So that's what I decided to go for. Cool. In a couple of years, you can bring us your business cards because we'll, <laughs> we'll probably need it. But they had signing day at Washburn Tech a couple weeks ago as well. They had hundreds of kids there who had committed to go to Washburn Tech, and they had them come in and, and sign like they were athletes, you know, sign their letters of intent. They got their ball caps, and, and it, it's really cool. So tell them you want your ball cap. It'd be really cool. Thank you. Dennis. Yeah, I just, uh, if I was an employer, I'd, I'd want to hire you. Um, I, I'm sure most of us are aware that there was legislation to help uh, the kids get their uh, certificates uh, through the district or in industry. Is that? I think that did pass, didn't it? Flying color. So, so um, there's no excuse for it. if you go through a pathway like this to uh, keep that you know that um, money that uh, up front you need the certificate. You you get some help with that. So that was a good thing that happened this year in legislation. So. Congratulations, I'm glad to see what you're doing. I just have one last question. When you look at the students that are finishing your class or as they're wrapping up, how many of those see your class as a pathway to a career? And I mean, as, as someone who comes to the arts with a, from, through their artistic lens, I look at this as it's another medium, right? Mm -hmm. So how much of that is, hey, this looks like a cool class to take, maybe in the same way that a student might look at sculpture or an art class versus I want to go down this path because I think that that might be a career and a job for me. 
This year is different, I feel like, um, because so many females are in my class. I can tell you, though, typically about 33%, one third of my students go on to Washburn Tech or become directly employed in um, a skilled trades position. I'm not quite sure how this year is going to play out, but typically it, it would be about 33%. Awesome. Good to know. Board members, any last questions? All right. I want to thank you all for being thank here. Thank you so much. I don't want to delay you <laughs> due to the weather. Do you want to do that? Madam Chair. Okay. If, if I could, this does seem like an appropriate time to um, talk about, just to uh, share one thing, um, Future Ready Manufacturing, which is a partnership between Wichita Public Schools, WSU Tech, um, and the city of Wichita. Uh, this is to put students in advanced manufacturing jobs. They will have their tour and ribbon cutting ceremony May 19th. It's an empty building that's been turned into uh, advanced uh, manufacturing uh, opportunities for our students and just an opportunity to brag on 259. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Mr. J. Scott, it's nice to see that you stuck around. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. I didn't even give it a second thought. <laughs> I'm sticking around. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and the board. Appreciate the time with you this afternoon. I, I can't think of a better day for a state board meeting than National Teacher Day. I really can't. So, um, you know, it just kind of reminds all of us of those influential teachers that we have all had in our lives. And so I hope you get a chance to share some congratulations with a, with a teacher if you haven't already today. Uh, I do want to say I appreciate Member Hopkins and Member Hirschberger being at the service centers. I, I presented at Northwest. I presented at ESDAC. And I know I'm, I'm an easy act to follow. So um, I, I just appreciated you being there and connecting with our, with our schools. Um, <clears throat> so... I think it's also appropriate to be talking about accreditation on National Teacher Day because I've said this from the beginning and I'll keep saying it. If KISA doesn't have any impact in the classroom, then it's just four letters. So I think it's really important that as we move forward and we think about the future of accreditation in Kansas that we're ensuring that it's going to connect and have an impact at the classroom level. So I'm excited to bring to you our most recent Accreditation Review Council system accreditation recommendations. And as always, I'm going to give you the start off with a little bit of history. Um, this, the first cycle of KISA began in the 17-18 school year. It is a system accreditation at the district level, not down to the building level. It's a conglomerate of all the buildings in, in a system. It is on a five-year cycle. Um, so, like the systems that you are reviewing and, and voting on today are all in their fifth year. Uh, and the reason we have 179 systems going through this year, approximately half of all systems that we accredit in Kansas is because they were allowed to pick the year that they started in back in 17 and 18. Currently we have 362 systems in KISA, 287 public and 75 private systems. And again, private systems have the option. They can choose to go through accreditation through, through uh, KSDE, the state board, or another organization. So these are the main roles in KISA. The system actually document their process. They account for their results. The outside visitation team is an external collaborator made up of educators from other districts that the district can actually interact with and get great gain feedback from all along the way. That outside visitation team actually makes a report to the ARC. The ARC is the body that uh, reviews the system's accountability report, their narrative report. Also, they're looking at their OVT report as a validation tool. And then they make the, the ARC makes the recommendation to the state board. And obviously, you all make the final determination. So this is our current accreditation process. Again, it's a five-year growth process. It's really focused on, and I appreciate what Dr. Proctor said earlier about, we're trying to increase opportunities for kids, set them up for success. And that's really what should be the aim of accreditation in Kansas. 
in years one through four, it's been characterized with one OVT visit on site each year. So the OVT would make an on site visit with the system in years one through four, and every year the system is reporting, the OVT is reporting every year. So a lot of reporting. Year five, um, the ARC actually reviews all their documentation and then they may go through the process of making a recommendation uh, eventually to the state board. And the, what you all receive is the ARC's executive summary. So it's their executive summary of what they've reviewed. So accreditation defined, if you are accredited, and you'll see uh, recommendations for accredited systems today, that means that they have shown evidence of student success in terms of the outcomes, and they've also shown evidence of a quality processes in place. They are also in compliance with all the compliance areas that are identified for accreditation. Conditionally accredited means one of the two, either insufficient evidence of student results or insufficient evidence that a quality process is in place. Even if they're conditionally accredited, they must still be in compliance. So compliance kind of stands by itself. Not accredited means they're insufficient evidence of in both student success, the results side, and a quality process, or again, by itself, they're not in compliance with, the, uh, with those areas identified for accreditation purposes. So I'll, I'll present these 16 systems. I will read these off, but these were receive uh, items at the March board meeting. I'm sorry, that should be April. It received, yeah, I want to go further back. Okay, so the systems received at the April board meeting, these 16 systems, and I will read these off. I will not read the recommendation. You can see that listed. Uh, but these all that I'm going to list off to start off with have been recommended by the ARC to be fully accredited. 106 Western Plains, 111 Donovan West, 223 Barnes, 224 Clifton Clyde, 235 Uniontown, 338 Valley Falls, 367 Osawatomie, 412 Hoxie, 420 Osage City, 431 Hoisington, 449 Easton, 469 Lansing, uh, 503 Parsons, and then Z00260642 Lynn Lutheran. And so all of those are being recommended for fully accredited. And then we have two systems that are being recommended as conditionally accredited, and that's 245 Leroy Gridley and 422 Kiowa County. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? If not, now would be a good time for a motion. And, and the great news is you don't have to read the whole thing. You can say as presented. I got Dina. Um, I move that Kent State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Accreditation Review Council and award the status as presented. Thank you, Dina. Do I have a second? Betty? Any questions or discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. That looks unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. So these are the systems for receive. So uh, again, I won't read all these off, and maybe we can figure something out next month, because there's <laughs> quite a few on this list, and be expecting more next month just so you know, um, but these are all systems for receive with the accreditation recommendation from the ARC listed. So I'll just uh, stream through these. And I do want to mention Moscow, their year five was last year, and the 
board voted to conditionally accredit them, accredit them based on some process issues. They have rectified those, they have resubmitted their evidence, and the ARC has overturned that, that conditionally accredited into an accredited determination. We do have one system as a receive um, that's being recommended conditionally accredited. We do have one system that is chosen to withdraw from KISA. So it's a private system in Wellington. So I can stand for any questions on any of these. These are all receive and then action slated for next month. Jim. Do you, do you this may not be a fair question, <coughs> but do you see in the future anybody that's tentatively going to be coming to us unaccredited? And, and How if far the answer into the future? Is, if the answer is yes, I don't, I'm not asking you to tell me who it is. I'm talking about in this cycle. Not in this cycle. Not in, in this two, cycle. In the next two or three years? Oh, now in the next two or three years. So I misunderstood your no, question. No, no, you answered the question I asked. I'm asking you another one. Yeah. Well, um, that remains to be seen. I don't I really, uh, can't really make that prognostication. Are there some that you're really concerned about? I think what we need to do is make sure we're clear on the criteria that it takes to be accredited, right? Before okay. we can, before I'll start talking about, yeah, I'm really concerned with this system or this system. Okay, thank you. We're in the process of creating a much more objective criteria. Got a couple of questions, Ann? Yeah. Yeah, just to follow up on that though, I would hope the process we have in place is robust enough that we actually wouldn't have schools that were not accredited, that we would intervene early enough that, you know, people say, well, they accredited them all. I go, well, I hope so. I hope that we have the resources and the people in place to help schools that get in trouble before they fail, because nobody wants that. I mean, if they did not get accredited, I would put it on us and the department as, you know, as much as anybody. We need to be on, on uh, on top of it, but my question was, um, the students at Parsons Hospital, can you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know a lot about that, and they have very few students. Um, but those are students with uh, really significant mental delays, those kinds of things. Uh, but I don't know specifically. We have about, we, we classify Parsons State Hospital as a special purpose school. It's more like K&I type. Yeah. K okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And Dennis? Um, Jay, the, um, there was a filing in Ellsworth at the courthouse for 112 this morning at 830 for uh, disorganization. So if that happens, I mean, we don't know what that pathway, how that's going to work out. I mean, so I'm just kind of alerting everybody to what's going on there, and, and it's a real concern in that, in those communities. Yeah. So. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Commissioner, I believe you are up next with possible approval of board goals. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm going to refer to your packet. Um, and it would be page 391, starting on page 391. Um, this is after, of course, three retreats in a couple months. I've tried to send these out to you in the Friday notes. Um, I'll just go over the, the goals, the possible goals and the outcomes. The process outcomes are ways in which the agency would bring you things and they're really kind of draft because some of those dates may move. But what we're trying to accomplish for you on the, on the goals and the, out, and the outcomes themselves is between now and the end of December of 24. Because what will happen in um, August and November of 24 is that five of you 
will be up for election. And either there'll be a change in the board that happens in January again, or there'll be the same people. I don't, well, I don't think any of us know that. But then that'll be another cycle. Or then the new board, whatever the new board looks like, does the same process. So these are things we're trying to really accomplish between now and the through Christmas of 24. So number one, uh, it seems that everywhere we go, we talk about could we enhance the number and the quality of educators in school districts. So that's, that's the goal. The outcome, two outcomes, increase the number of teacher candidates in Kansas. How do we get more people into the profession? Second, develop a comprehensive educator leader program, meaning how do we take all the different parts of leadership that we have going on in our state from, from uh, I'm, I want to be a, a principal and I'm going to go to Fort Hayes State and go through that program, to the Kelly program, to what Greenbush does and others. So two outcomes you can see, and Shane tomorrow will start talking to you about some of these things around licensure and apprenticeship programs. We're going to have to decide some things on licensure during the next year and a half, and we're going to have to decide some things uh, around uh, trying to do something with the apprenticeship program. Um, so those would be uh, those things. The um, comprehensive leader program, we would start to first of all look at our colleges and universities. I want to bring to you, if you approve this, a review of the standards that we're asking our colleges and universities to do to train principals and train superintendents. Um, what we see in education right now, uh, and I'm going to talk about higher ed for, for example, is how short can I condense the time and how inexpensive can I provide the environment. I'm not sure that always gives us the best quality. That's Randy's opinion. I think that would be debatable. But I would like to bring a, a robust look at those standards first, and then I'd like to bring all the people that are engaged in leadership development once someone becomes a principal or superintendent and start to work on that. So that would be goal number one. Enhance the number and quality of educators in the district. Number two, to enhance each student's opportunity for post-secondary opportunities of success. You just heard two young people here, one going to Washburn Tech, one um, going to go uh, on and, and then probably come back to the family farm. That's opportunities. I can tell you this. So let's look at those two young people, a senior and a sophomore you just saw. Once they hit high school, I think our high schools are knocking it out of the park trying to help kids get certificates, help them get into college, help them get into the military. But we have too many students that arrive at high school with too low of academics to have all of those opportunities available to them. So one outcome would be to decrease the percent of kids in level one on state assessments and increase the levels of kids in three and four. Um, another outcome is increase our graduation. As you know, it's setting just under 90 percent. We'd like to get that toward 95. I just saw a chart today that not graduating high school in the state of Kansas uh, leading to uh, poverty, leading a life of poverty is extremely high, uh, extremely high. So graduation from high school uh, is, has always been important. And then helping kids find a need for post-secondary. Young man talked about HVAC. That's, you know, it, we call that post-secondary success. It's not a, maybe a college. He said maybe he's, he's even going to go on, so I don't know. That may be even further. But certainly we need skilled trades uh, we need teachers, uh, we, need, uh, we need engineers, we need, you know, coders, we need all that. So two outcomes there uh, in, in this, uh, the second one, uh, excuse me, there'd be outcome of increased graduation 95, increase our post-secondary effectiveness 75, uh, in, increase the academic success of students, and the last one, align our school district budgeting with improvement needs for each student as identified the building needs assessment. As, as a superintendent, former superintendent, I can tell you 
that the one thing that we're really good at helping new superintendents understand is how to build a budget that doesn't get you in trouble with the law. Because there's so many things that can go wrong. There's two of them here. There's so many things that can go, and the law last year even made it worse, right? There's so many things that can go wrong. What, did you get it published on time? Is, you know, what's your mill rate? Do you have to republish? What's my enrollment? That's, that in the first couple of years is about all you can do. But at some point, you want to start looking at your budget and say, am I budgeting for the priorities that I want for our kids? You heard the ag teacher say, or at least she told me, when I arrived there in 13, they said, go do this. They now have two programs in ag for McLeod School. That's a lot of kids, but they built that and they made that a priority and they moved some of their budgeting. Does that make sense? So what Craig and Dale Brungart, if you approve this, they would like to start building that for second, third, you know, on superintendents. So now you know how to build a budget. You know how to make it work. Now, how do you build it to maximize what the priorities are in your school district? And that's a little bit different in every one. Goal three, engage partnerships with families, communities, and businesses. And I think we talked so much today about we're not doing a good enough job there. Um, the outcome here is that families and caregivers feel equipped and welcome to engage in their student success. So many of our families do not feel like school was not necessarily a good place for them. They don't necessarily want to come back uh, and spend time. And then others, Michelle and I are having a conversation. Hey, it's going well. So how do, we do, how do we engage and then increase partnerships with business community? Again, what a great partnership you just heard, right, with business. So that would be the two outcomes there. And finally, safe and secure schools. We, did, we try to increase the physical safety in schools. We try to do some, some school audits and help schools with district safety plans, just help. We're not there as, as a gotcha, but hey, maybe, maybe you've got bushes, you know, and, that people could hide in, and maybe you don't have good camera systems, uh, things that are there. And cybersecurity. We've had two school districts that have had uh, some issues, and we're going to have more where where uh, cybersecurity and ransomware it happens, and uh, it can happen even with great systems. But I know Kathy and her team would like to work on that even more. So, Madam Chair, so I'm, uh, that, that's what I think we heard. Heard a lot of great things. You know, I, I didn't take everything Jim McNeese said personally, right? Or you? We tried to look at where were the commonalities that came over the three months and tried to put those in some goals for you. So I'd stand for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll start with Betty. Okay, just um, one quick question. When we were talking about, when you were talking about the need for teachers, um, one of the things that um, really sticks with me are the obstacles, whether they have been identified or not, that, that tend to um, decrease the interest in that as a profession. Are, would that come under that category? I, I know that that encompasses a lot, but that is an area that, um, you know, I certainly have some concern. What can we do to actually promote that? And if there are obstacles that, that bar people from um, looking at teaching as a career, is, are, there, are there things that we can impact? Yes, Betty, and one of the things Kathy has asked, if we couldn't even just take a look in chunks of licensure and take a look at that. I've asked Shane in the next meeting, go back to the beginning, right? Where, where, why did the state board get involved in licensure? It's so interesting, I had a conversation with Dale Dennis, and it was one of the very first things, once the state board was, was put into the Constitution, that that was done was the state board would be in charge of licensing educators. But I, we, I think that discussion, and then he, if you remember when Susan Helpert was here, for those of you who've been around, we'd talk about the wheel and all the different ways. I think we could streamline that and help because we, we added on, we've added on and added on, and I think just have a conversation over several months about how do we want to approach this and okay. what do we want to do. And after your questions, Madam Chair, I will stand prepared to make the motion. Thank you. Ann. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry I missed the discussion in March that you guys had while I was out 
trying to break my leg on the slopes, but I'm trying to figure out what the connection is on this goal number two between the process outcome revised KISA process and improving post-secondary effectiveness. How does streamlining KISA improve post-secondary effectiveness? Providing uh, clear outcomes to school districts to know what they need to do within the, the next cycle of KISA and expectations thereof. Like and how to get that How done. much progress is good progress, like put a number to it? Yes, and, and how to do it, both. I, might, I remember, well, I was in North Central Association state team for like 15 years, but one thing I really liked about what they did was they kind of gave you a number to shoot for. Maybe, it, are we talking rubrics for them? Something? I, I, I think Jay is looking at so many things. I don't want to speak for that because uh -huh. I, I know even in June, as I told you, the, they're, they still got a whole day meeting where they're still trying to flesh things out. I think they're looking at rubrics. I think they're looking at number metrics. I think they're looking at ways in which school districts can be recognized statically, meaning I, I've arrived or I haven't, and through maybe uh, some growth. What does that look like mm -hmm. uh, analytically? So I think there's a lot of things that they're, that they're looking at right now. Okay. And w what we would do in KISA is I've asked Jay's team to start having that conversation with you in June and have it in June, July, and August so that there's a building of three months of an understanding and a conversation around what do you want to see. And I would, I'm going to give a lot of kudos to, to Jay and Myra and Sarah and uh, that whole team. They have been, I don't, how many miles? You put more miles than I put on, you guys. They have been everywhere trying to seek feedback as to what do you want in the system. They've got advisory groups. They've been at the service centers. They've got councils set up. So they're being bombarded. They're internally working with staff on, you know, how could we do this? So the, what they bring you, whatever that starts to look like for them, will be extremely well vetted by a lot of people. So, but... I'm not going to speak because I don't. It's not a done product yet. So, Kathy, a uh, couple things. I'm going to have to bounce around a little bit. I want to go back to the re teacher retention thing real quick, and I don't have it with me. I'll have it tomorrow. But there was apparently a survey done. I want to say Emporia State, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if anybody has looked at that here. What that might be telling us, Dr. Brett Brent Church. Uh, Poria State, Brett Church, did a survey on why do teachers leave. Also, Kansas State did one, too. Uh, and, and both of those have been published, I think, in, in peer review articles. And, and we have looked at that in Shane's team. Okay. I yeah. think it would be good if we could hear what – I've got it printed, but I'm like, okay. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's something – Shane could, Shane could weave that in. Deciphering that would be mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, I do want to – Okay, I'll go to Kisa next, just kind of a throw out there. Because one of the things I hear from the little bitty school districts is they're doing the exact same thing that a 5A, 6A school is doing with a superintendent and basically zero staff. And to me, when you have such a smaller district, it seems like there could be a way to streamline that a bit more so they aren't so overwhelmed with what those requirements are. I just, to me, it makes sense. If you have a district of 100 kids versus, you yeah. know. Yeah, I, I know Jay's going to speak to this. Let me also say, I think it would be instructive even for a 5 or 6A well, to have a process that is very laser focused to get the results that we want, if that makes sense, and then streamlining those processes. So it does, right now, too many superintendents would tell you, I do KISA, and then I do my strategic plan and my work here, right? The, now, again, we'll come back to Danny. You said something you said. That may not be the intention, but that may be the reality. And I know that's what they're really trying to figure out, is how do we make those together? So, Jay. So, the other day we were having a meeting, and, and um, this was a superintendent just mentioned that after COVID, we really stopped doing that accreditation thing. And so I stopped and I said, so what's the accreditation thing, right? And to her, it was reporting. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we've got some perception, perceptions to overcome because it's had five or six years to get ingrained in people's minds that it's really just a reporting mechanism. And, and we, to the point where we get 
systems when they turned, and this is no indictment of the systems. This is how we set it up when we started it, that it's a start and a finish. You start in year one with a needs assessment, you follow these steps along, and in year five, your goals should be hitting, right, culminating, and then we're finished, and then we start again the next year. That's not how kids learn. <laughs> that's, not how, that's not how systems move and, and continuously improve. So we're really trying hard to streamline the reporting side so it's not so onerous on those smaller systems. And I'd even say for the larger system, it's, we hear the same thing. So I think there's a lot of internal work that we can do to align the reporting side. I think there, there's just a lot of work there to, to do and everything's on the table because we, that was the major, one of the major points we heard was just this redundancy redundancy on top of redundancy um, throughout the system, doing more work actually putting the report together than there is to actually doing the work of continuously improving. So, yep, we're working through it. Thank you. Good appreciate questions. that. One last thing on the goals. Um, all the way back up to the top, could we look at, instead of career training, career exploration? just to throw another cog in the way. <laughs> yes, and, and I, I kept that word right highlighted in there. I think a couple others, Dina and maybe some others had some suggestion. Was it preparations? I can't remember, that, but there was another, another word someone asked. They didn't like the word training either. So let's, let's look at that too. Yeah. That came, th many of you brought it up. I don't know if we arrived at the word, but we could wordsmith that over the next several months, figure out what we like. Dina. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm looking at goal one, and it seems to me that it's talking about preparation of teachers. Pre, the um, pre-service more than those in service. So uh, things that I've heard in visiting with teachers, the concern that the in-services don't relate to what their position is, and if we could address some of that or encourage that it be addressed, I think that would help with retention and people feeling like the value, they're continuing to get value in what they do. So I know that when you're talking about a small district and you're talking about art teachers, for example, you're the only one. But is there a way for you to do in service for that 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 has has value for you and your students? that um, may be online or a conglomeration of, of different districts working at the same time. There are lots of creative ways to deal with that, I think, but um, that's a concern looking at a, um, we want to enhance the number and quality, but we're, we're not talking about the existing, the people who exist today. And um, at least it, perhaps it's there and I'm missing it, but I think I'd like to see that added as one of the uh, process outcomes. Thank you, I, I'm smiling a little bit because Madam Chair, through the IPS discussion, 
knows how frustrated I was get about implementation, right? There, there's nothing that prohibits school districts from doing exactly what you just said. How so we'd have to, and we could, we'd have to figure out what we can do to encourage it even more, right? But to be done right. that's what I'm thinking is we don't want to ignore that as an important component. Thank you, Madam About Chair. Well, we do have, and I was thinking we had some here, um, they have to submit a new professional development plan every five years. And I don't know what guidelines we give them on that, but that would be, that's where we need to see, are you individualizing your PD for your teachers? That's really where to be the most effective. To enhance what we're, or emphasize what we're talking about, it just seems to me that that is a component that we ought to, to look at. And I'm not saying that we need to um, not approve things today, but because I see the, this as a, a flexible component. Just, just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Porter. I, this may not even be appropriate, uh, and uh, and I apologize for missing the the March meeting because this may come. I'm talking about goal one: <clears throat> enhance the number of quality educators in every district. I think that we're starting too late, uh, and if we want to do that, we need to start recruiting teachers early. So I would like to at least consider, maybe not now, but at some time in the future, uh, a robust uh, support of the CTSO educator rising. I think that in fact, uh, <clears throat> that's, that starts the process earlier. And so we, if we're gonna have teachers in the classroom, we have to start encouraging them earlier than after, after they graduate. And I don't know if, even if that's part of this, but I think it's something we need to talk about at some point. Danny Zach. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with Kathy said on, on the smaller school districts, what I've looked at is their proficiency in a lot of areas is way above what a lot of bigger school districts. And so when they have to do all this paperwork and everything, it t they're, they're doing not bad what they're doing. And if they didn't have to focus on some of that stuff, maybe their proficiency level would go way up because they're already doing a good job. That's just what I've seen. All right, my hand raised docket is empty. I heard several suggested additions, at least one change. Where do we go from here? Do we want to wordsmith this? Would, would a motion right now, we would adopt and then continue to improve it as written? Okay. Yeah, and on the on the mission, we can just bring that back separately. Bring the mission back separately. Well, yeah, because I, okay. I wasn't, I was showing that, but I wasn't offering anything with that. Okay. Betty. Madam Chair, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education adopt the goals as presented for the time period May 2023 through December 2024. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Is there a second to the motion? And. Any further discussion? And again, on the process, uh, some of you brought up some of those, and I'll rework those. Those, those will be, those are where we'll make the, 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 the changes, and maybe a timeline change, that's you know, as we go. But that, that's where that'll happen. And then we'll also bring back the, the mission statement. I heard that you wanted to work on that work, Mr. McNeese. <clears throat> I would like to see the plan to implement the plan. <coughs> nice plan. Who's doing it? <laughs> I have a good way to go, Randy. <laughs> no. I would like to see yeah, the, 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 what, what's the plan to do this? How do we, you know, that's gonna implement it and how do we evaluate the success of this plan? 
Well, I think you'll evaluate yeah. by the outcomes. I think it's up to me to work with the agency and the other, like service centers. I, and I, I, that I, I agree entirely what the outcomes are, but what numerically or outcomes in a different fashion, do we know as we start that this has been successful? Rather than determining at the end of it that we're successful or not. You know, plus, every one of these is, is a huge challenge. Not, not just one of them, every one of them. And who's in charge of this? You? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what's your plan? Because it, it, this is not gonna work unless we have a plan. I mean, who's doing it? And when are you gonna report back? And timelines, and I guess I'm being a little, you know, I just, I, I don't expect the answer right now, but I'd like to see a plan. Jim, I just want to point out that there are some dates in here, and the commissioner did speak to some of that. Um, so I have a, a degree of confidence that this would at least put us on the path to accomplishing those goals, but if you want to add anything, feel free. I agree. Okay. We do have a motion on the table. Is there any other, Jim Porter? Just a clarifying question. If we approve this today, we've heard some recommendations for change. Is this a dynamic document that we can add to at any time? Or are we doing this for five years? Because that depends on, I'm gonna vote wrong if, it's, if we're not gonna talk about it again for a while. But I think that if we, if we adopt this, because I, like I like what I see, but we've made some recommendations for some other things to be added, and I'd like for that to be able to be discussed uh, pretty soon. Outside of the mission, that discussion, uh, these would be the goals, so the, one, the goal statement, and the outcomes would be kind of set. Process things are what we would continue to both look at, change, and change timelines. Thank you. And it's again from today through the end of December of 24. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner, I'll ask one last question to the points that we've just heard. If we approve this today, what might we expect to see added to the agenda for next month that relates to this plan? You'll see some, some of the already changes that you suggested in the process outcomes, and you'll start to see things, actually, even tomorrow, you'll start to see things come at you that will be goal-oriented. Shane will be talking to you about uh, the expiring teal license, for example, and whether or not you want to do something in June. You'll see K Kisa coming at you this summer. You'll see Shane in front of you every month. You'll start to see uh, our partners like uh, Jane Groff and some people on the family engagement start to come to you and have discussions about are these things that we could do together. So, And every time in the agenda, it'll, it'll link it back to the goal and the process outcome. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, another thing we heard today are the, about dyslexia and the science of reading, and um, our goals to our, our goals to address that. So when I see standards for um, colleges and things like that, maybe in teacher colleges, those are some things we want to look at if we're going to employ those people in our schools coming out of those colleges. Are they ready and prepared for teach for, yes. for the science of reading and to teach the science of reading? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear in just a few minutes, maybe. No. <laughs> If we, stay, if, we, if we get through the agenda, you'll actually hear some work that, you know, that we're doing on that to put in the student standards right now. But yes, yeah, I mean, if principal, for example, don't go through training and know what good literacy looks like or good mathematics training, that, that's got to be an issue, right? Right. I had zero. I had zero. I, had, I mean, in my preparation, I had zero. Jen's probably, yeah. So, I, I'm, yeah. So, that, yeah. Okay, we have a motion on the table. I believe we're ready to vote. I don't see any more names in the app. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Nine and one abstention. Mark, we may need to review abstentions at some point. Um, put that on the agenda for next month. <laughs> Thank you. Motion passes. Next up, we have David. Nope. It does. An abstention means no. Okay. Danny's asked to change his vote to no.
welcome Beth Holtz. Thank you, thank you. And your group. So is the blue, the blue's on, I can hear my echo, right? Can you hear me? No? I think so. Blue. If it's blue, just wait a minute, he'll turn it on. You're good. I'm on. Okay. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, Chair Haas, Commissioner Watson, and State Board members. It's been a long afternoon, uh, but we have some exciting things to bring to you. Uh, today will be the first of multiple times that the Career Standards and Assessment Team will bring before you proposed revisions to the Kansas State Standards. Just, I'm going to go through a brief review here, so bear with me, but I think it's important that, that you hear some of this information. Standards are the backbone of education in Kansas. The standards streamline and eliminate random teaching practices that tap into the preferences of individual teachers rather than the instructional needs of the students. Kansas standards identify the what that should be taught in Kansas accredited schools. In general, Standards provide a reliable basis for people to share the same expectations, whether that's about a product or a service. Standards are an agreed upon norm used by people, industry, and the government that outline the best way to complete a task. Standards promote high expectations. As the State Board of Education, you have approved standards across the entire agency at KSDE. I just want to name a few of these for those of you that might not be aware of the vast majority of standard work that you do as your, your time as a board member. So the, the most obvious one for me is the K-12 academic standards, right? We have assessed standards that would be in English, language, arts, math, science, history, government, social studies, and we have the English learner standards. We have non-assessed standards, which includes fine arts, that's dance, music, art, theater. We have health standards, we have PE standards, we have counseling standards, we have library media standards, we have world language standards, we have, most recently, you've adopted financial literacy standards and computer science standards in the non-assessed areas. We also have standards in the uh, career and technical education pathways. So you don't have a pathway without standards and competencies. You can't have a competency unless you have a standard. So standards uh, cross the whole team for career standards and assessment. We also have early childhood standards, and I think you'll be hearing about those in the next few months. We have the Kansas CAN uh, competency standards. Uh, previously, you might have heard um, those called the uh, social emotional uh, standards. We have teacher preparation standards. You've been talking about that quite a bit today. Uh, we have standards in, uh, for the other licensed areas. So we have administrator standards. We have reading specialist standards. We have mentoring standards. We have professional development standards. We have nutrition standards. So when nutrition comes to talk to you, they're based on, you know, the work they do is based on standards. We have safety standards for schools. And if you think about it, all the rules and regulations that you have in sports or athletics are based on a standard. So that's a lot of work that we do around standards and it's very important when we bring this to you and you make decisions. So finally, and I, I think this is a, a very important statement about standards, is that they increase equity and access to post-secondary success by making essential knowledge and skills available to all children. Standards guide planning and instruction and help teachers keep their focus on the learning targets. All of our standards are reviewed on a rotation cycle and updated and changed when necessary to stay current. Most all of the standards are reviewed by Kansas educators. The public has an opportunity to comment and are at the end of the process approved by you, the State Board of Education. Kansas content standards identify the knowledge and skills necessary for students to be prepared for post-secondary success. Today, we're we're, we will be sharing with you proposed changes to the English language arts standards. 
These changes are necessary to make sure Kansas students receive reading instruction based on structured literacy. We've provided for you a copy of the um, English language arts standards. And then inside you'll find a um, red line of uh, some of the changes that were made to the standards. So you'll have an idea as we go through the presentation what we've been talking about. So today, I would like to uh, introduce the people that we'll be presenting to you. So first we have um, Joanne McCrell. She's a program manager for humanities on career standards and assessment and the lead for English language arts. Luann Fox is um, one of our part-time teacher leaders. Uh, she works full-time in the Olathe School District, so she's above and beyond her <laughs> responsibilities today. Dr. Lori Curtis is a reading program manager on career standards and assessment and the lead for the structured literacy work we're doing. And Dr. David Fernkopp is an assistant director on career standards and assessment. Among his many responsibilities would be the lead on all the standards work for our team. Madam Chair, Dr. Watson, members of the board, hello, I'm Joanne McCrell, just to introduce myself again. I am a KSTE program manager for humanities, focusing on K through 12 ELA standards and assessments, and then also English learner um, K through 12 standards. Um, today I wanna talk to you, um, I was brought in as far as to inform you of the purpose of the ELA standards. And to me, those are twofold. The first is instructional guidance. And it's instructional guidance in five strands, three of which are reading focused as far as foundational reading, um, uh, literature reading as far as literature is concerned, and reading informational. And then we have writing standards, and then we also have speaking and listening as far as a strand. These five are actually interconnected. Um, when we look at those standards and we think of the instructional guidance, it first starts off, and, and Dr. Curtis will, will confirm this, as far as oral language is concerned. What our kids, Kansas kids, bring to the classroom as far as oral language is what they can um, do in reading and writing. So if I come to you as a newly kindergartner and I can form three word phrases, then the most that I will be able to do then is form a three word phrase as far as writing when I get that orthographic mapping down. Um, the same is true within writing or in reading. Um, when we look, those interconnectedness um, show up in uh, a number of our elements as far as structured literacy, but profoundly in syntax, in semantics, and also, um, this one kind of goes above as far as the rope, as far as structures are concerned. So when we start to look at this instructional guidance, we have a vast array as far as those five strands are concerned. The other thing that um, we want to make sure that we do is provide a rich context for language and literacy for our kids. And when I speak of that, the best example that I can give is a first grade classroom that I um, observed um, within the past couple of months. And I walked in and saw an amazing teacher with 18 littles that I'm like, you are amazing because I could never do this as a secondary person. But um, they had 18 kiddos and they put them in groups of three and their job was to create a graph. Within that graph, what they did is the interconnectedness that I'm speaking of as far as the standards. They had collaborative discussions just like you've had here today. They had rules that they had to follow. They were um, adding on information. They were clarifying information. They were asking questions. They were answering questions in order to construct this task as far as this graph is concerned of which kind of apples did they like, Fuji, Red Delicious, or Granny Smith, right? And so they had this choice that they had to negotiate and this task that they had to do that not only involved that oral language that I was just talking about, but also the written language. They had to um, count up how many kids wanted the Red Delicious as their favorite. And they had to negotiate why one was better than the other, even though that wasn't part of the task. But um, 
the, it went on to develop from there as far as that graph structure, if we think of a graph, and simple as far as what would be in first grade. Um, you would look at the X axis and have to name it, and the Y axis and have to name it, and we'd have to make sure that we had the right number of people for that kind of apple, and then we had to come up with the central idea. There's our standard, RI1, <laughs> um, and that standard then um, starts to get in all kinds of other standards, um, so that central ideas are title, and then we have to do what would be capitalization, right, in a title. And then we'd also have to look at the spelling and how we um, modeled that for our kiddos who were ready and those who weren't. So when I say that these standards are interconnected, I really want you to understand that we do not teach these in isolation. So again, instructional guidance, and that we are getting those rich language experiences and literacy experiences that I just explained to you. The second one is, um, goes back to the work um, that the board itself has adopted as far as ELA content standards and what those should do. And what we, what we looked at was exactly what um, the initiative as far as reflecting that initiative that the Kansas State Board of Education adopted. And that's making structured literacy the explicit and evidence-based approach. And so what we did is we went back into the standards and looked at where we were failing on that. Not only that, but are we giving them a clear view of, these, of what literacy instruction should look like in the classroom? And that's another, another issue that I kind of want to show you of how this developed a little bit. So uh, you have your book, right? And if you turn to page 11, I'm going to show you one of those foundational skills. A lot of them are in foundational, but there's also a lot of syntax and reading, uh, speaking and listening, and some in writing as well. Um, so they're spread throughout here, but I want to highlight an area for you. So if you look at page 11, it's down at the bottom, the numbers. And if you find that second heading, now I'm talking a whole bunch of English stuff to you right now that um, our littles would actually understand. So when we say heading, they actually know what that is. So when I look at phonological awareness, that's our main heading. And then you look below that line and it says R.F.2. That is the actual standard that is supposed to be taught. So demonstrate understanding of phonemes, sound syllables, and spoken words. Well, that can be almost anything. And so what we did with specificity, and we looked at what else we had been doing as far as the letters training, as far as these review of standards, that they were all aligned towards the measures that we are pushing out to support Kansas teachers. And so that A, B, C, D there, is the specificity that our teachers have to do at kindergarten level. That's what they have to do in order to hit that phoneme and syllables and um, spoken words as far as sounds. So if you turn to page 17, I'm going to show you a learning progression. So on page 17 is grade one. And on grade one, again, you'll see that phonical uh, awareness section as far as the heading is concerned. You'll see the exact same standard. However, when we look at the specificity of the ABCD underneath of it, you will see that those skills have changed to uh, replicate what we want a first grader to know and be able to do. Okay? So... Um, it is not program-based. We're going to get some comments back on this as far as program-based because all programs aren't created off of what we're training teachers to be. And so that will be a little bit of some learning that's going to take place. But these um, standards that we're proposing for um, adoption are based on everything that we've decided so far. So now, Miss Luann Fox. We have a quick question. Anne? Thank you. So, Joanne, just to be 
clear. This shows it the way it was, mm -hmm. and this is the new. This is the final gotcha. draft. Right. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you so well, much. Well, not the final Appreciate draft. Your, your, your draft to consider. Thank you. Hello, Madam Chair, Dr. Watson, and members of the board. I'm Luann Fox, a teacher leader consultant working with Joanne McCrow for Humanities and ELA. I work with professional development, standards and assessment, and I also work as an MTSS literacy support specialist in Olathe. So about the, Ola about the ELA standards review. We started this process in November of 2022 and we collected information from the field online that had been sent out to teachers, to curriculum leaders, and to the public. And they reinforced to us the need for structured literacy instruction. And you will find those adaptations within the reading foundational pieces mainly. Structured literacy encompasses semantics, which is the meaning of words. It's syntax, which is the way words work in sentences and the way sentences work themselves. And morphology, which would be word forms and vocabulary. But it's also that decoding, right, or nuts and bolts of reading and writing, which is phonology. That's going to be speech sounds. Sound symbol correspondences, which is the skill that would turn the printed word into sound, and syllabi syllabication, right, which is division of words. The revisions then reflect the Kansas Dyslexia Initiative. And you'll remember that that is a legislative task force working together, higher ed folks, the legislature, the Department of Ed. That was developed a few years back that promoted the screening for dyslexia and then adopted structured literacy as that explicit evidence-based model for reading instruction. And this has come to include letters training. Content standards provide a clear view of what language arts instruction really should be. And that's what we're working on. Adoption of these standards will provide clarity. If what looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity is true, as authors Chip and Dan Heath explain in Switch, a book about managing change, then the clarity of these revisions should reduce questions and confusion and make these objectives manageable. Adoption of these standards will provide a common language. This common language will reinforce consistency across the state in not only what kids learn, but in also about the level of rigor in their lessons. Common language is going to be key in moving instruction forward so that kids can gain the foundational knowledge that they can use and apply when the standards actually become more rigorous. Adoption of these standards will provide alignment across grade levels so the teachers and students can truly build and expand on the knowledge and skills gained in previous grade levels. This alignment allows teachers to understand how what they are teaching fits in with the learning before and after their grade level across the state. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Lori Curtis. Hello, Madam Chair, Dr. Watson and the board. I'm really excited to be here because what we've talked about for so long about doing what's right for Kansas kids for reading instruction and our commitment to using structured literacy is now going to be before you in these standards. So they discussed what that internal review looked like. Um, we looked at those elements that you see in, in your drafts and we made sure that it aligned to what we know best about what the evidence tells us um, with structured literacy. So when you look at that redlined, crossed out document that looks like there are so many changes, there's a couple things I want to tell you. Some of that was just clarification of wording. Just like we said, clarity is important. And we wanted to make sure that we use the clearest vocabulary we could so teachers had no question about what they were to be teaching or what they needed to do. The other thing it did is it reflected the current research. Because when, um, even 10 years ago, when we looked at teaching using structured literacy, then that was just starting to come into, um, 
being really seen in the research. We thought it was best to teach or spend time with kids learning about sentences, big units of language, sentences. And then we would teach about syllables. And then we would teach about words. And then we'd teach about the sounds. And actually, the research has shown now it's more important you get those kindergartners right in there working with letters and sounds, those smallest units, and then build up to those larger units. So when you see some of those changes in that red line document, what you'll see is we have put those changes into the standards. So we talk about phonemes and graphemes first, and then into the syllable level, or then the word. So you might just even see some words that are flipped around. Other places where it's suggested that teachers do any type of encouragement to have children predict based on the context of a sentence, which is kind of like guessing, rather than drawing their attention to the letters and the sounds. We took that out because we know now from the research kids really need to focus on individual letters and sounds as they decode. So those are some of the changes that we made. And um, as you look through kindergarten and then first and second, those standards are quite similar. So where it looks like there were a lot of changes those are repeated changes sometimes from kindergarten through first and through second. Um, so we already talked, I, I saw Luann talk to you about what phonemic awareness or at least what phonology and syllabication were, but um, in each of those areas, whether it be the reading foundations, reading informational text, narrative text, the, the, um, or the speaking and listening standards, looking at vocabulary, semantics, looking at sentence structure, and also looking at syllabication, phonology, the sounds and the letter connections in phonics. All of those we've gone through um, line by line, standard by standard, to make sure that we've provided clarity. Do you have any questions for me? I think Dr. Ferngoff's going to speak for us now. We'll save them to the end. I don't see any yet. Thank you. So I get the probably the easiest part is which is the next step. So the next steps is the public hearing. So we will be having uh, two open Zoom meetings between um, this meeting and the next board meeting, and we'll be uh, publishing the information for the public hearings um, on the KSD websites. We'll be sharing those out on the listservs. Um, on the KSD weekly newsletters, just basically getting the word out to everybody so that anybody that's interested in the changes will be uh, aware of the changes so they are can let us know if they um, have any concerns or questions so we can have that communication. And we'll put on the, you know, the banner of the KSD website. We just want everybody to be aware of the, the Zoom meetings and having more than one meeting so if they can't make the first meeting, maybe they can make the second one. And with technology, it used to be just in-person meetings, but with technology, Zoom seems to be the most convenient way for people to be able to attend. And so after those two public um, hearings, those two Zoom meetings that we'll have, um, then we'll um, have compile those comments. If there are any um, possible revisions, we'll make those revisions. And then we'll be coming back next um, next meeting and uh, seeking approval from from you all uh, with the, the standards. Um, and we'll go from there. So the important people's uh, name are up there. And we'll see if, uh, if there are any questions. And uh, ladies, if you want to come join up, join me up here, if there are any questions from Board, there or. are. We'll start with Betty Arnold. Yes. Okay. My question uh, yeah, has absolutely. to do <laughs> has to do with the um, the public meetings. Yes. Can you give me a little more information on how that's um, set up and who's participating and what you would e expect in terms? And of I'm going to turn because I have not had the privilege of sitting through a meeting before with the standards, and I think Joanne has actually. Have you sat through a meeting before? We haven't had an on the meeting before. Beth is coming up because I think Beth has. <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to Beth. <laughs> Someone's been around a while. Right? I know. That's not good. I think I, I uh, hit that task. So we will set up an, an open, uh, put the information out so people can, can uh, zoom in, call in. Uh, there will also be a public comment page so people can go and comment. Um, you, they do that. A, um, Anytime uh, with regulations 
or with a lot of things that they do on title and special education. They set up the public comment page if we have to make a change to our ESSA plan or anything like that. So we'll follow all those protocols and notify the correct people how they can be involved. Um, we can have one in person, um, but we just, um, we've done that here in the boardroom before. We've had, had in person, and we'll have like two people show up, right? So we, we thought we would try to get more people to participate in the standards by trying to do it online this time. Okay, so this will be the first run with with For the public comments? On, on Zoom? For the public comment. For the public comment. Right, well, yeah. I, I don't believe we've, um, you know, I don't know. I'm gonna need some help on the financial literacy standards because that's the last set of standards I believe you approved. So I don't know if we had public comment on those or not. Well, we didn't do it on, on Zoom as far as I know. So this will be our first attempt to do it that way. And we, we had ways you could just submit comments. Yeah, we just took written I mean, comments. That was always on. Right, always I, think, on. I think from, from the point of COVID forward, we've only done written comments and we will put this out for written comment, but we would prefer to get people to, you know, give, have a little bit of conversation with people if they want to provide comment. So do we have an idea of what you would expect in terms of anticipated samplings to um, give credibility or... Um, so there, there Obviously, any time uh, that there's a change to the standards, there's an interest uh, with uh, the first group that comes to mind would be the district curriculum leaders, right? Because they want to know if they have curriculum that they're using in the classroom, how is that changing when you change the standards? Also have a big interest in the testing community. Well, if you're changing the standards, how is your test going to change, right? So they're, they're education groups uh, within the, the English language arts community. Um, they have a listserv, they have an organization that they'll want to know, you know, how are you changing this from what's, what's been the norm to, to the new expectations. So we would, exp generally, um, I think your ESI today that I sat through and listened to. Oh, that was a huge turnout for public comment. Uh, normally we don't have that many people that um, get all interested in our work. We would like to have that. Uh, we would welcome anyone that you know has, has an opinion, but we'll do our best to get comment. I, I was just wondering more from a perspective of this is, the, the expected turnout that we would need to say this is about, we, we don't we, have. We really have um, pretty, uh, we, we don't have any expected number of comments. We just offer the opportunity for anyone that would like to comment. I can answer that a little bit as far as the public comment that we did in November. We had 137 people reply, um, and those were 137 different people. They may have had multiple comments, but there were 137 total people. And so, um, and that is from a listserv of about 1,400 of ELA, and then another 1,700 as far as curriculum leaders is concerned, and then our our ELA is kind of wonky a little bit right now because some people are doing the, sorry, elementary. Elementary is wonky because some people are doing the elementary listserv and then somebody, some have switched over to um, Dr. Curtis's K through two. And, and I guess I'm, I'm struggling as I go through trying to ask this question because, and, and I don't know enough about sampling and all of that to where it makes sense, but my understanding is you got to have a certain percentage for it to be reliable, and maybe that's, so if, if, if I understood it, um, you know, it's like, okay, if we get 200 people, that would be a reliable sample that we could make some solid recommendations. Well, and Just trying you're to talking about a number of different standards too. So what if you only had a few people that responded on standard RL2 
you know, yeah. is that reliable then? So yeah. it kind of gets into the weeds a little bit. And right. so that's why we look at, uh, there will be a predominance of those that respond as far as certain trends within yeah. that data. Yeah. And that's what I tend to look at to help judge the direction of, of what we review. Okay, okay. So. Betty, I question. think maybe think about this a little bit differently. So. There's been a lot of work by a lot of people to bring the standards to you. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to broaden it to anyone that wants to get to some input. It. It's, not to, it's not really to try to run focus groups, if you would. It's really to say, look, you may not have been a part of this work, even though lots of people have been a part of the work, but if you want to give input, now is anyone's time to give input. Okay. So it's not meant to get scientific data, really, to, to make those changes. It may inform some changes, but it really is, is simply now anyone can, can have an opportunity to weigh in. Well, I wasn't thinking of it so much as scientific, but it, that does put it in a better perspective. It's like this is what we have if you have additional mm -hmm. things that, that you might want us to consider. And in a situation like that, it's, it's um, not that they are vetting the work that's been done, but adding to. Mm -hmm. so, so that does help. Thank you. I was just going to add one thing is that people have been asking for this because they've been involved in letters training and they're like, we want to see it reflected in the standards. So I think, you know, that part has been called for. So hopefully they'll be very happy. So what I'm hearing is we can share that with our districts and remind them that these are now going, that those Zoom meetings are happening. Um, Kathy. So we're, sorry, there's a lot of they's and listservs. So mostly you're targeting teachers um in those listservs but i've heard public in there somewhere so how are we helping get any public that really does have an interest like where are we posting is it just on ksde's website or what i'm just trying to understand Um, uh, yes, part of it is through the listserv, part of it is on the scrolling banner of the KSDE website. But we have other um, entities that have taken a strong interest um, and we reach out to those specifically um, to help us spread um, the message. Like when we did handwriting standards, we used KPERC. Um, and so we will take those. Um, I know that our indigenous people, they, they want to review this. And so we will, we will send them out to the nations that are recognized in Kansas. Um, and there are other, other entities as well. Okay. Ann. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know it's another one of those things that seems like it's taken forever because actually that task force met in what, 2019, and this board approved the move from, um, from uh, balanced literacy to structured literacy back in 2020 mm -hmm. when COVID just hit. And the districts asked for leniency, like don't make us do it this year. And we said, nope, literacy is too important. We're not gonna put it off one more year. And then we took 15 million of our ESSER money in 2020 and said, we're gonna train the teachers we're going to train the college professors so teachers come out of college now knowing how to do structured literacy. So I am so excited to see these changes because I think you're right. Until you put it in writing, I mean, we found some of them aren't doing all the letters training they should be doing. Some haven't moved to structured literacy yet, even though we did give them a list, I think, of curriculum that would be, uh, that, did, that does follow structured literacy. So I'm really excited to see this get in writing so everybody's on, on the same page about where we want to go. But can I bring up about every child can read? Am I concerned about that? <laughs> this is really a future agenda item. You know, most of you have seen the list of, what, 10 things we're asking districts to do under the Every Child Can Read Act. Here's my concern. We, we put this in place in 2020. This is our reading program. And everything on that list is what we ordered done except the reporting to the legislature. I mean, it's kind of like they say the best way to lead a parade is to get in front of one that's already going. So in 2022, the legislature tried to get in front of our parade that we already had going and, and wrote a law called Every Child Can Read, and outlining everything we'd already said to do. So 
this is something we can maybe put on the agenda for next month, but I would like to remove Every Child Can Read Act from that list and put our own name on it because we didn't wait for the law. We put this in place years before the law came around, and that's just my personal bug, I guess, but I'd like us to talk about making sure we take credit for what we've done. Any other questions? Thank you all for being here. Oh, I might just add, uh, when you look at the second board outcome, increased student success of your goals, moving kids out of level one and three and four, you just see what you're contemplating right now? That's a big way in which you're gonna get it done. I, big way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on that with you, Randy, because there was a comment made by Betty earlier today we watch upstairs and um, the comment that you're like I, I represent all kids I represent all kids and by moving this general ed forward within the standards we all we're raising all kids achievement by doing that not just the high ones and so I wanted to make sure that I said something to you about that um, to um, back what Commissioner Lawson said so thank you Melanie I want to thank you guys. Great job. This is really moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agreement with Jim. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Amanda Peterson. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So, <laughs> good really, afternoon. Really good <laughs> Indeed. It's all dark outside anyway. Um, my name is Amanda Peterson. I'm the director of early childhood here at the Kansas State Department of Education. I asked for a little bit of time um, for some items that we typically bring as consent items because when we think about early childhood funding and some of the pieces of business that we address each year, if you all remember uh, several months ago, I think it was slightly earlier in the day, but not much earlier in the day, I was here to give a little bit of background about what we do at KSDE um, and what the responsibilities are for the State Board of Education as it relates to early childhood and specifically early childhood funding. And then similar to now, um, we were uh, a little bit later than we wanted to be and I went really quick. And so I wanted to make sure that we had time because there is a lot in this area, especially as we are thinking about policy and funding and where we are at as a state right now. And I think it's really helpful to understand um, some of the why for the, the uh, items that we bring to all of you. So I appreciate the time. And I'm going to share a little bit of context um, because when the, the pieces that we tend to look at each year are pieces around the discretionary um, awarding of grants. So when we think about early childhood funding and the pieces that were responsible here at the agency, we tend to focus on those pieces that we have to address each year, right? And when we have a limited amount of grant funding, then each year we have to decide who gets that amount of grant funding. And it can be a little bit um, helpful, I think, to put that into perspective when we compare it to the funding that school districts receive through the school finance formula for certain preschool students. So some caveats for these numbers. We're using 2021-2022 enrollment because that's the most recent year that we have audited numbers. I'm really looking forward to when we have all of our audits finished for this year in a couple of weeks. Um, but when we look to that, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of these categories in a minute, but in the state school finance formula, we have two types of students that are included. We have our preschool aged at risk students, um, which are our students who meet certain at rich at risk eligibility criteria and who are in districts that are operating approved preschool aged at risk programs. And then we have our preschool students with disabilities. And both of those types of students are counted as a one half student or a 0.5 full time enrollment FTE student uh, in the state school finance formula. So when we think about count day in September, those students who are enrolled and attending on September 20th um, or for our districts that have the military count day that day as well. Um, those students, if they're either preschool aged at risk or a preschool student with a disability, they're counted as a one half student in the state school finance formula. And they trigger any uh, applicable weightings. So if they are transported, then we use the same rules that we use for our K-12 students to determine whether or not they get the transportation weighting in the school finance formula, for example. So. These are some estimates because we can get down to the individual student when we're, but uh, we tend to have small exceptions and so it's I think easier to look at it um, with the, this big picture. This is the number of students that we had enrolled in 2021, 2022 and so, and, and this is the amount of funding that those students would generate 
based on the base amount of student that um, uh, that was the, the $4,706 for that school year. Um, and so we've got the calculations here on the screen, but about $22.4 million generated from preschool aged at risk, about $14 million um, for preschool students with disabilities, and about $15.6 million additional dollars generating from the at-risk weighting um, from those students. And I'll note that that's just the, uh, the at-risk weighting. It doesn't include any high density at risk or any of the other weightings that would have been generated by these students. Then the math gets a little bit harder. I think this is helpful because when we think about the funding that we're going to be looking at today, we're going to be looking at about $8.2 million, or $8.3 million, I'm sorry, of Kansas preschool pilot grants that we're allocating out. And similarly, when we're thinking about Kansas parents as teachers, home visiting does not generate any funding in the school finance formula, but we're looking at about eight point, well, we're looking at, I'll talk more about that in a minute, somewhere between $8.4 million and $9.7 million of funding to allocate out for this year. Um, so I think that that context is helpful, if only to understand that the dollar fig figures on this side are larger than the dollar figures on this side, and we really try to work with districts to help them understand, okay, here are the other sources of revenue that can support your program in addition to these discretionary grants that you're awarded each year. I also think that it's helpful to consider where we've been as a state and where we're at right now. Um, so it's worthwhile to consider that 2017, 2018 was the first year where the Kansas School Finance Formula fully funded full day kindergarten. Um, before that, it was not funded. If I was a, a kindergarten student, I know, if I was a kindergarten student and I was attending full time, my district would not get the 1.0 FTE for me in the school finance formula. And so it took time to get to a place as a state to say, okay, we're going to fully fund full day kindergarten. And what we saw in the state is that many districts chose to adopt uh, full, full day kindergarten, even though they were not getting the funding back for it, even though uh, kindergarten students were generating 0.5 funding. Um, because they knew, okay, this is a worthwhile investment if we want to achieve uh, outcomes in terms of later student success, we think that it is worthwhile to find the additional money to invest as a district. Um, similarly, now we have districts who decide, okay, we're going to fully fund, or we locally are going to fund full day preschool even though we don't get more than the 0.5 or one half student for these students who are attending for a full day. So that was 2017-2018. Um, 2018-2019, um, the school finance formula uh, began to allow preschool aged at risk to include qualifying three-year-old students in addition to four-year-old students. Um, and it took a couple of years for this to be implemented because initially there was some language saying that we needed to make sure that we first fully funded four-year-old students. I'll also note, um, for those of you who are newer, uh, it is wonderful that you missed an era where we had to allocate out individual slots for preschool aged at risk. We had a certain number of slots that we could allocate out each year. And so each year we were saying, okay, this is the number of slots that each district is getting. Um, and then sometimes, depending on the year, we were then going through a real process where they would then tell us on September 20th, okay, here's the number of slots that we actually filled, and then we would go through a process of reallocating those slots. Um, both our team and school districts are really happy that that's no longer the case, that with the increased funding that was put into place um, as part of the changes in the school finance formula that went through during this time, uh, we now have sufficient funding available so that um, all preschool aged at risk students who are enrolled and attending on September 20th are funded. Um, that, makes, that, that means that they're, they're funded in the same way that we fund you know, third or fourth graders. Um, and so 2021, 2022, or that, that first happened in 2020, 2021, and then 2021, 2022 was the first year that sufficient funding was available to fund three-year-old preschool aged at risk students. So we've been through an area of um, you know, fairly rapid change when we're thinking about some of these pieces in the school finance formula. Those pieces we do not need to address today. Uh, fortunately, today we are just looking at one component of it, which is the preschool aged at risk program. Um, so I talked about this earlier. We've got two categories of preschool students who count as a one-half student in the school finance formula. Um, and for preschool aged at risk students, they need to be, um, they, they need to meet uh, at least one of the preschool aged at risk at risk criterion, and they need to be enrolled and attending in a district operating an approved preschool aged at risk program, uh, which is the motion that you all are going to be considering today. 
Um, in terms of the process for this, our team has or, or develops a um, set of program requirements. These are things that have uh, stayed pretty static over time. We try not to make changes uh, unless there's a good reason to. And so if you're interested in seeing that full document, it's available on our KSDE preschool programming webpage. Um, but the recommendation before you is that uh, 265 school districts operate an approved preschool aged at risk program in 2023-2024. Um, I will note here, uh, I am I am here, um, but this is a real team effort, and I especially want to highlight the incredible work that Natalie McLean and Becky Strom uh, and Lisa Williams do on all of this because the um, the extensive back and forth to go through and contact 265 school districts to try to make that process as easy as possible and reach out to those who have not yet taken advantage of this opportunity is a real um, intensive one. And I'm really proud of the, the work that our team does to be able to connect with districts, try to make that easy to understand and help connect the dots um, between, okay, here are some best practices in the area of early childhood programming um, and here's the, the ways that you can receive this funding. So with that, I would be ready to answer any questions. Start with Betty. Actually, had I waited before I put my name up there, you would have, because you answered it. Excellent. <laughs> OK. I will move on to Dennis then. Well, Amanda, I'm kind of new at this. And I'm uh, parents as teachers. Can you? Help me with that. Understand that I can, more. but it might be that, that is not this motion. So if we okay. can wait two okay. motions, I'd be glad to. Kathy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, but I have talked to some of the districts in my area, and they talk about, because they're not doing this, mm -hmm. but they are working with private preschools in their district mm -hmm. that they're working with mm -hmm. and so I guess for me it's a big part of let's don't push that away absolutely you know let's make sure that's available that community is already being served mm -hmm. and that we're not trying to pull away from a private preschool that's already serving the community. So. Absolutely, and one piece that is um, that I really appreciate about the way that we finance preschool in Kansas is that Kansas state law gives districts the ability to either operate preschool themselves or to contract with another entity to operate preschool. Um, and our preschool aged at risk program is actually um, neutral in terms of the location for where children are served. So we have a handful of examples of districts um, that actually partner with either 501c3s or with um, service center or, or with, um, not service centers, but uh, special education cooperatives or interlocals to deliver preschool. Um, and that is okay. They can still, they can enroll the children as children in their district and receive funding for that if they would receive this preschool age at risk funding for that if they would like, so long as those classrooms meet the program requirements that are there. That becomes a little more difficult if those private entities are um, accredited systems because they typically don't want their students to be, well, I won't say that. Um, they might have some, some, um, the students who are enrolled in that private partner do need to be enrolled as students in the district um, to be able to generate the funding. Um, so I'd be glad to, to highlight a couple of examples. I don't think we have any in your district, but we've got a couple where districts have taken that approach and we're always highlighting that as a great opportunity, especially if the state did think about expanding preschool in the future, um, because that's a great way, as you said, to really make sure that um, the district is not competing with a, a community partner that's already providing excellent services. Kathy, one of the things that clear when we did the 15 tour and the, and the 21 tour was patrons said, we want kids to arrive at kindergarten ready for kindergarten. We ideally would like that to happen in the home, but if it happens in church, if it happens in school, we want communities to decide how to do that. So this is one source of funding, but as you said, if it's happening in other ways, we totally support that. Ann. Yeah, I remember to, to Kathy's point, uh, Seaman was trying to figure out when we put out the, you know, we gotta be, get kids ready for kindergarten, what are we gonna do? Seaman had a big community meeting and they brought in um, the church groups that had, and the private preschool providers, and we're talking preschool here, not 
daycare, you know, real education, and said, we don't care who does it, let's just make sure every kid is covered. And it was a really great public-private, um, you know, cooperative effort. I just want to be clear, we're talking here about 265 districts and 9,000-some kids, because I think the actual population that would be eligible would be at least twice that much, right? It's a little bit difficult to answer that question um, just based on some of the limitations of our Kansas data. I do have and would be glad to, to flip to it the, the breakdown of um, all types of preschool enrollment. For that year, it's about 22,000, um, but it's between both three and four year olds. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's thinking we've got 40,000 kids in that grade level, poverty's about 50%. That means we got upwards of 20,000 kids who could have been served, but so a lot of them are being served some other way or they're just not going, but we got 9,000, some of them covered here, right? Okay, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Betty. I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve districts to operate preschool aged at risk programs for 2023-2024 in districts operating um, approved programs, three and four year old students who meet an at risk criterion for the preschool age at risk program and who are enrolled and attending a program that meets all of the preschool age at risk program requirements on count day will automatically count as a half student of 0.5 FTE in calculating a district's enrollment and accompanying Waitings. Thank you. Do I have a second? Jim Porter. Any more discussion or questions? All in favor, raise your hand. Keep them up. That is unanimous. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. So, number two of three, um, we're going to talk about Kansas Preschool Pilot, which is that $8.3 million of additional discretionary grant funding that we have available. Um, Kansas established the Kansas Preschool Pilot in 2006, um, and initially it was intended to really pilot the idea of, okay, is preschool something that we want to invest in more widely in the state? So originally it was a set group of about a dozen sites, um, and it was a mix of public and private entities. It's changed quite a bit over the years. There, there was um, some years during Kansas's more difficult budget times where the funding source for this shifted um, and where some of the um, the other context for it shifted. So it's grown from the initial $2 million that was allocated in 2006 to $8.3 million by 2018-2019. Of that, and that's that first two that are the first two bullets, $4.2 million is from the Children's Initiatives Fund, which is our state tobacco settlement revenue. Um, that's funding that Kansas dedicated to uh, children's programs when it was received, and that's funding where the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund has responsibility for oversight and makes recommendations each year to uh, the governor and the legislature in terms of how those funds will be spent. Um, and then $4.1 million in change of federal temporary assistance for needy families or TANF funding. Uh, KSDE has an agreement with DCF where we receive those funds. For last year only, um, we had an additional about $2.6 million of emergency COVID funds. And last year, we worked together with the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund to streamline this grant opportunity with a grant opportunity that they offer called the Early Childhood Block Grant, or ECBG. Um, we created a process where there was just one application, so applicants were able to apply once for both sets of funding, and then we were able to work together to review and determine who would receive what source of funding. Uh, as a result of this, we have fewer grantees that are receiving funding from both us and the Kansas Children's Cabinet, which means that they no longer have to, uh, for example, fill out two separate sets of reports each year or have uh, two separate, well, for preschool pilot, three separate sources of funding um, to track in their budget. So there was an opportunity there for us to realize some efficiencies and also to run, um, I think, a, a, a both a more competitive and a, a process that had more rigorous technical assistance and a review to be able to award funds. At the end of that, we had more uh, programs that we would have liked to have funded than we had funding available. And so we, and um, there were certainly uh, demonstrated need as a result of the pandemic where we felt like this was a good opportunity to use federal funds to be able to, uh, uh, to expand early learning opportunities and address some of that potential learning loss due to COVID. 
Um, and so we were able to use one-time emergency relief funds last year only, but those funds um, are no longer available. So for this year, because we knew that we had um, more, uh, more existing grantees than we had available funding, we really wanted to streamline the process. We really wanted to cut down on the amount of paperwork and amount of time that people would spend writing narratives, gathering uh, community data, demonstrating need, trying to convince us that preschool is a good investment. Um, we really wanted to help people focus in on, okay, how can we make sure that we are fully leveraging other more sustainable sources of revenue first? And so for this current year, um, only our current grantees were eligible to apply for funding. Um, and we required grant applicants to fill out a template that we've been using for uh, a few years um, where they entered in their forecasts for what uh, preschool students they would have enrolled for the coming year, and they also forecasted the amount of special education funding they would be receiving um, from associated special education staff. Uh, and then they showed us, here's how much our entire program would cost. And so we were able to see, okay, based on this data, here's what we can expect that you'll be receiving from the school finance formula, um, and here's what your overall program costs. And we then uh, made recommendations for grant awards based on the difference. So uh, making sure that grantees are, or that programs are first using other sources of funding before they use this grant funding to fill a gap. I'm glad to describe that in more detail if needed, but um, that is the gist of it. We've got a list of programs here, um, and it's sorted out. Um, the, the first section is those grantees who we were able to um, fund at the, the full level that, that we thought that they should be receiving, and then the second list of previous uh, grantees who previously received GEAR awards. We only had enough funding to fund them at about 52% of um, what we wanted to. And so if there are any additional funds that become available, if the final version of the state budget does include the language that allows us to reappropriate any unspent fund funding from this year to next year, we'll be able to um, use that to increase their grant awards just a little bit. Ready for a few questions? Hang on there. Kathy? Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple things really mm -hmm. quick. Yep, I'll absolutely. Be quick. Um, in speaking to some folks, um, mm -hmm. data collection. So what I'm kind of getting a feel for is that mm -hmm. the amount of it is really pulling away from the teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really a heavy requirement. So. I'm not even sure what that means exactly, and especially where it's going. It's, but it's a concern if whatever we're doing is just requiring more of that than teachers being allowed to truly teach. And I think that's across the board, but specifically just talking about this today. So I don't know if you can speak to that, but that really, that's a, a huge concern. And then real quick, I'll just ask it, and you can, I was surprised to see the United Way of Valley. I guess just my question of how does that work when they're mm -hmm. coming together like that? I'll speak to data collection first. So I think there's really two, um, two pieces that we might consider here. One is, you know, what's the extent that teachers um, and staff are really gathering data about where children are at and what they're learning or how they're doing over the course of the year. We'll speak in the future more about balanced assessment systems and how we can really make sure that um, teaching staff are using a variety of pieces of data so that they have a good understanding of, okay, here's where each child is in my classroom, here's what they already know and are able to do, and um, here's the, the areas where they need to grow. At a high level, for both this grant and our Preschool Aged at Risk program, we at the state agency ask that um, districts have in place an approved measure to be able to assess growth from beginning of the year to the end of the year in the area of mathematics, literacy, and social emotional development. Um, so that is something that in a, a high quality program they should be doing anyway, right? Making sure that children are learning and making progress over the course of the year. Um, and uh, we also, it is helpful for us to have that data so that we can demonstrate, okay, over the course of the year, here's the effectiveness of this program, right? So that's kind of the, ideally, um, whether or not we exist at the state level, that would be happening at the local level. But then I think there's the question of, okay, how does that data get from a teacher's classroom into a state agency system um, or into, you know, uh, how, how do we like go through taking that uh, out of whatever format it's in and putting it into the appropriate reporting system? And that is where, um, 
you know, I, we've tried really hard to make sure that the systems that we're putting into place are as user friendly as possible and as efficient as possible. But as I'm visiting with administrators, especially in small systems or as we're working with us, um, you know, it becomes really apparent which districts have somebody who's responsible for data reporting and which district this is, this is something that is um, something that's added on top of a teacher's plate in, in uh, addition to other responsibilities. That was, that's something that's really front of mind for our team. And this year, as we made the shift um, to just focusing in on the budget, we, we really want to make sure that um, if we're putting out a competitive grant opportunity and we, that, that we're not creating something that is taking so much time at the local level to apply for that um, people who are not professional grant writers are spending lots and lots of time on an application when we know on the back end that, um, that maybe there's a more efficient way to go about it. So that would be kind of my personal soapbox on why competitive grant opportunities might not be um, the best way to fund. Like something that I say all the time is that there's a really good reason why we don't fund any other grade in Kansas based on competitive grants, right? It's just a, a difficult endeavor. Does that answer your question for that piece? Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of how individual consortiums come together. Um, so there's a, most of these um, are, and there used to be more of them, um, most of these are some of those programs that were part of the original 2006-2007 uh, cohort. And so um, I was not here at the time, but my understanding or my, my recollection is that the, there were communities that were selected and there, were, uh, there was a really strong emphasis at the time at saying, okay, we're trying to make this be a um, real community-wide initiative to try to assess what's needed in, for example, Shawnee County um, and be able to work from there. And so we've seen some uh, examples through both the consortiums that we have in this group and then we have some consortiums that are now being funded by the Children's Cabinet by their Early Childhood Block Grant where they've been able to take that partnership and really um, be able to think about things like aligning curriculum or aligning professional development across programs so that if you have any individual program, I might be the only preschool teacher in my district, but if I'm part of a larger um, group, then maybe we're all using a particular curriculum or a, a particular assessment tool during the year, and we can come together to share professional development or to be able to have that kind of larger community. So that's a little bit of the history and background for that piece. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Dennis. Okay, I'll try to make this quick. Just a quick, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned or a little um, not understanding the second uh, sentence in this r recommended motion. If a program is unable to spend funds awarded, the Kansas State Department of Education is authorized to re uh, reallocate funding among programs. Mm -hmm. Is that all about within the preschool granting what, what, what you're working with? Or, I mean, it's a little bit ambiguous. Yeah, absolutely. So that's language that um, the agency pretty consistently uses when, um, when doing this kind of discretionary grant program and to help think through what that might look like. Um, not for, well, we are waiting for the final budget for education to pass, which is why I kind of keep qualifying it. That budget, um, the, the Senate Bill 113, does include language that takes any unspent funding from this year and reallocates it to next year. But that's new this year for the Kansas Preschool Pilot. So if um, that language was not there, we might be in a situation where it is June 1st and we find out, okay, you know, this district over here wasn't able to spend all of their grants awarded. Maybe they had some staff unexpectedly leave or some of their initial plans didn't happen. We wouldn't want them to be in a situation where it's a, either you all figure out something to spend this money on or this money just goes back or, or you know, that this money doesn't get used in the future. And so th this gives us the ability to reallocate amongst programs to make sure that um, we're not creating that incentive where our districts are just trying to spend down their grant at the end of the year. Yeah, that, Does that make that's, sense? My, that's my concern is that it wouldn't be used other than what it was actually allocated for. In other words. So th these funding would, it would only be used for Kansas preschool pilot grants. So it's not like we can reallocate it to something else. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I understand. Don't State government does not give us nearly that amount of flexibility. <laughs> I don't see any more questions. Does anyone have a motion? Betty? I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve grant awards for the Kansas Preschool Pilot for 2023-2024 subject to legislative approval of funding. 
If a program is unable to spend funds awarded, the Kansas State Department of Education is authorized to reallocate funding among programs. Thank you, Betty. Do I have a second? Jim McNeese? Any further discussion or questions? All in favor, raise your hand. I believe I see eight, nine opposed, one. Michelle, motion passes. Thank you. One All more. Right. And now we're on Kansas Parents as Teachers. Um, so this program, um, th this is the Kansas state law that authorizes districts to offer parent education programs and um, also to designate the state board as being responsible for awarding grants to school districts. Um, I will note that in uh, the state budget, it refers to parent education program and there's a lot of history here in Kansas. We feel very confident that that's intended to refer to the Kansas Parents as Teachers model. Um, and Parents as Teachers is an evidence-based model where um, you have home visitors who are able to connect with a family and be able to work together with the family to help think through um, child development and, and be able to help them understand, okay, here's um, how, and I'm trying not to use it here, but here's how parents can be really the, the first and best teachers for their children um, and really understand the basics of child development. Because young children, right, when you, when you go home from the hospital, you don't get a manual that says, okay, here's what you can expect from your child when they're three months old, right? It is. Um, really intended to be able to help support families as they are working together or, or as they are raising their children. So um, parents as teachers uh, is again a mix of as you're looking at the grantees. Um, we work together with the parents as teachers national center which has the, um, the curriculum and is responsible for the model um, to, to be able to structure this program. Um, and as part of that program, each of our Kansas programs are affiliates of the Parents as Teachers National Center. That means that we're able to tap into that uh, existing structure of making sure that programs are being operated with fidelity and really tapping into all of the reporting and um, quality assurances that comes with that. Um, instead of having to create something of our own at the state level. And so uh, as we're doing that, programs can either be individual districts um, or can be consortiums of districts. So um, where you see, for example, um, the first one that's listed is uh, USD 379 Clay County. Um, and then under that, we've got USD 334 that doesn't have, uh, that, that's in smaller font. It doesn't have any funding awarded. That's because it's part of the Clay Center Consortium. Does that make sense? That's all I had for that piece. Um, do we have any questions about parents as teachers? Mm -hmm. Oh, she she answered my question. Thank you. I, I was just wondering exactly how that works out, and I'm glad to you know parents can teach and mm -hmm. and uh, be involved in early. That's that's the optimal. Yeah. And and I just have to comment. Um, this was a program that I went through when I had my first child, and I'm glad that I did because now when I'm out in the community and I'm meeting especially younger moms. Um, sometimes I, I take my daughters to get their hair cut at a hair school, and so I will frequently run into young women who are you know, learning to parent at a very young age and sometimes kind of alone. And this has been a really wonderful thing to be able to share with them. They're, they light up when you tell them about it. Oh my gosh, I didn't know something like that existed. This is amazing, how do I find out more? Um, so I think that it's a wonderful program, and I really appreciate all of the PAT instructors, um, the, the teachers that come into the home and work with families, because it's just a, a fabulous way of sharing this information, and I, I still have the stack of colored papers that tell you at different stages, you know, what you should be expecting from your infant and toddler. So thank you for sharing. Um, it looks like we have a question from Kathy. I'm going to go back to the data part. Um, so... Parents as teachers, it's a state state funded. So obviously there's a file on the kids, on the family. Do the parents understand that that's happening and that their data is being pulled and that they can have, okay, all that information? In the same way that, um, you know, when we're thinking about when a district is going to enroll a child or gather that information, right, there's a release on the front end and there's really clear, okay, here's the information that we are gathering. Um, so for th that would be the same regardless of whether or not the same, but that holds true for the Parents as Teachers program that families have on the front end as part of enrollment. 
a process where they understand the data that's being collected and have a, a process to release that. I truly hope so, so that they're, because I will say I also started that program and I did not know that. So mm -hmm. I hope they're working hard to make sure there's that understanding mm -hmm. um, because they are young and it doesn't really occur to them, I don't think. So I just think it's important that people really understand what what's coming at them and what's being pulled from them in reality and used in many different ways. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, maybe I'm missing something, but I'm I'm not understanding your concern about, you're implying that the data is being used in a particular way, and I want to make sure that we don't broadcast the wrong message. Um, when you're funding something, we've already talked about that, so that that's being reported, it's being reported to the state. I'm assuming with the other one, with the TANF involvement, there's also federal reporting that's happening when you're using federal dollars, not on this one, but on the other one. When we're thinking, and it might be that um, there's need for a bigger conversation around student data, data privacy in Kansas, but when we're thinking about these programs, um, we take great care to make sure that, um, that we're respecting student data privacy and not sharing out information that would be personally identifiable in any way. So in the same way that you know, when we have individual level data about a child who's in kindergarten or first grade to know some basic demographics about their family, mm -hmm. um, things like where they live and um, their race and ethnicity and, you know, the, the, their date of birth, those kinds of pieces, um, there's strong protections in place for that data. And when we think about what's reported nationally, it's uh, de-identified and aggregate level. So um, the data that's reported to parents as teachers national center is not uh, personally identifiable individual level data. Uh, and then similarly for, for TANF, we, um, we provide a report to uh, the Kansas Department for Children and Families each year, and similarly that is aggregate state level data. So not individual level and not personally identifiable. You're welcome. Thank you, and Kathy, apologies. I just wanted to make sure that we were getting the full answer to the question and that I understood what you were asking. I appreciate that clarification. I don't see any more questions. Dina? I <clears throat> don't have a question. I was just going to make a motion. Absolutely. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve grant awards for the parent education program known as Kansas Parents as Teachers for 2023 to 2024, subject to legislative approval of funding. If a program is unable to spend funds awarded, the Kansas State Department of Education is authorized to reallocate funding among programs. And it's among the parents as teachers programs. <laughs> I'll clarify it myself. Thank you, Dina. Do I have a second, Betty? Um, check one more time. I don't see the hand raised. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? I have nine, one, motion passes. Perfect, thank you everybody. That's all I have for today, but if you've got future questions about any of these pieces, feel very welcome to be in touch. Thank you very much, Amanda. We are going to take a break. I'm sure you thought I was never going to say that. Um, we'll take a 10 minute break. Good, good. And you have to come back. <laughs>
back. Waiting for one last board member here. Next up, we have act on memorandum of agreement between Kansas Department of Health and Environment and the Kansas State School for the Blind. Um, I believe that this is you. Is that correct, Scott Gordon? It's Mark. Okay, we, thank we, you. I didn't did, have a name on it. We did allow John Hardy not to drive over. I'm sure so he appreciates Mark that. maybe can handle this. <laughs> so he gave John the evening off. to take up agenda number, item number 21, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Okay, uh, it's standing in for Superintendent John Harding, just as a, rec as a re reminder, we discussed at the March meeting, kind of a precursor to um, an item on the agenda to provide more detail at the, when we were at the school. So we circulated um, the, the MOU, uh, talked about it briefly, uh, sent around an email with some additional uh, information uh, to lead into the visit to the school and uh, uh, Superintendent Harding um, discussed it in greater detail um, in, when he was in, here in person. Um, and I, so I don't know that I have anything to add to that. It's now an action item and happy to entertain any questions or try to try to address any concerns. Any questions from board members? Our motion would be in order. For agenda item 21. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve the memorandum of agreement between Kansas Department of Health and Environment and Kansas State School for the Blind as presented. Thank you, Betty. Second from Dina. Last chance for discussion or questions. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. John Hardy would have been really upset with me if I didn't come over <laughs> before we ran. And now for item 22, Professional Practices Commission. Welcome, Scott Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I decided to give uh, Dr. Holt the night off because all of these cases are ruled upon by default or by voluntary surrender, so there was really no reason for her to jump on, plus she had a conflict at this time. And I'm sure she is very, very sorry she can't be here to join me via Zoom. Uh, just a couple of things. As always on these cases, we file a complaint on behalf of the Department of Education asking for certain actions to be taken. We mail these complaints by certified mail and standard mail, we try to cover all of our bases, to the last known address of the licensee or the applicant. You would not be surprised to learn that when people end up getting convicted of certain felonies, they don't exactly advertise to us where they live now. Um, and so it is not a surprise that we had so many of these come back as uh, we don't know where they live now. When we do realize, for what it's worth, that we do have a new address for that person, we will send the complaints out a second time to give them another opportunity. For example, there were a couple of them. <laughs> we found their addresses on the Kansas Offender Registration website. Uh, and for some reason, they still chose not to respond to our invitation to the PPC. So we have tried every reasonable effort as we are required to solicit a response. And all of the individuals, and I believe there's one of them, it was communication by way of the, his attorney that it was a voluntary surrender. Um, the second thing that I would add, I was asked if I could suggest an alternative motion for those of you that would like to make one so that you don't have to list off each case, I, and Mark may disagree, I think if you all wanted to do all these at once, you could do uh, a vote to adopt the recommendations of the Professional Practices Commission as presented on uh, today's date, and then you just vote on that way, if you want to, unless there's for some reason you want to pull one out separately. And with that, Madam Chair, if there are any cases about any, any particular questions, I would be happy to answer them at this time. Kathy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Part of this is like process, so I, I just, I'm that person, so I apologize, but how does an actual formal complaint get 
how <laughs> get filed? Is it by finding out that there was a court case? You know, get, if you wouldn't mind, just a little bit of information on how this all occurs. Sure. Uh, information comes to us from a variety of sources. Okay. It could be from the public. It could be a, a reporter may reach out saying, what have you done about this case? And it could be just following the news. It is a report. Every prosecuting office is required by law to inform us on a regular basis of whenever there's a conviction of felonies. So we find out that way. Um, one of the ways we find out is through Ratback. That is the system whereby when someone applies for a teaching license, they have to go through that fingerprint-based background check. We find out a comprehensive criminal history through the KBI and the FBI on application. And then once you're in our system, we find out updates through the KBI for offenses that occur in Kansas. We find out when someone is arrested, and then we find out how the case evolves. Assuming that the law enforcement office or the prosecuting office actually updates their own records as well. Okay. So those are the main reasons, or school districts many times will share information with us, um, or individuals, students, and parents will also inform us. So we get those, okay. that's how we find out about them. We, do the, we conduct the investigation, and once we determine there's sufficient information, and it is of the nature whereby we would file a complaint because it is professional misconduct, Filing it means I take it to Shane, our director of teacher licensure. We discuss that. He signs the complaint on behalf of the agency. Filing it means that we mail it to the complaint, to the licensee or the applicant, and we essentially give it to our secretary of the Professional Practices Commission. If they ask for a hearing or they file any kind of an answer, um, then the whole case is sent to the Office of Administrative Hearings and that individual, that hearing officer schedules it from then on. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, beyond that, I just, I guess more of a comment or a, something to discuss at some point. Noticing that six out of, out of these 14, six of them were of the sexual nature and things being texted to, is there any kind of policy in place that's somehow preventing teachers, students from sharing personal cell phone numbers, I don't know. I just feel like there's such an open door there for these things that it's kind of like, wow, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the quick answer to that is no, there is no statewide law that prevents you from sharing a cell phone number with a student. I've been saying for 11 years, completely biased, and I'm not a teacher. I've never been a K through 12 teacher. I don't believe there's any reason why any student should ever know the personal cell phone number of a teacher. But that's me and I'm completely biased because this is the kind of stuff I get to deal with. But no, it is not against the law. Many school districts, Kathy, uh, have, a, have some software mm -hmm. where you can like, let's say I have a third hour class where you could blast text and it's third party so it never exchanges between the and then it's monitored by the school. But at least the school district I was in, and I don't know about Craig's, it was you were not to give your personal cell phone number out to students or engage your right. you could you could do it through the app that the school district could control. And yeah, the, in all fairness, there are, if not all, I believe most school districts have some policy in place controlling the type of communication you have with students. Um, yeah, that doesn't mean that it works, but they have them. If we catch them, yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered if this was a cleanup effort. It was interesting to see so many of these <laughs> all at once where all of them did not receive a response mm -hmm. from the licensee. Um, this was the result of two things. One, as many of you are, you're all aware, for years, it was just myself. Um, sometimes we had a second attorney. I started here as the second attorney in charge of investigating these cases. Now, for the past year and a half, I've had a special investigator that's able to track down this information. That has been enormously beneficial to the agency in collecting this information, especially if it's not a matter of a criminal case. 
um, so that we can move forward with filing these complaints. So yeah, there was a, I couldn't tell you which weekend it was, but I, there was one particular week. We filed all these cases at one time and there's a whole bunch more that we're still waiting. And fortunately, for procedurally, only about half the people asked for a hearing. So there's a lot of cases that were filed all at once. It has to do with cleanups that we're getting from the courts, cleanups that my office had the opportunity to finally file the complaints. And it just, it got to the point on several of these cases. We've got enough information, we're gonna move forward. And I would like to make the assumption that none of these people were actively teaching at this time. If you can't locate them, I assume that is the case? I can't make you that promise. I can't tell you that these people aren't in other states right now with a license because we haven't taken it away yet. In fact, I know for a fact there have been times that individuals have, while we had a pending complaint, they would move to another state and try to get a license in another state. Um, we try to get the best address we can. If we know that the individual had been living within a school district, like a former employee, we will reach out to the school district. In fact, one of these individuals I know for sure, not only did we, re well, I'm not gonna sell somebody out. We reached out to the school district and we reached out to other individuals and we found out what their address was. But I, yeah. Thank you, I have a question from Dennis. Yeah, I'm just, is there a, a communication between districts so that, uh, just in my, in my district, there was a superintendent that alerted another school that somebody was, you know, they were hiring somebody that had a criminal record? Uh, <laughs> I hear a lot of different stories about how this information gets communicated and not communicated. Um, do I know of an official network of the superintendents where they share this information? I'm not aware of one. Anytime we take action, that in, or the board takes action, pardon me, that information is shared through the superintendent listserv. And then we publish everything on the agency website as well. I do know that many times school districts will find out that school district A is about to hire this person and maybe the phone gets picked up and say, you don't wanna do that. I'm also aware that the employing school district will reach out to the original school district and is told, well, yeah, no, they're probably okay. I won't tell you much more. So. To follow up, one time, Dennis, when I was still a superintendent, I was looking at my applications and I got that email, because every time, when we make this decision today, uh, it's gonna be blasted out to every superintendent. And I saw a person that I had an application for on that list, so of course, we, I was getting ready to set up an interview, we didn't do that, so that, that also was information. So this information is gonna be out to every school district in the state in a day or two, I assume. Hopefully by the end of the week. That's the goal. Any other questions? Okay. In that case, I would accept a motion on item 22. I move that the Kent State Board of Education denies or revokes the licenses in the cases as recommended on May 9th, uh, 2023 by the um, Professional Practices Commission. Thank you. And a second from Betty. Further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Unanimous, motion passes, thank you. Thank you all very much. Next up, legislative matters. Welcome back, Craig. Good evening, thank you. Good evening. Bear with me just a second while I bear with Eric for, bear with Eric for just a second. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's buried. All right. Um, 
it may be appropriate that we're addressing this topic when we are. The final days of the legislature are frequently referred to as the legislature after dark because they tend to finish up rather late in the evening or early in the morning at times. Um, I don't think we will be here until early in the morning. Do have a little bit to go over with you, uh, much of which you've seen before, uh, but uh, much has now been finalized. There are one or two things yet awaiting uh, some action. Uh, one note to make right up front, when the legislature adjourned, they adjourned sine die, which means they are not coming back. Normally they have one day that they come back in the event there are vetoes or something that they may want to try to override. Uh, they have uh, cast that opportunity aside. So they are done unless uh, the governor would veto something that would cause her to need to call them back into special session. Uh, but I don't think many people anticipate that happening. Uh, so for starters, uh, we did have uh, and have had since the last time you met an update on the consensus revenue estimates, which are done twice a year, uh, once in November, once in April. Uh, the April estimates, the legislature likes to have done before they adjourn finally. That gives them a better idea of how much money they've got that they can budget for the coming uh, year or two. And you can see they continue to increase estimates, um, even over what they had uh, estimated in November, uh, by a fair amount of money. And I made note of the revenues in April. Now that decline, they tell us, was due to a change in the federal tax law. Uh, so some taxes were reported and paid a little bit differently. Um, and I make, made note of that because I believe, I'm remembering correctly, that's the first time in two years that a monthly estimate has been less than they anticipated. It's, it has always been climbing up to this one month. And even at that, uh, 30 million below, given that they increased the estimates with just uh, three months left in the year by 128 million, state's still doing all right. And in fact, those are the projected ending balances. Um, for this year, 1.9 billion, and you can see it'll grow over a billion dollars next year. So the state is certainly in good economic position. The budget stabilization fund, uh, most years, the state has not even had a budget stabilization fund. That's their savings account. Uh, so we're, we're doing very well in terms of uh, what the at least near future appears to carry. So some legislation dealing with education that has been signed by the governor already. Uh, and some, like I say, most of this we have talked about before. Uh, so you're probably aware that virtual students will be allowed to take state assessments online. And as a reminder, that could carry some uh, fairly significant security issues. If uh, assessment items were to be released or become public in some fashion, uh, I think we've mentioned before, if that were, for instance, a sixth grade assessment, it's not just that student's test that is invalidated, it's the entire sixth grade assessment, which means we would have to ask KU to rewrite a new assessment. And that comes with a uh, price tag uh, for the state assessment and for the uh, English language performance assessment, uh, close to $9 million. And so we have sent a letter to the chairs of the Appropriations Committee and the Senate Ways and Means Committee just alerting them to that fact, that if something like that would occur, we would need to ask for a supplemental appropriation in approximately that amount of money. Um, if that doesn't come, uh, what impact does that have on the department? The way the bill was passed, it would come from existing resources. I saw that, but what, what impact would that have? That, with, a, with, a, with a $9 million unfunded agency, mandate have on this department? State general fund appropriation for the agency is about $14 million total. So I don't think we have $9 million to pull out of there. Yeah. We can cut. Twenty-three twenty-two uh, was originally introduced to change the language from emotional disturbance to emotional disability in special education. And then inf uh, information about dyslexia was included that would make that now a category for special education. It does not automatically make a student that's been identified with dyslexia 
uh, eligible for special education services, you still have to determine that there is a need for those services. So students will continue to be identified with dyslexia and not necessarily be in special education, um, but they certainly can now. And they will receive services either way, either as identified in special education, or if not, then dyslexia services in the classroom. Uh, 123 requires that school districts pay for credential assessments for students. Uh, several school districts, I would say many, but I don't have an exact count, several school districts do that already. Um, there was no additional funding included, so districts will pay that cost themselves. Uh, the average cost for an assessment, uh, it varies quite a bit, but the average the last time we collected data was about $100 for any given assessment for a student. Um, there's all, there are also some requirements in that bill uh, for KSDE and KBOR jointly to do some surveys uh, to see the types of credentials that students are, in, are earning if they are in high demand areas by industry. So that will take place again. Other legislation signed by the governor, uh, 2292 is the teacher apprenticeship program that you have dealt with as well. Uh, the pilot program is scheduled to begin uh, in August. A Senate Bill 66 then is the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact. It has not yet been adopted by 10 states, so it, it, as you're probably aware, it will not go into effect nationally until at least 10 states sign on, uh, but you've taken some steps to uh, uh, direct our licensure team to go ahead and put most of that in place. So in Kansas, uh, we're moving right along with that. The veto, or I'm sorry, the governor vetoed some bills. These two were overridden by the chambers, so they will become law. Uh, 2138 requires separate overnight accommodations for students when they travel based on their gender at birth. It also is the bill that in includes the provision to allow school districts with 5% of their patrons signing a petition to protest a decision by a local board to close a building. They can protest it and bring it to the state board. Uh, that's referred to as an administrative review because regardless of what you determine about that decision, it goes back to the local board and they make the final decision. And then they uh, the bill also included a provision that allowed local broadcast stations to carry activities uh, post-season uh, post events uh, without fees. And 2238, uh, both chambers also overrode the veto on that that would prevent males by birth from participating in female sports at the high school level and middle school. A couple of vetoes were sustained. They were not able to override them. 2236 was uh, referred to as the parents' rights bill that allowed parents to object to what you see there, materials or activities based on their beliefs, values, or principles. Uh, the governor vetoed that. The House sustained the veto. That ability for parents is currently legal and allowed and takes place. Um, so it, it really doesn't change what parents may or may not do in a school district. Um, up to and including asking for alternative assignments or activities for their students. 2304, if a school district teaches firearm safety, this bill would have uh, mandated that the curriculum they use would be the Eddie Eagle or the Wildlife and Parks. Uh, the governor vetoed that, I think primarily because of the curriculum mandate, and the House sustained that veto, was not able to override it. So neither of those two bills will become law. Uh, one uh, bill that people followed throughout the session, even though it kept changing numbers, uh, finally became House Bill 2089. And they it ended up with basically two pieces of legislation in it and only two. Uh, it would have provided an additional $72 million for special education funding, which is the amount that uh, would have been required over a five-year period to bring us up to 92% of excess cost. Uh, 
and that's uh, what the state board recommended last summer. It's what the governor recommended in her budget. So this bill would have funded that. They would use federal money to do it. Uh, this state's version of, it, it's ARPA money, which is the state's version of ESSER funds, uh, if you want to think of it that way. The benefit to the state, uh, potentially, of using federal money is it would not be subject to the state's maintenance of effort. And the maintenance of effort means you, once you add funding, typically you can't reduce that in following years for special education. But since this was not state's money, they would not be held to that. So they could put the $72 million in this year, and then next year make a new decision, whether they wanted to continue to fund $72 million or drop that out of there. So that was included in this bill along with what became uh, the legislator's version of the KEEP program, uh, which would provide uh, awards to public school students of $1,000 one time uh, if the student uh, family income was 250% or less than the poverty level. Uh, that's a little higher standard than we've had in many things now. Uh, free and reduced. Reduced level is 185%. So 250 is a little bit above that. Uh, the other way a student could qualify is if they had attended a school that was closed and they now live 15 miles or more from the new school. If that's the case and you're a public school student, you qualified for a one-time award of $1,000 in either of those categories. If you're a private school student, uh, your parents would receive an account through the state treasurer and 95% of the base. And the base next year will be $5,088, so more or less $5,000. And that's an ongoing award. So once, or grant, once you qualify, you would have qualified forever each year. And as the base increased, then the amount uh, going to the family would increase as well. The bill was listed on the calendar for each, each chamber on their final day that they met, but neither chamber actually brought it up to vote. So it had passed out of conference committee, uh, gone to the floor in both the Senate and the House, but neither one brought it up for a vote before they adjourned. So no action was taken on that bill. And the rest of it has to deal with funding schools primarily, and a few policies we'll touch on at the end. And this has not yet been signed by the governor. It was just received by the governor Monday. So she has 10 calendar days from that date to make a decision. Um, and that means it also just went up so that you could actually read the full uh, text of the bill on Monday, a little over a week after they adjourned. So funding for next year, there's that base, $5,088. That's about a 5% increase, and that's in keeping with the statute uh, that was agreed to uh, with the Supreme Court. And each year moving forward now, the base should increase by the three-year consumer price index average. And that number has is finalized in April by the Legislative Research Department, the Division of the Budget, and KSDE. So we know that is the, the official number for next year. A change to the general fund calculations. Currently, uh, your general fund is based on your enrollment in either the prior year or the second preceding year. So the last two years, whichever one's higher, that's what you use to calculate how much money you receive. That enrollment times $5,088. This bill will change it to being calculated on the current year or the prior year. So the second preceding year drops out. The current year is helpful for those districts that are growing. They don't have to wait a year to receive funding for the new students that move in. For districts that are declining, uh, if they are declining year after year after year, losing the second preceding year will cause problems for some of them. Um, we have uh, a number of districts that will lose money next year even in their general fund, even with the increase in the base. So a 5% increase in the base is not enough to offset their enrollment loss. Uh, a few of them lose some significant money. And we have a call scheduled tomorrow afternoon to visit with some of those districts uh, and help them prepare for that. Um, we also have, uh, we posted on our website last week, uh, an estimation tool so districts can go in and fill in their enrollment for next year and 
see what their general fund will look like. Will they be using the prior year enrollment or next year's enrollment? What's that going to make their general fund compared to this year? Uh, so hopefully that will help them prepare a little bit better when budget time comes this summer and as they make their plans this year. Um, there is some concern among school districts. It's a little late in the year to be making some changes like this for some of them uh, in their budgets. That will be, that will present some challenges. Uh, another provision, if a district closed a school, then the following year, they only get to use the current year enrollment to count for their um, enrollment. They don't get to rely on the prior year. Um, I, I'm not going to be so bold as to say, I think the thought behind this and this was presented in conference committee when testimony is not taken and it's just, here's what we'd like to do. Um, the thought behind this was in some situations when a district closes a school, some of those students leave. They either transfer the territory or the students, for whatever reason, they're, they're mad at the district, they think they've got a better opportunity in the next door, whatever the case may be, they leave. And if you're funded on the current year, then the district that closed that school gets to count those kids um, because they're, they're still counting the prior year. And the new district, if they're growing, may get to count the kids. Uh, so apparently the legislature did not want that situation arising. So the district that closed the school only used the current year. That it's a little difficult to apply that to every district across the state. For example, Lawrence is closing a couple of schools this year. Those students live in the middle of Lawrence. They're not likely to leave the district, but Lawrence is going to have to rely only on their current year enrollment next year because they closed uh, schools in the current year. And they, like most districts that go through this, close a school because they're losing enrollment. And losing enrollment means you're losing funding. By doing this, uh, in a lot of cases, it will make the problem a little bit worse for that particular school district. Uh, and again, every situation is different, but it, it could cause some problems for districts. Uh, the other step they put in for districts that close schools, so go back to the first example. If a district closes a school and parents or students decide we're going to attend the school district next door for whatever reason, in the finance formula, and this is a preview of coming attractions for tomorrow morning for you. Low enrollment weighting is based on a sliding scale. So the smaller you are, the higher your factor. It can be anywhere from one to 0.3, roughly. Uh, if, if you have 100 students, you receive an extra 1.0 weighting for each one of those students. So instead of one student being funded at 5,088, they're funded at a little over 10,000. They count once for enrollment and once for low enrollment weighting. And as you get larger, that scale comes down because of an economy of scale. The larger you are, you can afford to pay for, for more. You have more students generating that revenue. So as you get to the bottom end of the scale and it's only three tenths, then they're receiving 1.3 times 5,088 for each student on their low enrollment weighting. So the issue is if I gain a bunch of students, um, that means I'm moving down on that scale. And so now my factor maybe went from 0.7 to 0.6. Under this statute, if I take students, if I accept students from a school that was closed in a neighboring district or any other district for that matter, my low enrollment weighting factor gets locked in at 0.7 where it was last year. And so now every one of my students, not just the ones that moved in, is worth 1.7 instead of the factor this year would have been 1.6. Not a huge dollar amount in most cases, um, but that's locked in for three years. That uh, districts would get to use that if they accept uh, students from a building that closed. Um, well intentioned, I'm sorry? One, one student moves in, you apply the higher low enrollment weighting factor to all of your students. Uh, that would be an option, yes. And, and there are uh, probably some unintended consequences. Um, 
example, if a school closes in northeast Kansas and that family just happens to move and they move to a district in southwest Kansas, that district gets to use the low enrollment waiting factor from the prior year. Um, so I, I would ask you to bear in mind our auditors who have to verify all that every year. So now not only do they need to know how many students do, they ha do you have, they need to know where did they come from? <laughs> and are they coming from a school that was closed last year? In many cases, we don't learn until middle of the summer when school districts report in the directory update whether the school's been closed or not. Uh, so it comes with some issues, uh, but it, it can be done. We can calculate it, uh, but not at budget time necessarily. School districts may not know until they're audited how that's gonna impact their budget directly. Okay, um, they did add seven and a half million dollars to special education state aid. They were not originally planning to do that. It was going to stay flat from this year to next, uh, but they went back and followed the process that they've been using since the Gannon settlement. For the last several years, they've had, they have added seven and a half million dollars each year. Now, compared to the amount that's spent on special education, that's less than 1%. Um, but we're certainly not going to turn it down. They, so they chose to add seven and a half million dollars and they are scheduled to add another seven and a half million dollars the following year. Uh, this bill is where the special education task force was moved to, <clears throat> like some of these other things they've been in several other bills as they went through the session. So the special education task force will be created. It's 11 individuals. Uh, seven are appointed by legislators three by the department and one by the state board. And their primary task is to examine the finance formula for special education and make a recommendation back to the legislature. Uh, that's not their sole task, but that's listed as, as one of the primaries. The other change they made uh, just affects a few districts. It will, preliminary estimates, it will affect about 27 districts next year. Cost of living is the weighting that school districts get to use if it, just like it sounds, costs a lot to live in that district. So if the average residential appraised value of a home in their district is now 115% of the state average, they qualify for cost of living. And what that allows you to do is increase your general fund budget by up to 7%. Now there's a formula that, that uh, determines what percentage you can use and not many districts hit that 7% mark. Most are quite a bit lower. The other issue with it the districts have is this is all local property tax. There's no state aid for cost of living waiting. So for that reason, uh, this year we had 21 districts that were eligible and seven actually used it to some degree or another. Uh, some took full advantage, some took partial advantage because they, of the property tax. They needed to be sensitive about that. So when we add six districts, that doesn't mean, and history would say, they won't all take advantage, but one or two more might. And those that have been taking advantage will now be able to raise their general fund a little more than they were before. And so if there's 27 available, then there's 259 districts that don't have that available, if I did my math right. Anyway. Um, they also, on the last day, decided to extend the high density at risk waiting to sunset on July 1 of 27. It had been scheduled in statute to sunset July 1 of 24. Uh, that's about $71 million to school districts. High density at risk is the funding they receive if 35% of the students in a school or in the district qualify for free meals. And if you're asking why'd they pick 27, uh, something for you to look forward to, that's the year the entire finance formula sunsets and we get to start over. And this will be the year state aid payments in the general fund and supplemental general fund are made on time. For several years they've been made in July and districts record them as though they got them in June. And that was originally done as a budget saving measure for the state when money was tight and that's been I should have looked it up. I'm going to say 12 or more years ago that that was originally done. 
once you move a payment forward into July, it's hard to get it back in the right year because now you're $160 million basically in the hole when you start that year. And so you just keep pushing it forward every year. You move another $160 million into the next uh, fiscal year. This being a year where the state has the cash balances that they do, makes perfect sense that let's uh, make that right. So they'll make the payment on time this year and then they're on track forevermore to keep making payments in the appropriate year. Yes, sir. I want to go back to the special education task force. This is I, this just may be a cynical approach, of, but seven of the eleven members are appointed by people who have consistently refused to fund special education. Uh, so, from my cynical point of view, I'm wondering if this is. I won't be surprised if this is an effort to recommend changes from the ninety-two percent. Two are appointed by the, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, two are appointed by the Speaker of the House, two by the President of the Senate, one by the Minority Leader of the House, one by the Minority Leader of the Senate, and then I believe the Speaker and the President alternate years appointing a parent representative to the committee. Okay, so only six of them are appointed by people that, uh, this is how the majority are appointed by people that have consistently refused to allow funding, additional funding for special education. Just a point I thought needed to be made. All right. A um, few more funding issues. Uh, <coughs> school safety grants were going to be funded at $4 million. Last year they funded them at $5 million, but $1 million of that came from the federal ARPA funds. Uh, they did go ahead and decide to add that $1 million from the state general fund, so there will be $5 million available, as there was last year. They took out the provision that would have required and would have funded uh, safety audits in school districts. So th those are not required uh, at the moment, and the funding for an additional position to be able to do that uh, obviously is not included if the audits aren't required. We have uh, the application drawn up. We will make it available just as quickly as we can once the governor signs the bill so we know it's going to be law, assuming that the governor signs the bill. They did add $1 million for parents as teachers. Uh, you just had a chance to visit about that program a little bit. The request was to add $1.3 million. Uh, they added $1 million. And the intention behind that really was to keep up with increasing costs. That level of funding has not changed for a number of years, and obviously costs have. So we don't know that adding $1 million will allow us to serve very many more families, but it will certainly allow us uh, to not have to reduce the number anymore. And then a, one item that was uh, in the bill with 113, but was moved uh, in the last week to Senate Bill 25, which was the omnibus budget bill for every other state agency, uh, except uh, education. Mental health intervention team program was moved into that uh, bill. They did add $3 million to uh, the program so that we can expand it. It's been $10 million, 10 and a half. Now it'll be about 13 and a half. It remains a one-year budget proviso, which means we know the program will exist next year, and that's all we know for sure. Uh, there had been a bill introduced that would have uh, put it in statute and made it a part of the financing for school districts annually, uh, but that bill was, was not passed. So the one-year proviso was reintroduced into the omnibus budget bill. And again, those applications are close to being ready. And uh, if the governor signs that bill, we will be ready to send those out. Those applications and the school safety grant applications will both come to you in July. Districts will have to send, turn them in to us in June. We need to get them to you for approval in July so they can go ahead in the case of the school safety grants and purchase the equipment or hire the school resource officers or however they've chosen to spend that money uh, hopefully before school starts, or at least in a timely manner. And certainly for the mental health intervention team, they'd like to be able to have their programs up and running when school starts. And for some of them, that means hiring personnel. For others, uh, it's 
uh, being able to continue with the personnel they have. So we, we get on a little bit of a tight timeline on that one, both of those. All right, there were a few policy issues in the bill. Uh, they didn't uh, expand the tax credit for low-income student scholarship program. There's another acronym for you if you're not familiar with that. Um, and there's that 250% of federal poverty level number that, that seemed to be the magic line this year on these types of bills. So that will make a few more students eligible based on their family income. The tax credit that a donor receives is currently 70% of the donation. This will increase that to 75%. And that's a tax credit, not a tax deduction. So it's a little better deal than a deduction. And they changed the language for a qualified school. Currently, a qualified school has to be a private school that is accredited. They added a little language so that it's a private school that's working in good faith toward accreditation. Uh, they didn't define working in good faith, so I think that's going to be up to us to make that determination whether they are, in fact, working in good faith with an accrediting agency, whether that's KSDE or one of the others that's approved. Um, and I, I struck out the bill up until the last day uh, contained language that would create the parents' portal that would include those three things you see listed, grade level curriculum, non-academic surveys, and non-resident transfers. So that would have been a posting on a school district's website that, that showed each of those. The bottom two are required in other statutes, so school districts will still be posting their non-academic surveys. And when the open enrollment provision goes into effect a year from now, they will be required to post uh, how many non-resident students transferred into the district and how many requested to transfer. But the grade level curriculum uh, that would be posted for each grade level in the district is not required. We have been asked to survey school districts and ask how many are already doing that and making that available on their website. Um, and again, similar to the earlier law, the Parents' uh, Bill of Rights, that information is available to any parent that would request it. This would just require it to be posted. So that was dropped out of the bill on the last day and is not a part of it. The open enrollment policy that I just mentioned goes into effect in 24-25. That was passed last year, so they made the amendments that you see there. If you have staff members who live in another district and they would like to have their children attend the school where they work, uh, the board by policy can allow that. The open enrollment policy that was passed a year ago requires all non-residents if you have space in your classes. So if you set your third grade class size at 21 and you only have 18 students, you've got room to take three more students. Non-resident students that apply get to take those three spots by lottery. You, you have no other option for determining which ones. It's simply by lottery. So they made these amendments so that if you have um, staff members living at a district, your board can choose to let those students enroll as though they're residents. They don't have to go through the lottery. They don't have to worry about whether you've got space or not. You can simply choose them to enroll. Um, that is an employment consideration for a lot of staff members in school districts where their children are going to go to school. Federal law has some requirements for homeless students. If a student becomes temporarily homeless and uh, as a result is residing in a neighboring district, they have the right to continue attending in the district they were in. So they modified this bill so that it would not conflict with the federal McKinney-Vento Act. And then the other change they made was for children of military families, they have priority in the lottery. So you don't automatically enroll a, a student from a military family if your classes are full. But in the situation I described, if you've got three vacancies and a child of a military family wants to enroll from out of district, they're allowed to enroll. They don't have to go through the lottery if you have the space. If you don't have space, they're not necessarily allowed to enroll. Um, and school districts will have a lot of questions about that policy between now and next year and, and how to uh, write those and, and enact those in a way that would be fair to everybody. Um, Non-public students can participate in public school activities 
association activities. Uh, so if you're homeschooled and want to play in your resident district, you can't go play for the district next door, but if you want to play in your resident district, you would have the opportunity to do so. You don't have the right to play. If they have tryouts for the team and you don't make the team, that's it. You're not automatically on the team, uh, but you would have the opportunity to participate. The statute specifically addresses eligibility requirements of the activities association uh, and states that if the parent or guardian of a homeschool student uh, makes a written statement that the student meets the requirements for the activities association, then they meet it. No questions asked. Um, this next one, I'm pretty confident we haven't worked through all the possible issues with it just yet. The legislature would now have first right of refusal on the sale of a district building. And a school building is defined in statute as basically any building the district owns. So if the school district uh, chooses to sell the district office or theoretically a concession stand if you want to take it to a, a wild extreme, they must notify the legislature. The legislature has 45 days to decide if they want first right on that sale and then uh, but it refers to which state agency will purchase the building. Uh, so I don't think it's the legislature buying the building. It would be state agencies. If the legislature is not in session, so if the school district decides to sell the building in August, they have to wait until January, and then the 45-day clock starts. <coughs> so for school districts, it could cause some issues if your buyer is not willing to wait that long to close a sale. Um, once the legislature decides or a state agency decides, yes, we're interested in that building, then they have 180 days to work through the process. Uh, and if necessary, they can extend it for 60 days. So it, it is possible a district could be waiting over a year to determine how they're going to sell a building. And then, uh, not quite finally. This bill would allow local school board members to be compensated. Uh, a few of you have served in those positions. You know well they are not compensated right now. Uh, the only elected officials in the state who are not. But this would allow them, not require, but allow them if the board chose to, to compensate the local board members. And was that it? I guess that was it. I would stand for any questions. Having so much fun, I didn't know we were at the end. <laughs> any any questions from board members? Do they list how? Yeah. Do they list the amount that board members are going to get paid? We could all no. go join our local board and probably do better. You, well, you would at least get an opportunity to vote on that chance. <laughs> and this is um, probably for next month, but um, even though the firearm safety training thing did not become law. There's an obvious interest on the part of the legislature to run it again next year. I don't think they realize that actually as part of the safe and secure schools, that's already in law, except that it has another uh, option for um, other um, evidence-based curricula. So anyway, maybe next month, will give us time to dig in to see what the law they passed before actually means. And I think maybe to get ahead of it before next session so we don't have a fight over who gets to set curriculum, maybe we could do a survey of who's actually offering firearm safety, what are they using, and would they like some standards. So, But I can bring that back next month if that's OK. I agree to that. Happy to put it on the even, list. And even possibly even, I mean, there some of the programs sound like they might be better than Eddie Eagle. So mm -hmm. even if we knew what the contents of some of the their programs yeah. were as well, I think yeah, it I think what they would passed, be helpful. I think what they passed last time only applied to the five million 
under safe and secure, but we need to find out for sure. But the thing is, we really want to avoid a fight over who sets standards, because we can't have the legislature sending standards to schools on topics no. and us sending <coughs> standards on topics, and like, then and what do they do? So we need to stay in control of it, and anyway, it's something we can look at and maybe avoid a fight next time. And the Thanks. standards yeah. were based on the Eddie Eagle and the uh, wildlife and parks. So <coughs> we as the standards-based making body didn't have a choice of how you'd even set, set up the programs, <coughs> what, what the standards would be. They had to follow yeah. those particular uh, ideas, and so that's an issue too, I think. Question from Kathy. Oh, I just wondered if SB 180 is something that is affecting schools with the... I'm not entirely certain what the impact will be for schools. Uh, we'll need to get some attorney help on that one. Um, if I'm remembering right, that is the women's rights, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Craig. Thank you. <coughs> Over the Three in the morning. <laughs> you guys. Okay, next up, the consent agenda. Um, we're going to vote on the consent agenda minus items C and D, and then there were the two other changes that were made this morning, the removal of visiting scholar and 3494 LR LRC case. So may I have a... Do I need a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Dina, um, all in favor of approving the consent agenda with those amendments, raise your hand. That is unanimous, motion passes. And then item C by itself, act on recommendations for funding the 2023-24 AmeriCorps Kansas Grant Awards. May I have a motion to approve that vote? I move to approve 24C. Second, Dina, Dan and Dina, all in favor, raise your hand. I think I have seven opposed. One, two, three. Motion passes. That was Michelle, Dennis, Danny. And then for item D, act on request to contract with America Learns LLC for the AmeriCorps Impact Suite software. Motion, Betty and Dina. All in favor, raise your hand. Seven, opposed? Oh, sorry, Dennis, you were eight. Okay, I have eight, and then Michelle and Danny opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. Next. Uh, my chair report will be brief. We do not have a chair for the student voice committee, and so I am appointing Michelle Dombrowski to chair the committee. Thank you, Michelle. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, indeed. Um, any additional requests for future agenda items? I have several from today. Anne? Only one, um, and I won't read, I, I put a board report in. I had three amazing committee meetings this month, uh, the Professional Standards Board, the KC Native American Education Group, and the uh, Advisory Committee on Career and Tech Ed. Just reminded me how important that work is. But I know sometimes I've been on committees that weren't that productive. Um, so I'd like you to read my report and see some of the really cool things we did. But I would be interested, I think we haven't really talked about it, but I'd really like more board members to report out on what you're doing in your committees and whether or not you think 
they're valuable and, and should be continued because every once in a while I think we should take a fresh look at what we're doing. But like I said, the three I, I had this month were really, really good. But um, I'd like to hear what you guys are doing in your committee some more about that if you could do uh, written reports in the future. Thank you. Good request. Um, we'll go Betty and then Dennis. We had uh, begun a conversation about this last month. I had talked with uh, uh, Dina and Jim when we were visiting the school for the deaf and, and blind. And um, um, I really would love for us to look at a way of, of recognizing um, those two specialized schools do so much, but because they're outside of the realm of, of where awards are given or whatever, um, I, I was really impressed to know that one of the schools is recognized nationally. Um, those are the kinds of things that uh, I'd love if, I don't know if it would be an agenda item or perhaps just a, a request to look into some suggestions that we might do to recognize outstanding staff or achievements or whatever happens within those schools. Thank you, Betty. Dennis? Yeah, I, I would just kind of pair on that, on Betty. I just wonder if uh, superintendents and s local school boards are aware of the services that those two schools provide statewide. And I don't know how we can get that message out to them, but I'm, I'm trying to tell superintendents about it. So anyway, I, I agree with that. That's a good good idea that they know about it. Uh, and I just, I wanna make a report on, you know, we saw the, the results of Ag in the Classroom today. Just a great, that was just a highlight for me. And I'm on that committee and, and, and Nancy from that, that, that chairs that committee is here from K-State and we've had one Zoom, we're gonna do another one here uh, in another week or so. And so, um, you know, just, you, you have this uh, report here, this email that, that she sent out uh, about they're making good contact with a lot of new teachers, getting teachers on board, and that's really what it involves is teachers being aware of little things they can do in the classroom. They can, they can start a, uh, what they call a tower uh, garden, you know, they, in the corner of a classroom. They can be raising tomatoes or something like that on a, you know, doing a little green uh, um, effort, you know, to get kids uh, thinking about germinating seeds and things like that. So it's just a fun thing. And I, and uh, this little card here, I left this on your table too, all the things that, I think this is a good thing to, to hand to uh, teachers when you visit schools, say, here, this is all the services they, they offer. So this is a really, I'm just, uh, that's all, that's who I am. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Dennis, I thought the takeaway was that some of those first graders in the that didn't know that we were gonna eat those chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope they don't. I, I hope they don't need special uh, <laughs> counseling because of that. But you know that that you know that is really what uh, I, mean, I just feel real privileged to be from Yoder because they're kind of one of the pilot programs down there, and that's what we did Saturday, and uh, they're and, and we're going to keep that school open for two years to let the community prove that they want to keep that school. So the board, local board, there uh, they were going to close it. They decide to give it because of their success that they're showing that that little uh, 70, 70 oh, mo only 40 kids there now. But the, the kindergarten's full and there's actually a few parents driving in, bringing their kids from out of, out of the uh, busing uh, circle. So anyway, it's, it was exciting to do that and we had a really good showing from the community. Thank you. Kathy, I think you had your hand up and then I'll get Jim. Yeah, I would really like to see us have a discussion about the consent agenda so that we're all on the same page in the use of it. Okay. Come back. Jim McNeese. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways we could do this, but I'd like to uh, have a discussion, um, but more than a discussion, also a, a background and information on data privacy and what that means what the requirements are, the processes, and the protections. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lack of information on what data privacy actually is and how it works. Okay, thank you. Dina. 
since the uh, legislature <clears throat> made uh, one of the, well, made dy dyslexia a special ed issue now, I think we, as the policy becomes developed, I think we need to know more about how the department plans to handle it, whether it re will require districts to uh, allow for funding of, of um, testing for dyslexia, um, whether it won't, what what will be the requirements for uh, determining dyslexia, et cetera. I'd like, to, I'd like to know too if they're intending to fund services. And maybe what SEAC plans in that regard as well. I'm sure it's gonna, be on, the, it's gonna well. be on our conversations. Jeanette, thank you. Anyone else for future agenda items? If not, we will move on to board travel. Are there any additions or changes to board travel? Barbara, I know that we have some graduations coming up. Is that what you were gonna add? <laughs> um, who, let's do it this way. Who all will be attending the Kansas State School for the Blind graduation? It is Thursday afternoon. That might just be me. The blind, I'm gonna do the deaf next. Okay, so I'll be going to the School for the Blind and then School for the Deaf. Who's going to that? That's the following Friday, I think. 24. Wednesday, sorry. Wednesday. There we go. Did you get those, Barbara? Put your hand up for School for the Deaf. Good? Okay. What else am I missing? What other? Okay. Just those two. Any other changes to travel? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to approve board travel? Betty? And Kathy? All in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Motion, motion passes. Trying to get us out of here. <laughs> Well, there's an act on appointment to Keisha Board of Directors, um, but I don't have any text to go with it. We will, let's visit that one tomorrow. That'll be, we'll come back to this one tomorrow. Um, that's, uh, that's 25 item B. Um, any committee reports aside from the ones in packets that are printed? Okay, and the board attorney report. Turn it over to Mark. Can I just share a little bit about, um, you know, it's interesting that um, the egg in the classroom thing is, is really, um, a, I, I think a really up and coming thing for a lot of little schools. And Walton is gonna be closed by Newton and it's one of the pilot programs in Kansas. And I just want you to know there's a real community effort to try to keep that school. So I'm actually gonna be attending a uh, community meeting tomorrow evening on my way home. So uh, ho hopefully that will be a good positive uh, um, result of their efforts too, to keep that school because it really is a serving a good little group of people there in that community outside of Newton. Thank you, Dennis. I need to, I'm gonna, this question just came up, and I got this message from Bart Schwartz at uh, Greenbush. I just heard comments about getting word out about the School for the Blind <coughs> at the board meeting. John Harding from the School for the Blind attends our superintendent's forums, 
and we have had him talk about services they provide in the districts. We also partnered with him to help take things on the road to our schools. So that's, that, that is happening, but it probably needs to happen more across the state. Thank you, Jim. Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last month, um, Jim Porter uh, said he was disappointed that I passed, so I made sure that I wrote out a long report uh, this this month. I know they want me to pass again. Right, exactly. Well, actually, the, the real reason the real reason for my attorney report is that I have a guest today, and I promised Sophia Leonard that I would uh, I had a role to play in the, in the in the meeting, and I would give a report. So, uh, I my guest is Sophia Leonard, and she is a second year law student. I didn't have the benefit of introducing each of you individually, uh, but uh, hopefully you get a chance to say hello. She's joining me today. She is spending um, about six to seven weeks with us this summer uh, as a legal intern, a law clerk, and uh, trying to show her um, some of the different things that we do as a law firm and as attorneys. Got a chance to talk with her on the drive over about um, you know, not only education law, but uh, lawyers in Topeka and how many you know agencies have lawyers and, and give her different exposure to legal experiences and hopefully she'll be impressed enough to want to join us uh, when she graduates from law school. So we'll see. Um, thank you for joining me on this marathon day, Sophia. Yes. Uh, I do have some substantive um, things that I want to report on. Um, the, the, probably the most significant is I would like to address the issue of abstention and the reason uh, I, it, it has been something that has gained some momentum and traction each month that we've had new board members and um, um, and so it, it has been something that's been evolving. I uh, have a memo to the board in draft form, but I didn't you know finalize it, but I will after the after the meeting uh, today and get that to you. Um, part of the reason I kind of held off was because uh, I know that a, uh, that board member Dombrowski has uh, abstained on a number of occasions and in past months um, certain board members have come to me and asked me about that but I didn't bring it up publicly or in, to the board because I wanted to, that it's typically my style and my practice to talk to somebody about it individually and we had a chance to at least discuss my philosophy and my view on abstention uh, earlier today so I feel like I can bring that up and, and it's come up. Um, I I believe that it, that uh, you know an abstention is um, in in other boards and other public bodies. It's more a, it's more of a recusal, meaning that you know a judge might recuse himself from hearing a, a case because they feel like they have a public they have an interest in the case. Or if you're on the local board and you are um, considering a hiring or a termination of somebody, or maybe even a contract, you know that that maybe a family member has an interest in the business and you have a pecuniary interest in the contract, you might re recuse yourself from consideration of of the matter. Other board members have shared with me that uh, at least at the legislature, uh, you have to have a specific conflict or you have to have a specific reason for recusal. Um, and so my memo would be all of the, the, the forces or the laws that, that um, input uh, in my conclusion that an abstention is not really the appropriate vote for somebody that, uh, for a board member who uh, is simply in opposition to a position or a board action. Um, so a, v a vote by a member of the state board to abstain is not a favorable vote, meaning it falls into the unfavorable category, and therefore a vote to abstain does not count toward the favorable vote count of six or more members required for official action. That's already kind of presumed, but I would take it a step further and say that a vote of abstention is not just a no vote, but it is a, a non-vote. Um, and I would say that it's, it, it's uh, I'd go out a little further and say that a abstention, a non-vote is an abdication of the responsibility to vote or to take a 
position on a particular issue i don't believe that anybody can be forced to explain their vote i don't believe that that is is required but i think that we've had enough discussion about abstentions and being unclear about that i think that that confusion should be in my opinion should be put to rest and and the abstention is equal to a recusal and really should only be used when you have a personal interest in the vote you have a pecuniary interest or there's some conflict of interest that causes you to withdraw from the vote not if you just simply are not in favor of it that should be a no vote and i i will you know substantiate that with a written opinion to the board and i will readily acknowledge that that's not that definition is not fully explained in our board policies but i think that there's some there's also been some discussion about that in the in the first couple meetings of the policy committee and i would most likely ask that the board adopt something like that to to make that clearer in the future um i i rely on a number of resources in gathering information on you know education law and the things that are going on around not just around the state but around the country and i kind of take interest in what the headlines read around the country because you know while we have some we have some laws that have either been passed or vetoed or overridden you know some of the things that we're seeing in kansas are either already present in other parts of the country or are you know moving in in this direction and so there's a there's we get a a periodically i get a legal clips weekly for and it's a professes to be the source for recent developments in school law and hearkening back to my middle school journalism class and writing of headlines i i i know you're not supposed to read to the group but you know just reading some of these headlines that i get weekly from the the national service tells you that that there's lots of uh lots of things cooking in education law around the country and so uh that we may see uh in the future but uh for example in uh this particular pennsylvania uh an after school satan club gets school room for afternoon meetings in california two teachers uh sue the school district and state leaders over you know gender identity privacy policy which has obviously been in the news a great deal um both in missouri and around the country um you know alabama legislature um passes laws to give parents $6900 you know to use toward private schools um there's a um there was a lawsuit that was dismissed because the court determined that the parents fighting the missouri's missouri district's book removal policy those parents lacked standing um there's the school board must state or must stand for a lawsuit over ieps um you know school choice debate in new new hampshire um there's supreme court is going to hear a first amendment case regarding public official school media accounts um you know there's the one uh in michigan where the students sue the michigan school district for banning let's go brandon sweatshirts um and you know by claiming a violation of their first amendment rights um you know transgender student uh policies are um are are being uh litigated all over the country and so i see those things and i uh i realize that they're you know they're they're um, germane i guess to the discussion of of um education around the country and uh if it's not here yet it will be um you know based on that uh what i what i continue to see uh there one of the things i was sharing with uh, sofia on the drive over uh is that you know as a board i talk we talk about open meetings act open records act and so um i was somewhat relieved i guess to see that, to hear that at least in the legislative update they haven't tinkered more with the open meetings act and open open uh, records act because those are things that 
are every year are usually um, come some kind of legislation comes out. So I haven't seen anything that changes those definitions, but uh, there was a case by the um, Kansas Supreme Court uh, in January on uh, Open Records Act, and uh, uh, the Supreme Court decided in uh, January, uh, it wasn't dealing with the school district, but it was dealing with a, a hospital, and reiterated that the Kansas uh, Open Records Act, that the general rule is for openness of records, and just like the meetings, uh, Open Meetings Act, the general rule is for the openness, for public education, for public bodies, for uh, governance to be in the open, and that's the starting place for the discussion, and anything less than that has to be an exception, and, and, that, and you have to establish those exceptions. So uh, this particular battle uh, with this hospital in the state of Kansas was uh, over whether or not the uh, hospital, which was a the governing body was a public entity, whether they had to pr provide the uh, records requested in the electronic copy of the public electronic record under the Kansas Open Records Act. Now, it was the, there was no um, defense that the information was private or that it had HIPAA or that it was in, involved student records. So we don't want to go too far with this opinion, but uh, certainly the Kansas Supreme Court, you know, uh, took up a decision and said that you know, the Open Records Act means what it says, and, and the entity had to provide the electronic records because that was what was requested, that a paper copy wasn't enough. Um, so that's creating uh, a little bit of a buzz with school districts about providing records in the native format that they are kept by, by public entities. And so I think that's going to be something that's going to continue to, to somewhat, you know, evolve because the solution, at least in this case, was to make a, a public copy of the data available, and the Supreme Court says no. That's not what the, that's not what the law says. It says provide it in the electronic. Um, you know, if it if the native format, if the electronic copy was what's requested, then you have to provide it that. There's got to be a way, though, for for the entity to um, protect that personally identifiable information. So they may have to redact it or remove some of those things, but you can te you can you can certainly expect that there's going to continue to be pressure to provide records in the electronic you know format so that that information can be manipulated whether it's just you know not not for violation of privacy but to be able to um, you know sort and sift and go through the you know that data so uh, that's going to be a continued um, uh, battleground. Um, the, we heard from KASB, uh, I did circulate a, a attorney job posting and just would reiterate, I talked with Donna Whiteman and others from KSB today that said, you know, I just, they, they are looking to hire lawyers. So if you have, uh, if you have somebody that's looking for a, a legal job out across the state of Kansas or that you know of, um, circulated the, the uh, posting for one of their in-house uh, um, school law attorneys. Uh, the last thing to report on is that um, I do attend typically the annual conference of the National Council of State Education Attorneys, which is held in conjunction with the um, with the, your national, you know, your um, uh, COSA uh, with the uh, the National Association. When we have those, it was uh, I got we got a notification from the. Kansas School Attorneys Association, which is a, an affiliate of the Council of School Attorneys and the National Council of State Education Attorneys, that there is a bit of a, a, a brouhaha uh, between this National uh, uh, Council of School Attorneys and the affiliation uh, with the uh, School Board Association because there, you know, we pay dues just like you all pay dues for the for the national, and we get uh, the benefits of, of uh, annual conference and educational materials and online and continuing edu legal education. All those kinds of things are benefits uh, that are included with the uh, school attorneys association at the state level and the national level. 
and all those dues uh, pay people's staff uh, their their salaries and benefits, something to the tune of about seven hundred thousand dollars. So, I know in the past when uh, board members have been on the uh, national uh, um, uh, organizations and and uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, turf battle about collection of those fees and and um, attending those annual conferences and collecting those from various states. The same is true for the, the uh, attorney association uh, because they, uh, they benefit greatly from the, the annual conferences. And so there's, there's an uncoupling that's occurring right now between the Kansas School Attorneys Association and the Council of School Attorneys and perhaps a realignment with the National School Board Association, which is a little different than the, the, the NASB that uh, that we typically attend those national conferences. So uh, I did cut it a little bit short, but I couldn't, I couldn't pass today. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Ann. I'll just be quick, just to follow up on what Kathy said. I don't know if you or Scott will do an opinion for us on 180, but if after July 1, we have to start making our trans girl students go to the boys' room and have to make our trans boy students go to the girls' room, we're gonna have a mess, so it'd be good to know what's going on with that. Okay. With that, we will be in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you.